by Henry Gray, Anatomy of the Human Body, The Sacral and Coccygeal Nerves, Nervi Sacrales and Coccygeus. The anterior divisions of the sacral and coccygeal nerves, rami anteriores, form the sacral and pudental plexuses. The anterior divisions of the upper four sacral nerves enter the pelvis through the anterior sacral foramina, that of the fifth between the sacrum and coccyx, while that of the coccygeal nerve curves forward below the rudimentary transverse process of the first piece of the coccyx. The first and second sacral nerves are large. The third, fourth, and fifth diminish progressively from above downward. Each receives a gray ramus communicans from the corresponding ganglion of the sympathetic trunk, while from the third and frequently from the second and the fourth sacral nerves, a white ramus communicans is given to the pelvic plexuses of the sympathetic. The sacral plexus, plexus sacralis. The sacral plexus is formed by the lumbosacral trunk, the anterior division of the first, and portions of the anterior divisions of the second and third sacral nerves. The lumbosacral trunk comprises the whole of the anterior division of the fifth and a part of that of the fourth lumbar nerve. It appears at the medial margin of the psoas major and runs downward over the pelvic brim to form the first sacral nerve. The anterior division of the third sacral nerve divides into an upper and a lower branch, the former entering the sacral and the latter the pedental plexus. The nerves forming the sacral plexus converge toward the lower part of the greater sciatic foramen and unite to form a flattened band, from the anterior and posterior surfaces of which several branches arise. The band itself is continued as the sciatic nerve, which splits on the back of the thigh into the tibial and common peroneal nerves. These two nerves sometimes arise separately from the plexus, and in all cases their independence can be shown by dissection. Relation The sacral plexus lies on the back of the pelvis between the piriformis and the pelvic fascia. In front of it are the hypogastric vessels, the ureter, and the sigmoid colon. The superior gluteal vessels run between the lumbosacral trunk and the first sacral nerve, and the inferior gluteal vessels between the second and third sacral nerves. All the nerves entering the plexus, with the exception of the third sacral, split into ventral and dorsal divisions, and the nerves arising from these are as follows. Nerve to quadratus femoris and gemellus inferior, ventral divisions, fourth and fifth lumbar, first sacral. Nerve to obturator internus and gemellus superior, ventral divisions, fifth lumbar, first and second sacral. Nerve to piriformis, dorsal divisions, first, second sacral. Superior gluteal, dorsal divisions, fourth and fifth lumbar, first sacral. Inferior gluteal, dorsal divisions, fifth lumbar, first and second sacral. Posterior femoral cutaneous, ventral divisions, second and third sacral, dorsal divisions, first and second sacral. Sciatic, tibial, ventral divisions, fourth and fifth lumbar, first, second and third sacral. Common peroneal, dorsal divisions, fourth and fifth lumbar, first and second sacral. The nerve to the quadratus femoris and gemellus inferior arises from the ventral divisions of the fourth and fifth lumbar and first sacral nerves. It leaves the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen, below the piriformis, and runs down in front of the sciatic nerve, the gemelli, and the tendon of the obturator internus, and enters the anterior surfaces of the muscles. It gives an articular branch to the hip joint. The nerve to the obturator internus and gemella superior arises from the ventral divisions of the fifth lumbar and first and second sacral nerves. It leaves the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen below the piriformis and gives off the branch of the gemella superior, which enters the upper part of the posterior surface of the muscle. It then crosses the ischial spine, re-enters the pelvis through the lesser sciatic foramen, and pierces the pelvic surface of the obturator internus. The nerve to the piriformis arises from the dorsal division of the second sacral nerve, or the dorsal divisions of the first and second sacral nerves, and enters the anterior surface of the muscle. This nerve may be double. The superior gluteal nerve, nervus gluteus superior, 
arises from the dorsal divisions of the fourth and fifth lumbar and first sacral nerves. It leaves the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen above the piriformis, accompanied by the superior gluteal vessels, and divides into a superior and an inferior branch. The superior branch accompanies the upper branch of the deep division of the superior gluteal artery and ends in the gluteus minimus. The inferior branch runs with the lower branch of the deep division of the superior gluteal artery across the gluteus minimus. It gives filaments to the gluteae medius and minimus and ends in the tensor fasciae lati. The inferior gluteal nerve, nervus gluteus inferior, arises from the dorsal divisions of the fifth lumbar and first and second sacral nerves. It leaves the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen, below the piriformis, and divides into branches which enter the deep surface of the gluteus maximus. The posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, nervus cutaneus femoralis posterior, small sciatic nerve, is distributed to the skin of the perineum and the posterior surface of the thigh and leg. It arises partly from the dorsal divisions of the first and second and from the ventral divisions of the second and third sacral nerves and issues from the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen below the piriformis. It then descends beneath the gluteus maximus with the inferior gluteal artery and runs down the back of the thigh beneath the fascia lata and over the long head of the biceps femoris to the back of the knee. Here it pierces the deep fascia and accompanies the small saphenous vein to about the middle of the back of the leg, its terminal twigs communicating with the sural nerve. Its branches are all cutaneous and are distributed to the gluteal region, the perineum, and the back of the thigh and leg. The gluteal branches, nervi clunium inferioris, three or four in number, turn upward around the lower border of the gluteus maximus, and supply the skin covering the lower and lateral part of that muscle. The perineal branches, rami perineales, are distributed to the skin at the upper and medial side of the thigh. One long perineal branch, inferior pudental, long scrotal nerve, curves forward below and in front of the ischial tuberosity, pierces the fascia lata, and runs forward beneath the superficial fascia of the perineum to the skin of the scrotum in the male, and of the labium magus in the female. It communicates with the inferior, hemorrhoidal, and posterior scrotal nerves. The branches to the back of the thigh and leg consist of numerous filaments derived from both sides of the nerve and distributed to the skin covering the back and medial side of the thigh, the popliteal fossa, and the upper part of the back of the leg. The sciatic, nervus ischiadicus, great sciatic nerve, supplies nearly the whole of the skin of the leg, the muscles of the back of the thigh, and those of the leg and foot. It is the largest nerve in the body, measuring two centimeters in breadth, and is the continuation of the flattened band of the sacral plexus. It passes out of the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen, below the piriformis muscle. It descends between the greater trochanter of the femur and the tuberosity of the ischium, and along the back of the thigh to about its lower third, where it divides into two large branches, the tibial and common perineal nerves. This division may take place at any point between the sacral plexus and the lower third of the thigh. When it occurs at the plexus, the common perineal nerve usually pierces the piriformis. In the upper part of its course, the nerve rests upon the posterior surface of the ischium, the nerve to the quadratus femoris, the obturator internus and gemelli, and the quadratus femoris. It is accompanied by the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve and the inferior gluteal artery, and is covered by the gluteus maximus. Lower down, it lies upon the adductor magnus and is crossed obliquely by the long head of the biceps femoris. The nerve gives off articular and muscular branches. The articular branches, rami articularis, arise from the upper part of the nerve and supply the hip joint, perforating the posterior part of its capsule. They are sometimes derived from the sacral plexus. The muscular branches, rami muscularis, are distributed to the biceps femoris, semitendinosus, semimembranosus, and adductor magnus. The nerve to the short head of the biceps femoris comes from the common perineal part of the sciatic, 
while the other muscular branches arise from the tibial portion, as may be seen in those cases where there is a high division of the sciatic nerve. The tibial nerve, N. tibialis, internal popliteal nerve, the larger of the two terminal branches of the sciatic, arises from the anterior branches of the fourth and fifth lumbar and first, second, and third sacral nerves. It descends along the back of the thigh and through the middle of the popliteal fossa to the lower part of the popliteus muscle, where it passes with the popliteal artery beneath the arch of the soleus. It then runs along the back of the leg with the posterior tibial vessels to the interval between the medial malleolus and the heel, where it divides between the laciniate ligament into the medial and lateral plantar nerves. In the thigh it is overlapped by the hamstring muscles above, and then becomes more superficial, and lies lateral to, and some distance from, the popliteal vessels. Opposite the knee joint, it is in close relation with these vessels, and crosses to the medial side of the artery. In the leg it is covered in the upper part of its course by the muscles of the calf, lower down by the skin, the superficial and deep fascia. It is placed on the deep muscles and lies at first to the medial side of the posterior tibial artery, but soon crosses that vessel and descends on its lateral side as far as the ankle. In the lower third of the leg, it runs parallel with the medial margin of the tendo calcaneus. The branches of this nerve are articular, muscular, medial sural cutaneous, medial calcaneal, medial and lateral plantar. Articular branches, rami articularis, usually three in number, supply the knee joint. Two of these accompany the superior and inferior medial genicular arteries, and a third the middle genicular artery. Just above the bifurcation of the nerve, an articular branch is given off to the ankle joint. Muscular branches, rami muscularis, four or five in number, arise from the nerve as it lies between the two heads of the gastrocnemius muscle. They supply that muscle and the plantaris, soleus, and popliteus. The branch for the popliteus turns around the lower border and is distributed to the deep surface of the muscle. Lower down, muscular branches arise separately or by a common trunk and supply the soleus, tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, and flexor hallucis longus. The branch to the last muscle accompanies the perineal artery, that to the soleus enters the deep surface of the muscle. The medial sural cutaneous nerve, nervus cutaneus suri medialis, nervus cumanicans tibialis, descends between the two heads of the gastrocnemius and about the middle of the back of the leg pierces the deep fascia and unites with the anastomatic ramus of the common perineal to form the sural nerve. The sural nerve, nervus seralis, short saphenous nerve, formed by the junction of the medial sural cutaneous with the perineal anastomotic branch, passes downward near the lateral margin of the tendocalcaneus, lying close to the small saphenous vein, to the interval between the lateral malleolus and the calcaneus. It runs forward below the lateral malleolus, and is continued as the lateral dorsal cutaneous nerve along the lateral side of the foot and little toe, communicating on the dorsum of the foot with the intermediate dorsal cutaneous nerve, a branch of the superficial perineal. In the leg, its branches communicate with those of the posterior femoral cutaneous. The medial calcaneal branches, rami calcanei medialis, internal calcaneal branches, perforate the laciniate ligament, and supply the skin of the heel and medial side of the sole of the foot. The medial plantar nerve, nervus plantaris medialis, internal plantar nerve, the larger of the two terminal divisions of the tibial nerve, accompanies the medial plantar artery. From its origin under the laciniate ligament, it passes under the cover of the abductor hallucis, and appearing between this muscle and the flexor digitorum brevis, gives off a proper digital plantar nerve, and finally divides opposite the bases of the metatarsal bones into three common digital plantar nerves. Branches. The branches of the medial plantar nerve are 1. Cutaneous, 2. Muscular, 3. Articular, 4. A proper digital nerve to the medial side of the great toe, and 5. 
three common digital nerves. The cutaneous branches pierce the plantar aponeurosis between the abductor hallucis and the flexor digitorum brevis and are distributed to the skin of the sole of the foot. The muscular branches supply the abductor hallucis, the flexor digitorum brevis, the flexor hallucis brevis, and the first lumbriculus. Those for the abductor hallucis and flexor digitorum brevis arise from the trunk of the nerve near its origin and enter the deep surfaces of the muscles. The branch of the flexor hallucis brevis springs from the proper digital nerve to the medial side of the great toe, and that for the first lumbriculus from the first common digital nerve. The articular branches supply the articulations of the tarsus and metatarsus. The proper digital nerve of the great toe, nervi digitalis plantaris propriae, plantar digital branches, supplies the flexor hallucis brevis and the skin on the medial side of the great toe. The three common digital nerves, nervi digitalis plantaris communes, pass between the divisions of the plantar aponeurosis and each splits into two proper digital nerves. Those of the first common digital nerve supply the adjacent sides of the great and second toes, those of the second, the adjacent sides of the second and third toes, and those of the third, the adjacent sides of the third and fourth toes. The third common digital nerve receives a communicating branch from the lateral plantar nerve. The first gives a twig to the first lumbriculus. Each proper digital nerve gives off cutaneous and articular filaments, and opposite the last phalanx sends upward a dorsal branch, which supplies the structures around the nail, the continuation of the nerve being distributed to the ball of the toe. It will be observed that these digital nerves are similar in their distribution to those of the median nerve in the hand. The lateral plantar nerve, nervus plantaris lateralis, external plantar nerve, supplies the skin of the fifth toe and lateral half of the fourth, as well as most of the deep muscles, its distribution being similar to that of the ulnar nerve in the hand. It passes obliquely forward with the lateral plantar artery to the lateral side of the foot, lying between the flexor digitorum brevis and the quadratus planti, and in the interval between the former muscle and the abductor digiti quinti, divides into a superficial and a deep branch. Before its division, it supplies the quadratus planti and abductor digiti quinti. The superficial branch, ramus superficialis, splits into a proper and a common digital nerve. The proper digital nerve supplies the lateral side of the little toe, the flexor digiti quinti brevis, and the two interosei of the fourth intermetatarsal space. The common digital nerve communicates with the third common digital branch of the medial plantar nerve and divides into two proper digital nerves which supply the adjoining sides of the fourth and fifth toes. The deep branch, ramus profundus, muscular branch, accompanies the lateral plantar artery on the deep surface of the tendons of the flexor muscles and the adductor hallucis, and supplies all the interosei, except those in the fourth metatarsal space, the second, third, and fourth lumbriculis, and the adductor hallucis. The common perineal nerve, Nervus peroneus communis, external, popliteal nerve, peroneal nerve. About one half the size of the tibial is derived from the dorsal branches of the fourth and fifth lumbar and the first and second sacral nerves. It descends obliquely along the lateral side of the popliteal fossa to the head of the fibula, close to the medial margin of the biceps femoris muscle. It lies between the tendon of the biceps femoris and lateral head of the gastrocnemius muscle, winds around the neck of the fibula, between the peroneus longus and the bone, and divides between the muscle into the superficial and deep peroneal nerves. Previous to its division, it gives off articular and lateral sural cutaneous nerves. The articular branches, rami articulares, are three in number. Two of these accompany the superior and inferior lateral genicular arteries to the knee. The upper one occasionally arises from the trunk of the sciatic nerve. The third, recurrent, articular nerve is given off at the point of division of the common perineal nerve. It ascends with the anterior recurrent tibial artery 
through the tibialis anterior to the front of the knee. The lateral sural cutaneous nerve, nervus cutaneous surae lateralis, lateral cutaneous branch, supplies the skin on the posterior and lateral surfaces of the leg. One branch, the perineal anastomonic, nervus communicans fibularis, arises near the head of the fibula, crosses the lateral head of the gastrocnemius to the middle of the leg, and joins with the medial sural cutaneous to form the sural nerve. The peroneal anastomonic is occasionally continued down as a separate branch as far as the heel. The deep perineal nerve, nervus peroneus profundus, anterior tibial nerve, begins at the bifurcation of the common perineal nerve between the fibula and the upper part of the peroneus longus, passes obliquely forward beneath the extensor digitorum longus to the front of the interosseous membrane and comes into relation with the anterior tibula artery above the middle of the leg. It then descends with the artery to the front of the ankle joint, where it divides into a lateral and a medial terminal branch. It lies at first at the lateral side of the anterior tibial artery, then in front of it, and again on its lateral side at the ankle joint. In the leg, the deep perineal nerve supplies muscular branches to the tibialis anterior, extensor digitorum longus, peroneus tertius, and extensor hallucis propius, and an articular branch to the ankle joint. The lateral terminal branch, external or tarsal branch, passes across the tarsus beneath the extensor digitorum brevis, and having become enlarged like the dorsal interosseous nerve at the wrist, supplies the extensor digitorum brevis. From the enlargement, three minute interosseous branches are given off, which supply the tarsal joints and the metatarsal phalangeal joints of the second, third, and fourth toes. The first of these sends a filament to the second interosseous dorsalis muscle. The medial terminal branch, internal branch, accompanies the dorsalis pedis artery along the dorsum of the foot, and, at the first interosseous space, divides into two dorsal digital nerves, nervi, Digitalis dorsalis hallucis lateralis et digiti secundi medialis, which supply the adjacent sides of the great and second toes, communicating with the medial dorsal cutaneous branch of the superficial peroneal nerve. Before it divides, it gives off to the first space an interosseous branch, which supplies the metatarsial phalangeal joint of the great toe and sends a filament to the first interosseous dorsalis muscle. The superficial perineal nerve, nervus peroneus superficialis, musculocutaneous nerve, supplies the perone longus and brevis and the skin over the greater part of the dorsum of the foot. It passes forward between the peroni and the extensor digitorum longus, pierces the deep fascia at the lower third of the leg, and divides into a medial and an intermediate dorsal cutaneous nerve. In its course between the muscles, the nerve gives off muscular branches to the peroni longus and brevis, and cutaneous filaments to the integument of the lower part of the leg. The medial dorsal cutaneous nerve, nervus cutaneus dorsalis medialis, internal dorsal cutaneous branch, passes in front of the ankle joint and divides into two dorsal digital branches, one of which supplies the medial side of the great toe, the other the adjacent side of the second and third toes. It also supplies the integument of the medial side of the foot and ankle, and communicates with the saphenous nerve and with the deep perineal nerve. The intermediate dorsal cutaneous nerve, nervus cutaneus dorsalis intermedius, external dorsal cutaneous branch. The smaller passes along the lateral part of the dorsum of the foot and divides into the dorsal digital branches, which supply the contiguous sides of the third and fourth and of the fourth and fifth toes.
It also supplies the skin of the lateral side of the foot and ankle, and communicates with the sural nerve. The branches of the superficial perineal nerve supply the skin of the dorsal surfaces of all the toes except the lateral side of the little toe, and the adjoining sides of the great and second toes, the former being supplied by the lateral dorsal cutaneous nerve from the sural nerve, and the latter by the medial branch of the deep perineal nerve. Frequently, some of the lateral branches of the superficial perineal are absent, and their places are then taken by branches of the sural nerve. The pudental plexus, plexus pudentus. The pudental plexus is not sharply marked off from the sacral plexus, and as a consequence, some of the branches which spring from it may arise in conjunction with those of the sacral plexus. It lies on the posterior wall of the pelvis, and is usually formed by branches from the anterior divisions of the second and third sacral nerves. The whole of the anterior divisions of the fourth and fifth sacral nerves, and the coccygeal nerve. It gives off the following branches. Perforating cutaneous, second and third sacral. Pudental, second, third, and fourth sacral. Viscaral, third and fourth sacral. Muscular, fourth sacral. Anocoxygeal, fourth and fifth sacral, and coccygeal. The perforating cutaneous nerve, nervus cuneum inferior, medialis, usually arises from the posterior surface of the second and third sacral nerves. It pierces the lower part of the sacrotuberous ligament, and winding around the inferior border of the gluteus maximus, supplies the skin covering the medial and lower parts of that muscle. The perforating cutaneous nerve may arise from the pudental, or it may be absent. In the latter case, its place may be taken by a branch from the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, or by a branch from the third and fourth, or fourth and fifth, sacral nerves. The pudental nerve, nervus pudentus, internal pudic nerve, derives its fibers from the ventral branches of the second, third, and fourth sacral nerves. It passes between the piriformis and coccygeus muscles, and leaves the pelvis through the lower part of the greater sciatic foramen. It then crosses the spine of the ischium and re-enters the pelvis through the lesser sciatic foramen. It accompanies the internal pudental vessels upward and forward along the lateral wall of the ichiorectal fossa, being contained in a sheath of the obturator fascia termed Alcox canal, and divides into two terminal branches viz. the perineal nerve and the dorsal nerve of the penis or clitoris. Before its division, it gives off the inferior hemorrhoidal nerve. The inferior hemorrhoidal nerve, nervus hemorrhoidalis inferior, occasionally arises directly from the sacral plexus. It crosses the ichiorectal fossa with the inferior hemorrhoidal vessels toward the anal canal and the lower end of the rectum and is distributed to the sphincter ani externus and to the integument around the anus. Branches of this nerve communicate with the perineal branch of the posterior femoral cutaneous and with the posterior scrotal nerves at the forepart of the perineum. The perineal nerve, nervus perinei, the inferior and larger of the two terminal branches of the pudental, is situated below the internal pudental artery. It accompanies the perineal artery and divides into posterior scrotal or labial and muscular branches. The posterior scrotal or labial branches, nervi scrotales or labiales, posteriores, superficial peroneal nerves, are two in number, medial and lateral. They pierce the fascia of the ural genital diaphragm and run forward along the lateral part of the urethral triangle in company with the posterior scrotal branches of the perineal artery. They are distributed to the skin of the scrotum and communicate with the perineal branch of the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. These nerves supply the labia magus in the female. 
The muscular branches are distributed to the transversus, perini, superficialis, bulbocavernous, ichiocavernosus, and the constrictor urethra. A branch, the nerve to the bulb, given off from the nerve to the bulbocavernosus, pierces this muscle and supplies the corpus cavernosum urethrae, ending in the mucous membrane of the urethra. The dorsal nerve of the penis, nervus dorsalis penis, is the deepest division of the pudential nerve. It accompanies the internal pudential artery along the ramus of the ischium. It then runs forward along the margin of the inferior ramus of the pubis, between the superior and inferior layers of the fascia of the urogenital diaphragm. Piercing the inferior layer, it gives a branch to the corpus cavernosum penis and passes forward in company with the dorsal artery of the penis, between the layers of the suspensory ligament, onto the dorsum of the penis, and ends on the glans penis. In the female, this nerve is very small and supplies the clitoris, nervus dorsalis clitoridis. The visceral branches arise from the third and fourth and sometimes from the second sacral nerves and are distributed to the bladder and rectum and, in the female, to the vagina. They communicate with the pelvic plexuses of the sympathetic. The muscular branches are derived from the fourth sacral and supply the levator ani coccygeus and sphincter ani externus. The branches of the levator ani and coccygeus enter their pelvic surfaces, that to the sphincter ani externus, perineal branch, reaches the ischyorectal fossa by piercing the coccygeus or by passing between it and the levator ani. Cutaneous filaments from this branch supply the skin between the anus and the coccyx. Anococcygeal nerves Nervi anocoxygiae. The fifth sacral nerve receives a communicating filament from the fourth and unites with the coccygeal nerve to form the coccygeal plexus. From this plexus, the anocoxygeal nerves take origin. They consist of a few fine filaments which pierce the sacral tuberous ligament to supply the skin in the region of the coccyx. The sympathetic nerves. The sympathetic nervous system innervates all the smooth muscles and the various glands of the body and the striated muscles of the heart. The efferent sympathetic fibers, which leave the central nervous system in connection with certain of the cranial and spinal nerves, all end in sympathetic ganglia and are known as preganglionic fibers. From these ganglia, postganglionic fibers arise and conduct impulses to the different organs. In addition, afferent or sensory fibers connect many of these structures with the central nervous system. The peripheral portion of the sympathetic nervous system is characterized by the presence of numerous ganglia and complicated plexuses. These ganglia are connected with the central nervous system by three groups of sympathetic efferent or preganglionic fibers, that is the cranial, the thoracolumbar, and the sacral. These outflows of sympathetic fibers are separated by intervals where no connections exist. The cranial and sacral sympathetics are often grouped together owing to the resemblance between the reactions produced by stimulating them and by the effects of certain drugs. Acetylcholine, for example, when injected intravenously in very small doses, produces the same effect as the stimulation of the cranial or sacral sympathetics while the introduction of adrenaline produces the same effect as the stimulation of the thoracolumbar sympathetics. Much of our present knowledge of the sympathetic nervous system has been acquired through the application of various drugs, especially nicotine, which paralyzes connections or synapses between the preganglionic and postganglionic fibers of the sympathetic nerves. When it is injected into the general circulation, all such synapses are paralyzed. When it is applied locally on a ganglion, only the synapses occurring in that particular ganglion are paralyzed. Langley, who has contributed greatly to our knowledge, adapted a terminology somewhat different from that used here and still different from that used by the pharmacologist. This has led to considerable confusion, as shown by the arrangement of the terms in the following columns. Gaskell has used the term involuntary nervous system. Gray, sympathetic nervous system. Langley, autonomic nervous system. Meyer and Gottlieb, vegetative nervous system. Gray, craniosacral sympathetics. Langley, parasympathetics. 
Myron Gottlieb Autonomic. Gray, Oculomotor Sympathetics. Langley, Tectal Autonomics. Meyer and Gottlieb Cranial Autonomics. Gray, Facial Sympathetics, Glossopharyngeal Sympathetics, Vagal Sympathetics. Langley, Bulbar Autonomics. Gray, Sacral Sympathetics, Langley, Sacral Autonomics, Meyer and Gottlieb Sacral Autonomics. Gray, Thoracolumbar Sympathetics, Langley, Sympathetic, Meyer and Gottlieb Sympathetic, Gray, Enteric, Langley, Thoracic Autonomic, and Enteric, Meyer and Gottlieb Enteric. The Cranial Sympathetics The cranial sympathetics include sympathetic efferent fibers in the oculomotor, facial, glossopharyngeal, and vagus nerves, as well as sympathetic afferent in the last three nerves. The sympathetic efferent fibers of the oculomotor nerve probably arise from cells in the anterior part of the oculomotor nucleus, which is located in the tegmentum of the midbrain. These preganglionic fibers run with the third nerve into the orbit and pass to the ciliary ganglion, where they terminate by forming synapses with sympathetic motor neurons whose axons, postganglionic fibers, proceed as the short ciliary nerves to the eyeball. Here, they supply motor fibers to the ciliaris muscle and the sphincter pupillae muscle. So far as known, there are no sympathetic afferent fibers connected with the nerve. The sympathetic efferent fibers of the facial nerve are supposed to arise from the small cells of the facial nucleus. According to some authors, the fibers to the salivary glands arise from a special nucleus, the superior salivatory nucleus, consisting of cells scattered in the reticular formation, dorsomedial to the facial nucleus. These preganglionic fibers are distributed partly through the corda tympani and lingual nerves to the submaxillary ganglion, where they terminate about the cell bodies of neurons whose axons as postganglionic fibers conduct secretory and vasodilatory impulses to the submaxillary and sublingual glands. Other preganglionic fibers of the facial nerve pass via the great superficial petrosal nerve to the sphenopalatine ganglion, where they form synapses with neurons whose postganglionic fibers are distributed with the superior maxillary nerve as vasodilator and secretory fibers to the mucous membranes of the nose, soft palate, tongues, uvula, roof of the mouth, upper lips and gums, parotid and orbital glands. There are supposed to be a few sympathetic afferent fibers connected with the facial nerve, whose cell bodies lie in the geniculate ganglion, but very little is known about them. The sympathetic afferent fibers of the glossopharyngeal nerve are supposed to arise either in the dorsal nucleus, nucleus alasaneria, or in a distinct nucleus, the inferior salivatory nucleus situated near the dorsal nucleus. These preganglionic fibers pass into the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal and then with the small superficial petrosal nerve to the otic ganglion. Postganglionic fibers, vasodilator, and secretory fibers are distributed to the parotid gland, to the mucous membrane and its glands on the tongue, the floor of the mouth, and the lower gums. Sympathetic afferent fibers, whose cells of origin lie in the superior or inferior ganglion of the trunk, are supposed to terminate in the dorsal nucleus. Very little is known of the peripheral distribution of these fibers. The sympathetic efferent fibers of the vagus nerve are supposed to arise in the dorsal nucleus, nucleus alasineria. These preganglionic fibers are all supposed to end in sympathetic ganglia situated in or near the organ supplied by the vagus sympathetics. The inhibitory fibers to the heart probably terminate in the small ganglia of the heart wall, especially the atrium, from which inhibitory postganglionic fibers are distributed to the musculature. The preganglionic motor fibers to the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, and the greater part of the large intestine are supposed to terminate in the plexuses of Auerbach, from which postganglionic fibers are distributed to the smooth muscles of these organs. Other fibers pass to the smooth muscles of the bronchial tree and to the gallbladder and its ducts. In addition, the vagus is believed to contain secretory fibers to the stomach and pancreas. It probably contains many other efferent fibers than those enumerated above. Sympathetic afferent fibers of the vagus, whose cells of origin lie in the jugular ganglion or the ganglion nodosum, 
probably terminate in the dorsal nucleus of the medulla oblongata, or according to some authors, in the nucleus of the tractus solitarius. Peripherally, the fibers are supposed to be distributed to the various organs supplied by the sympathetic efferent nerves. The sacral sympathetics. The sacral sympathetic efferent fibers leave the spinal cord with the anterior roots of the second, third, and fourth sacral nerves. These small, medullated, preganglionic fibers are collected together in the pelvis into the nervus erigentes, or pelvic nerve, which proceeds to the hypogastric, or pelvic plexuses, from which postganglionic fibers are distributed to the pelvic viscera. Motor fibers pass to the smooth muscle of the descending colon, rectum, anus, and bladder. Vasodilators are distributed to these organs and to the external genitalia, while inhibitory fibers probably pass to the smooth muscles of the external genitalia. Afferent sympathetic fibers conduct impulses from the pelvic viscera to the second, third, and fourth sacral nerves. Their cells of origin lie in the spinal ganglia. The thoracolumbar sympathetics. The thoracolumbar sympathetic fibers arise from the dorsolateral region of the anterior column of the gray matter of the spinal cord and pass with the anterior roots of all the thoracic and upper two or three lumbar spinal nerves. These preganglionic fibers enter the white rami communicantes and proceed to the sympathetic trunk where many of them end in its ganglia. Others pass to the prevertebral plexuses and terminate in its collateral ganglia. The postganglionic fibers have a wide distribution. The vasoconstrictor fibers to the blood vessels of the skin of the trunk and limbs, for example, leave the spinal cord as preganglionic fibers in all the thoracic and upper two or three lumbar spinal nerves and terminate in the ganglia of the sympathetic trunk, either in the ganglion directly connected with its ramus or in neighboring ganglia. Postganglionic fibers arise in these ganglia, pass through the gray rami communicantes to all the spinal nerves, and are distributed with their cutaneous branches, ultimately leaving these branches to join the small arteries. The postganglionic fibers do not necessarily return to the same spinal nerves, which contain the corresponding preganglionic fibers. The vasoconstrictor fibers to the head come from the upper thoracic nerves. The preganglionic fibers end in the superior cervical ganglion. The postganglionic fibers pass through the internal carotid nerve and branch from it to join the sensory branches of the various cranial nerves, especially the trigeminal nerve. Other fibers to the deep structures and the salivary glands probably accompany the arteries. The postganglionic vasoconstrictor fibers to the blood vessels of the abdominal viscera arise in the prevertebral or collateral ganglion in which terminate many preganglionic fibers. Vasoconstrictor fibers to the pelvic viscera arise from the inferior mesenteric ganglia. The pilomotor fibers to the hairs and the motor fibers to the sweat glands apparently have a distribution similar to that of the vasoconstrictors of the skin. A vasoconstrictor center has been located by the physiologist in the neighborhood of the facial nucleus. Axons from its cells are supposed to descend in the spinal cord to terminate about cell bodies of the preganglionic fibers located in the dorsolateral portion of the anterior column of the thoracic and upper lumbar region. The motor supply to the dilator pupillae muscle of the eye comes from preganglionic sympathetic fibers which leave the spinal cord with the anterior roots of the upper thoracic nerves. These fibers pass to the sympathetic trunk through the white rami communicantes and terminate in the superior cervical ganglion. Postganglionic fibers from the superior cervical ganglion pass through the internal carotid nerve and into the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve to the orbit, where the long ciliary nerves conduct the impulses to the eyeball and dilator pupillae muscle. The cell bodies of these preganglionic fibers are connected with fibers which descend from the midbrain. Other postganglionic fibers from the superior cervical ganglion are distributed as secretory fibers to the salivary glands, the lacrimal glands, and to the small glands of the mucous membranes of the nose, mouth, and pharynx. The thoracic sympathetics supply accelerated nerves to the heart. They are supposed to emerge from the spinal cord in the anterior roots of the upper four or five thoracic nerves and pass with the white rami to the first thoracic ganglion. Here some terminate, others pass in the ansa subclavia to the inferior cervical ganglion. The postganglionic fibers pass from these ganglia partly through the ansa subclavia to the heart. On their way, they intermingle with sympathetic fibers from the vagus to form the cardiac plexus. Inhibitory fibers to the smooth musculature of the stomach 
the small intestine, and most of the large intestine are supposed to emerge in the anterior roots of the lower thoracic and upper lumbar nerves. These fibers pass through the white rami and sympathetic trunk and are conveyed by the splanchnic nerves to the prevertebral plexus where they terminate in the collateral ganglia. From the celiac and superior mesenteric ganglia, postganglionic fibers, inhibitory, are distributed to the stomach, the small intestine, and most of the large intestine. Inhibitory fibers to the descending colon, the rectum, and the internal sphincter ani are probably postganglionic fibers from the inferior mesenteric ganglion. The thoracolumbar sympathetics are characterized by the presence of numerous ganglia, which may be divided into two groups, central and collateral. The central ganglia are arranged in two vertical rows, one on either side of the midline, situated partly in front and partly at the sides of the vertebral column. Each ganglion is joined by intervening nervous cords to adjacent ganglia, so that two chains, the sympathetic trunks, are formed. The collateral ganglia are found in connection with the three great prevertebral plexuses placed within the thorax, abdomen, and pelvis, respectively. The sympathetic trunks, truncus sympatheticus, gangliated cord, extend from the base of the skull to the coccyx. The cephalic end of each is continued upward through the carotid canal into the skull and forms a plexus on the internal carotid artery. The caudal ends of the trunk converge and end in a single ganglion, the ganglion impar, placed in front of the coccyx. The ganglia of each trunk are distinguished as cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral, and, except in the neck, they are closely correspond in number to the vertebrae. They are arranged thus. Cervical portion, 3 ganglia. Thoracic portion, 12 ganglia. Lumbar portion, 4 ganglia. Sacral portion, 4 or 5 ganglia. In the neck, the ganglia lie in front of the transverse processes of the vertebrae, in the thoracic region in front of the heads of the ribs, in the lumbar region on the sides of the vertebral bodies, and in the sacral region in front of the sacrum. Connection with the spinal nerves. Communications are established between the sympathetic and spinal nerves through what are known as gray and white rami communicantes. The gray rami convey sympathetic fibers to the spinal nerves and the white rami transmit spinal fibers to the sympathetic. Each spinal nerve receives a gray ramus communicans from the sympathetic trunk, but white rami are not supplied by all the spinal nerves. White rami are derived from the first thoracic to the first lumbar nerves inclusive, while the visceral branches which run from the second, third, and fourth sacral nerves directly to the pelvic plexus of the sympathetic belong to this category. The fibers which reach the sympathetic through the white rami communicantes are medullated. Those which spring from the cells of the sympathetic ganglia are almost entirely non-medulated. The sympathetic nerves consist of efferent and afferent fibers, the origin and course of which are described subsequently. The three great gangliated plexuses, collateral ganglia, are situated in front of the vertebral column in the thoracic, abdominal, and pelvic regions, and are named respectively the cardiac, the solar or epigastric, and the hypogastric plexuses. They consist of collection of nerves and ganglia, the nerve being derived from the sympathetic trunks and from the cerebrospinal nerves. They distribute branches to the viscera. Development The ganglion cells of the sympathetic system are derived from the cells of the neural crests. As these crests move forward along the sides of the neural tube and become segmented off to form the spinal ganglia, certain cells detach themselves from the ventral margins of the crests and migrate towards the sides of the aorta. Some of them are grouped to form the ganglia of the sympathetic trunks, while others undergo a further migration and form the ganglia of the prevertebral and visceral plexuses. The ciliary, sphenopalatine, otic, and submaxillary ganglia, which are found on the branches of the trigeminal nerve, are formed by groups of cells which have migrated from part of the neural crest, which gives rise to the semilunar ganglion. Some of the cells of the ciliary ganglion are said to migrate from the neural tube along the ocular motor nerve. The cephalic and cervical portions of the sympathetic system. The cephalic portion of the sympathetic system. Pars cephalica, S, sympathesi. The cephalic portion of the sympathetic system begins as the internal carotid nerve, which appears to be a direct prolongation of the superior cervical ganglion. It is soft in texture and of a reddish color. It ascends by the side of the internal carotid artery and entering the carotid canal in the temporal bone divides into two branches, which lie one on the lateral and the other on the medial side of that vessel. The lateral branch, the larger of the two, distributes filaments to the internal carotid artery 
and forms the internal carotid plexus. The medial branch also distributes filaments to the internal carotid artery and continuing onward forms the cavernous plexus. The internal carotid plexus, plexus carotidus interneus, carotid plexus, is situated on the lateral side of the internal carotid artery and in the plexus there occasionally exists a small gangliaform swelling, the carotid ganglion, on the undersurface of the artery. The internal carotid plexus communicates with the semilunar ganglion, the abducent nerve, and the sphenopontine ganglion. It distributes filaments to the wall of the carotid artery and also communicates with the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve. The communicating branches with the abducent nerve consist of one or two filaments which join that nerve as it lies upon the lateral side of the internal carotid artery. The communication with the sphenopalatine ganglion is affected by a branch, the deep petrosal, given off from the plexus on the lateral side of the artery. This branch passes through the cartilage filling up the frame and lacerum and joins the gradal superficial petrosal to form the nerve of the pterygoid canal, vidian nerve, which passes through the pterygoid canal to the sphenopontine ganglion. Communication with the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve is affected by the corticotympanic, which may consist of two or three delicate filaments. The cavernous plexus, plexus cavernosus, is situated below and medial to that part of the internal carotid artery, which is placed by the side of the cella tersica in the cavernous sinus, and is formed chiefly by the medial division of the internal carotid nerve. It communicates with the ocular motor, the trochlear, the optomic, and the abducent nerves, and with the ciliary ganglion, and distributes filaments to the wall of the internal carotid artery. The branch of communication with the ocular motor nerve joins that nerve at its point of division. The branch to the trochlear nerve joins it as it lies on the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Other filaments are connected with the undersurface of the ophthalmic nerve, and the second filament joins the abducent nerve. The filaments of connection with the ciliary ganglion arise from the anterior part of the cavernous plexus and enter the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. They may join the nasociliary branch of the ophthalmic nerve or be continued forward as a separate branch. The terminal filaments from the internal carotid and cavernous plexuses are prolonged as plexuses around the anterior and middle cerebral arteries and the ophthalmic artery. Along the formal vessels, they may be traced to the pia mater. Along the latter, into the orbit where they accompany each of the branches of the vessel. The filaments prolonged onto the anterior communicating artery connect the sympathetic nerves of the right and left sides. The cervical portion of the sympathetic system. Pars cervicalis s sympathesi. The cervical portion of the sympathetic trunk consists of three ganglia, distinguished according to positions as the superior, middle, and inferior ganglia, connected by intervening cords. This portion receives no white rami communicantes from the cervical spinal nerves. Its spinal fibers are derived from the white rami of the upper thoracic nerves and enter the corresponding thoracic ganglia of the sympathetic trunk, through which they ascend into the neck. The superior cervical ganglion, ganglion cervicali superiorius, the largest of the three, is placed opposite the second and third cervical vertebrae. It is of reddish-gray color and usually fusiform in shape, sometimes broad and flattened, and occasionally constricted at intervals. It is believed to be formed by the coalescence of four ganglia, corresponding to the upper four cervical nerves. It is in relation in front with the sheath of the internal carotid artery and internal jugular vein, behind with the longest capitis muscle. Its branches may be divided into inferior, lateral, medial, and anterior. The inferior branch communicates with the middle cervical ganglion. The lateral branches, external branches, consist of gray ray micommunicantes to the upper four cervical nerves and to certain of the cranial nerves. Sometimes the branch to the fourth cervical nerve may come from the trunk connecting the upper and middle cervical ganglia. The branches to the cranial nerves consist of delicate filaments which run to the ganglion nodosum of the vagus and to the hypoglossal nerve. A filament, the jugular nerve, passes upward to the base of the skull and divides to join the petrous ganglion of the glossopharyngeal and the jugular ganglion of the vagus. The medial branches, internal branches, are peripheral and are the laryngopharyngeal branches and the superior cardiac nerve. The laryngopharyngeal branches, rami laryngopharyngei, pass to the sides of the pharynx where they join with branches from the glossopharyngeal vagus and external laryngeal nerves to form the pharyngeal plexus. The superior cardiac nerve, nervus cardiacus superior, arises by two or more branches from the superior cervical ganglion and occasionally receives a filament from the trunk between the first and second cervical ganglia. It runs down the neck behind the common carotid artery and in front of the longus coli muscle.
and crosses in front of the inferior thyroid artery and recurrent nerve. The course of the nerves on the two sides then differ. The right nerve at the root of the neck passes either in front of or behind the subclavian artery and along the anominate artery to the back of the arch of the aorta where it joins the deep part of the cardiac plexus. It is connected with other branches of the sympathetic. About the middle of the neck, it receives filaments from the external laryngeal nerve, lower down, one or two twigs from the vagus, and as it enters the thoracic, it is joined by a filament from the recurrent nerve. Filaments from the nerve communicate with the thyroid branches from the middle cervical ganglion. The left nerve, in the thorax, runs in front of the left common carotid artery and across the left side of the arch of the aorta to the superficial part of the cardiac plexus. The anterior branches nervus carotisi externi, ramify upon the common carotid artery and upon the external carotid artery and its branches, forming around each a delicate plexus, on the nerves composing which small ganglia are occasionally found. The plexuses accompanying some of these arteries have important communications with other nerves. That surrounding the external maxillary artery communicates with the submaxillary ganglion by a filament, and that accompanying the middle meningeal artery sends an offset to the otic ganglia, and a second, the external petrosal nerve, to the genicular ganglion of the facial nerve. The middle cervical ganglion, ganglion cervicali medium, is the smallest of the three cervical ganglia, and is occasionally wanting. It is placed opposite the six cervical vertebrae, usually in front of, or close to, the inferior thyroid artery. It is probably formed by the coalescence of two ganglia corresponding to the fifth and sixth cervical nerves. It sends gray rami communicantes to the fifth and sixth cervical nerves and gives off the middle cardiac nerve. The middle cardiac nerve, nerve cardiacus medius, great cardiac nerve, is the largest of the three cardiac nerves, arises from the middle cervical ganglion or from the trunk between the middle and inferior ganglia. On the right side, it descends behind the common carotid artery and at the root of the neck runs either in front of or behind the subclavian artery. It then descends on the trachea, receives a few filaments from the recurrent nerve, and joins the right half of the deep part of the cardiac plexus. In the neck, it communicates with the superior cardiac and recurrent nerves. On the left side, the middle cardiac nerve enters the chest between the left carotid and subclavian arteries and joins the left half of the deep part of the cardiac plexus. The inferior cervical ganglion, ganglion cervicali inferius, is situated between the base of the transverse process of the last cervical vertebra and the neck of the first rib on the medial side of the costocervical artery. Its form is irregular, it is larger in size than the preceding, and is frequently fused with the first thoracic ganglion. It is probably formed by the coalescence of two ganglia, which correspond to the seventh and eighth cervical nerves. It is connected to the middle cervical ganglion by two or more cords, one of which forms a loop around the subclavian artery and supplies offsets to it. This loop is named ansa subclavia, via sene. The ganglion sends gray rami communicantes to the seventh and eighth cervical nerves. It gives off the inferior cardiac nerve and offsets to blood vessels. The inferior cardiac nerve, nervus cardiacus inferior, arise from either the inferior cervical or the first thoracic ganglion. It descends behind the subclavian artery and along the front of the trachea to join the deep part of the cardiac plexus. It communicates freely behind the subclavian artery with the recurrent nerve and the middle cardiac nerve. The offsets to blood vessels form plexuses on the subclavian artery and its branches. The plexus on the vertebral artery is continued on to the basilar, posterior cerebral, and cerebellar arteries. The plexus on the inferior thyroid artery accompanies the artery to the thyroid gland and communicates with the recurrent and external laryngeal nerves, with the superior cardiac nerve, and with the plexus on the common carotid artery. 7C. The thoracic portion of the sympathetic system. Pars thoracalis s sympathesi. The thoracic portion of the sympathetic trunk consists of a series of ganglia, which usually correspond in number to that of the vertebrae, but on account of the occasional coalescence of two ganglia, their number is uncertain. The thoracic ganglia rest against the heads of the ribs and are covered by the costal pleura. The last two, however, are more anterior than the rest and are placed on the sides of the bodies of the 11th and 12th thoracic vertebrae. The ganglia are small in size and of a grayish color. The first, larger than the others, is of an elongated form 
and frequently blended with the inferior cervical ganglion. They are connected together by the intervening portions of the trunk. Two ramy communicantes, a white and a gray, connect each ganglia with its corresponding spinal nerve. The branches from the upper five ganglia are very small. They supply filaments to the thoracic artery and its branches. Twigs from the second, third, and fourth ganglia enter the posterior pulmonary plexus. The branches from the lower seven ganglia are large and white in color. They distribute filaments to the aorta and unite to form the greater, the lesser, and the lowest splanchnic nerves. The greater splanchnic nerve, and splanchnicus major, great splanchnic nerve, is white in color, firm in texture, and of a considerable size. It is formed by branches from the fifth to the ninth or tenth thoracic ganglia, but the fibers in the higher roots may be traced upward in the sympathetic trunk as far as the first or second thoracic ganglion. It descends obliquely on the bodies of the vertebrae, perforates the crust of the diaphragm, and ends in the ciliac ganglion. A ganglion, ganglion splanchnicum, exists on this nerve opposite the eleventh or twelfth thoracic vertebra. The lesser splanchnic nerve, and splanchnicus minor, is formed by filaments from the ninth and tenth, and sometimes the eleventh thoracic ganglia, and from the cord between them. It pierces the diaphragm with the preceding nerve and joins the aorticorenal ganglion. The lower splanchnic nerve, splanchnicus imus, least splanchnic nerve, arises from the last thoracic ganglion, and, piercing the diaphragm, ends in the renal plexus. A striking analogy exists between the splanchnic and the cardiac nerves. The cardiac nerves are three in number. They arise from all three cervical ganglia and are distributed to a large and important organ in the thoracic cavity. The splanchnic nerves, also three in number, are connected probably with all the thoracic ganglia and are distributed to important organs in the abdominal cavity. 7D the abdominal portion of the sympathetic system, pars abdominalis s sympathesi, lumbar portion of ganglionated cord. The abdominal portion of the sympathetic trunk is situated in front of the vertebral column, along the medial margin of the psoas major. It consists usually of four lumbar ganglia, connected together by interganglionic cords. It is continuous above with the thoracic portion beneath the medial lumbocostal arch and below with the pelvic portion behind the common iliac artery. The ganglia are of small size and placed much nearer the median line than are the thoracic ganglia. Gray rami communicantes pass from all the ganglia to the lumbar spinal nerves. The first and second and sometimes the third lumbar nerves send white rami communicantes to the corresponding ganglia. The rami communicantes are of considerable length and accompany the lumbar arteries around the sides of the bodies of the vertebrae, passing beneath the fibrous arches from which some of the fibers of the psoas major arise. Of the branches of distribution, some pass in front of the aorta and join the aortic plexus. Others descend in front of the common iliac arteries and assist in forming the hypogastric plexus. 7e. The pelvic portion of the sympathetic system. Pars pelvina s sympathesi. The pelvic portion of each sympathetic trunk is situated in front of the sacrum, medial to the anterior sacral foramina. It consists of four or five small sacral ganglia connected together by interganglionic cords and continuous above with the abdominal portion. Below, the two pelvic sympathetic trunks converge and end on the front of the coccyx in a small ganglion, the ganglion impar. Gray rami communicantes pass from the ganglia to the sacral and the coccygeal nerves. No white rami communicantes are given to this part of the ganglionated cord, but the visceral branches which arise from the third and fourth 
and sometimes from the second, sacral, and run directly to the pelvic plexuses, are regarded as the white rami communicantes. The branches of distribution communicate on the front of the sacrum with the corresponding branches from the opposite side. Some, from the first two ganglia, pass to join the pelvic plexus, and others form a plexus which accompanies the middle sacral artery and sends filaments to the glomus coxygeum, coxygeal body. The Great Plexuses of the Sympathetic System The great plexuses of the sympathetic are aggregations of nerves and ganglia, situated in the thoracic, abdominal, and pelvic cavities, and named the cardiac, celiac, and hypogastric plexuses. They consist not only of sympathetic fibers derived from the ganglia, but of fibers from the medulla spinalis, which are conveyed through the white remi communicantes. From the plexuses, branches are given to the thoracic, abdominal, and pelvic viscera. The cardiac plexus, plexus cardiacus. The cardiac plexus is situated at the base of the heart and is divided into a superficial part which lies in the concavity of the aortic arch and a deep part between the aortic arch and the trachea. The two parts are, however, closely connected. The superficial part of the cardiac plexus lies beneath the arch of the aorta in front of the right pulmonary artery. It is formed by the superior cardiac branch of the left sympathetic and the lower superior cervical cardiac branch of the left vagus. A small ganglion, the cardiac ganglion of Risberg, is occasionally found connected with these nerves at their point of junction. This ganglion, when present, is situated immediately beneath the arch of the aorta on the right side of the ligamentum arteriosum. The superficial part of the cardiac plexus gives branches A to the deep part of the plexus, B to the anterior coronary plexus, and C to the left anterior pulmonary plexus. The deep part of the cardiac plexus is situated in front of the bifurcation of the trachea, above the point of division of the pulmonary artery, and behind the aortic arch. It is formed by the cardiac nerves derived from the cervical ganglia of the sympathetic and the cardiac branches of the vagus and recurrent nerves. The only cardiac nerves which do not enter into the formation of the deep part of the cardiac plexus are the superior cardiac nerve of the left sympathetic and the lower of the two superior cervical cardiac branches from the left vagus, which pass to the superficial part of the plexus. The branches from the right half of the deep part of the cardiac plexus pass, some in front of and others behind the right pulmonary artery. The former, the more numerous, transmit a few filaments to the anterior pulmonary plexus, and are then continued onward to form part of the anterior coronary plexus. Those behind the pulmonary artery distribute a few filaments to the right atrium, and are then continued onward to form part of the posterior coronary plexus. The left half of the deep part of the plexus is connected with the superficial part of the cardiac plexus and gives filaments to the left atrium and to the anterior pulmonary plexus and is then continued to form the greater part of the posterior coronary plexus. The posterior coronary plexus, plexus coronarius posterior, left coronary plexus is larger than the anterior and accompanies the left coronary artery. It is chiefly formed by filaments prolonged from the left half of the deep part of the cardiac plexus and by a few from the right half. It gives branches to the left atrium and ventricle. The anterior coronary plexus, plexus coronarius anterior, right coronary plexus is formed partly from the superficial and partly from the deep parts of the cardiac plexus, 
It accompanies the right coronary artery and gives branches to the right atrium and ventricle. The celiac plexus. Plexus coliacus. Solar plexus. The celiac plexus, the largest of the three sympathetic plexuses, is situated at the level of the upper part of the first lumbar vertebra and is composed of two large ganglia, the celiac ganglia, and a dense network of nerve fibers uniting them together. It surrounds the celiac artery and the root of the superior mesenteric artery. It lies behind the stomach and the omental bursa, in front of the crura of the diaphragm and the commencement of the abdominal aorta, and between the suprarenal glands. The plexus and the ganglia receive the greater and lesser splanchnic nerves of both sides and some filaments from the right vagus, and give off numerous secondary plexuses along the neighboring arteries. The celiac ganglia, ganglia celiaca, semilunar ganglia, are two large, irregularly shaped masses having the appearance of lymph glands and placed one on either side of the middle line in front of the crura of the diaphragm, close to the suprarenal glands, that on the right side being placed behind the inferior vena cava. The upper part of each ganglion is joined by the greater splanchic nerve, while the lower part, which is segmented off and named the aorti coreno ganglion receives the lesser splanchnic nerve and gives off the greater part of the renal plexus. The secondary plexuses springing from or connected with the celiac plexus are the phrenic, renal, hepatic, spermatic, lenal, superior mesenteric, superior gastric, abdominal aortic, suprarenal, inferior mesenteric. The phrenic plexus, plexus phrenicus, accompanies the inferior phrenic artery to the diaphragm, some filaments passing to the suprarenal gland. It arises from the upper part of the celiac ganglion and is larger on the right than on the left side. It receives one or two branches from the phrenic nerve. At the point of junction of the right phrenic plexus with the phrenic nerve is a small ganglion ganglion phrenicum. This plexus distributes branches to the inferior vena cava and to the suprarenal and hepatic plexuses. The hepatic plexus, plexus hepaticus, the largest offset from the celiac plexus, receives filaments from the left vagus and right phrenic nerves. It accompanies the hepatic artery ramifying upon its branches and upon those of the portal vein in the substance of the liver. Branches from this plexus accompany all the divisions of the hepatic artery. A considerable plexus accompanies the gastroduodenal artery and is continued as the inferior gastric plexus on the right gastroepiploic artery along the greater curvature of the stomach where it unites with offshoots from the lenal plexus. The lenal plexus, plexus lenalis, splenic plexus, is formed by branches from the celiac plexus, the left celiac ganglion, and from the right vagus nerve. It accompanies the lenal artery to the spleen, giving off, in its course, subsidiary plexuses along the various branches of the artery. The superior gastric plexus, plexus gastricus superior, gastric or coronary plexus, accompanies the left gastric artery along the lesser curvature of the stomach and joins with branches from the left vagus. The suprarenal plexus, plexus suprarenalis, is formed by branches from the celiac plexus, from the celiac ganglion, and from the phrenic and greater splanchic nerves a ganglion being formed at the point of junction with the latter nerve. The plexus supplies the suprarenal gland, being distributed chiefly to its medullary portion. Its branches are remarkable for their large size in comparison with that of the organ they supply. The renal plexus, plexus renalis, 
is formed by filaments from the celiac plexus, the aorticorenal ganglion, and the aortic plexus. It is joined also by the smallest plancic nerve. The nerves from these sources, fifteen or twenty in number, have a few ganglia developed upon them. They accompany the branches of the renal artery into the kidney. Some filaments are distributed to the spermatic plexus and, on the right side, to the inferior vena cava. The spermatic plexus, plexus spermaticus, is derived from the renal plexus, receiving branches from the aortic plexus. It accompanies the internal spermatic artery to the testes. In the female, the ovarian plexus, plexus arteriae ovaricae, arises from the renal plexus and is distributed to the ovary and fundus of the uterus. The superior mesenteric plexus, plexus mesentericus superior, is a continuation of the lower part of the celiac plexus, receiving a branch from the junction of the right vagus nerve with the plexus. It surrounds the superior mesenteric artery, accompanies it into the mesentery, and divides into a number of secondary plexuses, which are distributed to all parts supplied by the artery, viz. pancreatic branches to the pancreas, intestinal branches to the small intestine, and iliocolic, right colic, and middle colic branches, which supply the corresponding parts of the great intestine. The nerves composing this plexus are white in color and firm in texture. In the upper part of the plexus, close to the origin of the superior mesenteric artery, is a ganglion, ganglion mesentericum superius, the abdominal aortic plexus. Plexus aorticus abdominalis, aortic plexus, is formed by branches derived on either side from the celiac plexus and ganglia and receives filaments from some of the lumbar ganglia. It is situated upon the sides and front of the aorta, between the origins of the superior and inferior mesenteric arteries. From this plexus arise part of the spermatic, the inferior mesenteric, and the hypogastric plexuses. It also distributes filaments to the inferior vena cava. The inferior mesenteric plexus Plexus mesentericus inferior is derived chiefly from the aortic plexus. It surrounds the inferior mesenteric artery and divides into a number of secondary plexuses which are distributed to all the parts supplied by the artery, viz. the left colic and sigmoid plexuses which supply the descending and sigmoid parts of the colon and the superior hemorrhoidal plexus which supplies the rectum and joins in the pelvis with branches from the pelvic plexuses. The hypogastric plexus, plexus hypogastricus. The hypogastric plexus is situated in front of the last lumbar vertebra and the promontory of the sacrum, between the two common iliac arteries, and is formed by the union of numerous filaments which descend on either side from the aortic plexus and from the lumbar ganglia. It divides below into two lateral portions, which are named the pelvic plexuses. The pelvic plexuses. The pelvic plexuses supply the viscera of the pelvic cavity and are situated at the sides of the rectum in the male and at the sides of the rectum and vagina in the female. They are formed on either side by a continuation of the hypogastric plexus, by the sacral sympathetic efferent fibers from the second, third, and fourth sacral nerves, and by a few filaments from the first two sacral ganglia. At the points of junction of these nerves, small ganglia are found. From these plexuses, numerous branches are distributed to the viscera of the pelvis. They accompany the branches of the hypogastric artery. The middle hemorrhoidal plexus, plexus hemorrhoidal medius, arises from the upper part of the pelvic plexus. It supplies the rectum and joins the branches of the superior hemorrhoidal plexus. The vesical plexus, plexus vesicalis, arises from the forepart of the pelvic plexus. 
The nerves composing it are numerous and contain a large proportion of spinal nerve fibers. They accompany the vesicle arteries and are distributed to the sides and fundus of the bladder. Numerous filaments also pass to the vesiculae seminales and ductus deferentes. Those accompanying the ductus deferens join on the spermatic cord with branches from the spermatic plexus. The prostatic plexus, plexus prostaticus, is continued from the lower part of the pelvic plexus. The nerves composing it are of large size. They are distributed to the prostate vesiculae and the corpora cavernosa of the penis and urethra. The nerves supplying the corpora cavernosa consist of two sets, the lesser and greater cavernous nerves, which arise from the forepart of the prostatic plexus and, after joining with branches from the pudendal nerve, pass forward beneath the pubic arch. The lesser cavernous nerves, cavernosae penis minoris, small cavernous nerves, perforate the fibrous covering of the penis near its root. The greater cavernous nerve, cavernosus penis major, large cavernous plexus, passes forward along the dorsum of the penis, joins with the dorsal nerve of the penis, and is distributed to the corpora cavernosa. The vaginal plexus arises from the lower part of the pelvic plexus. It is distributed to the walls of the vagina, to the erectile tissue of the vestibule, and to the clitoris. The nerves composing this plexus contain, like the vesicle, a large proportion of spinal nerve fibers. The uterine plexus accompanies the uterine artery to the side of the uterus, between the layers of the broad ligament. It communicates with the ovarian plexus. The organs of the senses and the common integument. The organs of the senses may be divided into a those of the special senses of taste, smell, sight, and hearing, and b those associated with the general sensations of heat, cold, pain, pressure, etc. 1. The peripheral organs of the special senses. a. The organs of taste. Organon gustus. The peripheral gustatory or taste organs consist of certain modified epithelial cells arranged in flask-shaped groups termed gustatory calliculi, taste buds, which are found on the tongue and adjacent parts. They occupy nests in the stratified ephilium and are present in large numbers on the sides of the papillae valeti and to a less extent on their opposed walls. They are also found on the fungiform papillae over the back part and sides of the tongue and in the general epithelial covering of the same areas. They are very plentiful over the fimbri lingui and are also present on the under surface of the soft palate and on the posterior surface of the epiglottis. Structure Each taste bud is flask-like in shape, its broad base resting on the corium, and its neck opening by an orifice, the gustatory pore, between the cells of the epithelium. The bud is formed by two kinds of cells, supporting cells and gustatory cells. The supporting cells are mostly arranged like the staves of a cask and form an outer envelope for the bud. Some, however, are found in the interior of the bud between the gustatory cells. The gustatory cells occupy the central portion of the bud. They are spindle-shaped, and each possesses a large spherical nucleus near the middle of the cell. The peripheral end of the cell terminates at the gustatory pore in a fine hair-like filament, the gustatory hair. The central process passes toward the deep extremity of the bud and there ends in single or brufricated varicosities. The nerve fibrils, after losing their medullary sheaths, enter the taste bud and end in fine extremities between the gustatory cells. Other nerve fibrils ramify between the supporting cells and terminate in fine extremities. These, however, are believed to be the nerves of ordinary sensation and not gustatory. Nerves of taste. The corda tympani nerve, 
derived from the sensory root of the facial, is the nerve of taste for the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. The nerve for the posterior third is the glossopharyngeal. The organ of smell. Organon olfactorius, the nose. The peripheral olfactory organ or organ of smell consists of two parts, an outer, the external nose, which projects from the center of the face, and an internal, the nasal cavity, which is divided by a septum into right and left nasal chambers. The external nose, nasus externus, outer nose. The external nose is pyramidal in form, and its upper angle or root is connected directly with the forehead. Its free angle is termed the apex. Its base is perforated by two elliptical orifices, the nares, separated from each other by an anteroposterior septum, the columna. The margins of the nares are provided with a number of stiff hairs, or vibrissae, which arrest the passage of foreign substances carried with the current of air intended for respiration. The lateral surfaces of the nose form, by their union in the middle line, the dorsum nasi, the direction of which varies considerably in different individuals. The upper part of the dorsum is supported by the nasal bones and is named the bridge. The lateral surface ends below in a rounded eminence, the ala nasi. Structure. The framework of the external nose is composed of bones and cartilages. It is covered by the integument and lined by mucous membrane. The bony framework occupies the upper part of the organ. It consists of the nasal bones and the frontal processes of the maxillae. The cartilaginous framework, cartilaginous nasi, consists of five large pieces, namely the cartilage of the septum, the two lateral and the two greater alar cartilages, and several smaller pieces, the lesser alar cartilages. The various cartilages are connected to each other and to the bones by a tough fibrous membrane. The cartilage of the septum, cartilago septi nasi, is somewhat quadrilateral in form, thicker at its margins than at its center, and completes the separation between the nasal cavities in front. Its anterior margin, thickest above, is connected with the nasal bones and is continuous with the anterior margins of the lateral cartilages. Below it is connected to the medial crura of the greater alar cartilages by fibrous tissue. Its posterior margin is connected with the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid, its inferior margin with the vomer and the palatine processes of the maxillae. It may be prolonged backward, especially in children, as a narrow process, the sphenoidal process, for some distance between the vomer and the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid. The septal cartilage does not reach as far as the lowest part of the nasal septum. This is formed by the medial crura of the greater alar cartilages and by the skin. It is freely movable and hence is termed the septum mobile nasi. The lateral cartilage, cartilago nasi lateralis, upper lateral cartilage, is situated below the inferior margin of the nasal bone and is flattened and triangular in shape. Its anterior margin is thicker than the posterior and is continuous above with the cartilage of the septum, but separated from it below by a narrow fissure. Its superior margin is attached to the nasal bone and the frontal process of the maxilla. Its inferior margin is connected by fibrous tissue with the greater alar cartilage. The greater alar cartilage, cartilago alaris major, lower lateral cartilage, is a thin, flexible plate situated immediately below the preceding and bent upon itself in such a manner as to form the medial and lateral walls of the narus of its own side. The portion which forms the medial wall, crus mediali, is loosely connected with the corresponding portion of the opposite cartilage, the two forming, together with the thickened integument and subadjacent tissue, the septum mobile nasi. The part which forms the lateral wall, crus laterali, is curved to correspond with the ala of the nose. It is oval and flattened, narrow behind, where it is connected with the frontal process of the maxilla by a tough fibrous membrane in which are found three or four small cartilaginous plates, the lesser alar cartilages, cartilaginous alaris minoris, sesamoid cartilages. Above it is connected by fibrous tissue to the lateral cartilage and front part of the cartilage of the septum. Below it falls short of the margin of the nares, the ala being completed by fatty and fibrous tissue covered by skin. In front, the greater alar cartilages are separated by a notch which corresponds with the apex of the nose.
The muscles acting on the external nose have been described in the section on myology. The integument of the dorsum and sides of the nose is thin and loosely connected with the subjacent parts, but over the tip and aile it is thicker and more firmly adherent, and is furnished with a larger number of sebaceous follicles, the orifices of which are usually very distinct. The arteries of the external nose are the alar and septal branches of the external maxillary, which supply the ailey and septum, the dorsum and sides being supplied from the dorsal nasal branch of the ophthalmic and the infraorbital branch of the internal maxillary. The veins end in the anterior facial and ophthalmic veins. The nerves for the muscles of the nose are derived from the facial, while the skin receives branches from the infratrochlear and nasociliary branches of the ophthalmic and from the infraorbital of the maxillary. The nasal cavity, cavum nasi, nasal fossa. The nasal chambers are situated one on either side of the median plane. They open in front through the nares and communicate behind through the coenae with the nasal part of the pharynx. The nares are somewhat pear-shaped apertures, each measuring about 2.5 centimeters anteroposteriorly and 1.25 centimeters transversely at its widest part. The coenae are two oval openings, each measuring 2.5 centimeters in the vertical and 1.25 centimeters in the transverse direction in a well-developed adult skull. For the description of the bony boundaries of the nasal cavity, see pages 194 and 195. Inside the aperture of the nostril is a slight dilation, the vestibule, bounded laterally by the ala and lateral crus of the greater alar cartilage, and medially by the medial crus of the same cartilage. It is lined by skin containing hairs and sebaceous glands, and extends as a small recess toward the apex of the nose. Each nasal cavity, above and behind the vestibule, is divided into two parts, an olfactory region consisting of the superior nasal concha and the opposed part of the septum, and a respiratory region which comprises the rest of the cavity. Lateral wall. On the lateral wall are the superior, middle, and inferior nasal conchae, and below and lateral to each concha is the corresponding nasal passage, or meatus. Above the superior concha is a narrow recess, the sphenoesmoidal recess, into which the sphenoidal sinus opens. The superior meatus is a short oblique passage extending about halfway along the upper border of the middle concha. The posterior ethmoidal cells open into the front part of this meatus. The middle meatus is below and lateral to the middle concha, and is continued anteriorly into a shallow depression, situated above the vestibule and named the atrium of the middle meatus. On raising or removing the middle concha, the lateral wall of this meatus is fully displayed. On it is a rounded elevation, the bulla esmoidalis, and below and in front of this a curved cleft, the hiatus semilinaris. The bulla ethmoidalis is caused by the bulging of the middle ethmoidal cells which open on or immediately above it, and the size of the bulla varies with that of its contained cells. The hiatus semilunaris is bounded inferiorly by the sharp concave margin of the uncinate process of the ethmoid bone, and leads into a curved channel, the infundibulum, bounded above by the bulla ethmoidalis, and below by the lateral surface of the uncinate process of the ethmoid. The anterior ethmoidal cells open into the front part of the infundibulum, and this, in slightly over 50% of subjects, is directly continuous with the frontonasal duct or passage leading from the frontal air sinus. But when the anterior end of the uncinate process fuses with the front part of the bulla, this continuity is interrupted, and the frontonasal duct then opens directly into the anterior end of the middle meatus. Below the bulla ethmoidalis, and partly hidden by the inferior end of the uncinate process, is the ostium maxillare, or opening from the maxillary sinus. In a frontal section, this opening is seen to be placed near the roof of the sinus. An accessory opening from the sinus is frequently present below the posterior end of the middle nasal concha. The inferior meatus is below and lateral to the inferior nasal concha. The nasolacrimal duct opens into this meatus under cover of the anterior part of the inferior concha. Medial wall. The medial wall or septum is frequently more or less deflected from the median plane, thus lessening the size of one nasal cavity and increasing that of the other, 
ridges or spurs of bone growing into one or other cavity from the septum are also sometimes present. Immediately over the incisive canal at the lower edge of the cartilage of the septum, a depression, the nasopalatine recess, is seen. In the septum close to this recess, a minute orifice may be discerned. It leads backward into a blind pouch, the rudimentary vomeronasal organ of Jacobson, which is supported by a strip of cartilage, the vomeronasal cartilage. This organ is well developed in many of the lower animals, where it apparently plays a part in the sense of smell, since it is supplied by twigs of the olfactory nerve and lined by epithelium similar to that in the olfactory region of the nose. The roof of the nasal cavity is narrow from side to side, except at its posterior part, and may be divided from behind forward into sphenoidal, ethmoidal, and frontonasal parts after the bones which form it. The floor is concave from side to side and almost horizontal antero posteriorly. Its anterior three fourths are formed by the palatine process of the maxilla, its posterior fourth by the horizontal process of the palatine bone. In its antero medial part, directly over the incisive foramen, a small depression, the nasopalatine recess, is sometimes seen. It points downward and forward and occupies the position of a canal which connected the nasal with the buccal cavity in early fetal life. The mucous membrane, membrana mucosa nasi. The nasal mucous membrane lines the nasal cavities and is intimately adherent to the periosteum or perichondrium. It is continuous with the skin through the nares and with the mucous membrane of the nasal part of the pharynx through the coenae. From the nasal cavity, its continuity with the conjunctiva may be traced through the nasolacrimal and lacrimal ducts, and with the frontal, ethmoidal, sphenoidal, and maxillary sinuses through the several openings in the meatuses. The mucous membrane is thickest and most vascular over the nasal conchi. It is also thick over the septum, but it is very thin in the meatuses on the floor of the nasal cavities and in the various sinuses. Owing to the thickness of the greater part of this membrane, the nasal cavities are much narrower and the middle and inferior nasal conchi appear larger and more prominent than in the skeleton. Also, the various apertures communicating with the meatuses are considerably narrowed. Structure of the mucous membrane The epithelium covering the mucous membrane differs in its character according to the functions of the part of the nose in which it is found. In the respiratory region it is columnar and ciliated. Interspersed among the columnar cells are goblet or mucin cells, while between their bases are found similar pyramidal cells. Beneath the epithelium and its basement membrane is a fibrous layer infiltrated with lymph corpuscles, so as to form in many parts a diffuse adenoid tissue, and under this a nearly continuous layer of small and larger glands, some mucus and some serous, the ducts of which open upon the surface. In the olfactory region, the mucous membrane is yellowish in color, and the epithelial cells are columnar and nonciliated. They are of two kinds, supporting cells and olfactory cells. The supporting cells contain oval nuclei, which are situated in the deeper parts of the cells and constitute the zone of oval nuclei. The superficial part of each cell is columnar and contains granules of yellow pigment, while its deep part is prolonged as a delicate process which ramifies and communicates with similar processes from neighboring cells so as to form a network in the mucous membrane. Lying between the deep processes of the supporting cells are a number of bipolar nerve cells, the olfactory cells, each consisting of a small amount of granular protoplasm with a large spherical nucleus, and possessing two processes, a superficial one which runs between the columnar epithelial cells and projects on the surface of the mucous membrane as a fine hair-like process, the olfactory hair, the other or deep process runs inward, is frequently beaded, and is continued as the axon of an olfactory nerve fiber. Beneath the epithelium and extending through the thickness of the mucous membrane is a layer of tubular, often branched glands, the glands of Bowman, identical in structure with serous glands. The epithelial cells of the nose, fauces, and respiratory passages play an important part in the maintenance of an equable temperature by the moisture with which they keep the surface always slightly lubricated. Vessels and Nerves The arteries of the nasal cavities are the anterior and posterior ethmoidal branches of the ophthalmic, 
which supply the ethmoidal cells, frontal sinuses, and roof of the nose. The sphenopalatine branch of the inferior maxillary, which supplies the mucous membrane covering the conchi, the meatuses, and septum, the septal branch of the superior labial of the external maxillary, the infraorbital, and alveolar branches of the internal maxillary, which supply the lining membrane of the maxillary sinus, and the pharyngeal branch of the same artery, distributed to the sphenoidal sinus. The ramifications of these vessels form a close plexiform network beneath and in the substance of the mucous membrane. The veins form a close cavernous plexus beneath the mucous membrane. This plexus is especially well marked over the lower part of the septum and over the middle and inferior conchi. Some of the veins open into the sphenopalatine vein, others join the anterior facial vein, some accompany the ethmoidal arteries and end in the ophthalmic veins, and lastly, a few communicate with the veins on the orbital surface of the frontal lobe of the brain through the foramina in the cribiform plate of the ethmoid bone. When the foramen cecum is patent, it transmits a vein to the superior sagittal sinus. The lymphatics have already been described. Page 695. The nerves of ordinary sensation are the nasociliary branch of the ophthalmic, filaments from the anterior alveolar branch of the maxillary, the nerve of the pterygoid canal, the nasopalatine, the anterior palatine, and nasal branches of the sphenopalatine ganglion. The nasociliary branch of the ophthalmic distributes filaments to the forepart of the septum and lateral wall of the nasal cavity. Filaments from the anterior alveolar nerve supply the inferior meatus and inferior concha. The nerve of the pterygoid canal supplies the upper and back part of the septum and superior concha, and the upper nasal branches from the sphenopalatine ganglion have a similar distribution. The nasopalatine nerve supplies the middle of the septum. The anterior palatine nerve supplies the lower nasal branches to the middle and inferior conchi. The olfactory, the special nerve of the sense of smell, is distributed to the olfactory region. Its fibers arise from the bipolar olfactory cells and are destitute of medullary sheaths. They unite in fasciculi, which form a plexus beneath the mucous membrane, and then ascend in grooves or canals in the ethmoid bone. They pass into the skull through the foramina in the cribiform plate of the ethmoid and enter the undersurface of the olfactory bulb, in which they ramify and form synapses with the dendrites of the mitral cells. The Accessory Sinuses of the Nose Sinus Paranasales The accessory sinuses, or air cells of the nose, are the frontal, ethmoidal, sphenoidal, and maxillary. They vary in size and form in different individuals and are lined by ciliated mucous membrane directly continuous with that of the nasal cavities. The frontal sinuses, sinus frontalis, situated behind the superciliary arches, are rarely symmetrical, and the septum between them frequently deviates to one or other side of the middle line. Their average measurements are as follows. Height, 3 cm, breadth, 2.5 cm, depth from before backward, 2.5 cm. Each opens into the anterior part of the corresponding middle meatus of the nose through the frontonasal duct, which traverses the anterior part of the labyrinth of the ethmoid. Absent at birth, they are generally fairly well developed between the seventh and eighth years, but only reach their full size after puberty. The ethmoidal air cells, cellulae ethmoidales, consist of numerous thin-walled cavities situated in the ethmoidal labyrinth and completed by the frontal, maxilla, lacrimal, sphenoidal, and palatine. They lie between the upper parts of the nasal cavities and the orbits, and are separated from these cavities by thin, bony laminae. On either side, they are arranged in three groups, anterior, middle, and posterior. The anterior and middle groups open into the middle meatus of the nose, the former by way of the infundibulum, the latter on or above the bulla ethmoidalis. The posterior cells open into the superior meatus under cover of the superior nasal concha. Sometimes one or more opens into the sphenoidal sinus. The ethmoidal cells begin to develop during fetal life. The sphenoidal sinuses, sinus sphenoidales, contained within the body of the sphenoid, vary in size and shape. Owing to the lateral displacement of the intervening septum, they are rarely symmetrical. The following are their average measurements. Vertical height, 2.2 cm, 
transverse breadth 2 cm, antero-posterior depth 2.2 cm. When exceptionally large, they may extend into the roots of the pterygoid processes or great wings and may invade the basilar part of the occipital bone. Each sinus communicates with the sphenoethmoidal recess by means of an aperture in the upper part of its anterior wall. They are present as minute cavities at birth, but their main development takes place after puberty. The maxillary sinus, sinus maxillaris, antrum of hymor. The largest of the accessory sinuses of the nose is a pyramidal cavity in the body of the maxilla. Its base is formed by the lateral wall of the nasal cavity, and its apex extends into the zygomatic process. Its roof or orbital wall is frequently ridged by the infraorbital canal, while its floor is formed by the alveolar process and is usually one half to ten millimeters below the level of the floor of the nose. Projecting into the floor are several conical elevations corresponding with the roots of the first and second molar teeth, and in some cases the floor is perforated by one or more of these roots. The size of the sinus varies in different skulls and even on the two sides of the same skull. The adult capacity varies from 9.5 cubic centimeters to 20 cubic centimeters, average about 14.75 cubic centimeters. The following measurements are those of an average size sinus. Vertical height opposite the first molar tooth, 3.75 centimeters. Transverse breadth, 2.5 centimeters. Antero-posterior depth, 3 centimeters. In the antero-superior part of its base, is an opening through which it communicates with the lower part of the hiatus semilunaris. A second orifice is frequently seen in or immediately behind the hiatus. The maxillary sinus appears as a shallow groove on the medial surface of the bone about the fourth month of fetal life, but does not reach its full size until after the second dentition. Footnote. The various measurements of the accessory sinuses of the nose are based on those given by Aldrin Turner in his accessory sinuses of the nose. End of footnote. At birth, it measures about 7 millimeters in the dorsoventral direction, and at 20 months, about 20 millimeters. The organ of sight. Organon visus, the eye. The bulb of the eye, bulbus oculi, eyeball, or organ of sight, is contained in the cavity of the orbit, where it is protected from injury and moved by the ocular muscles. Associated with it are certain accessory structures, these are the muscles, fascia, eyebrows, eyelids, conjunctiva, and lacrimal apparatus. The bulb of the eye is embedded in the fat of the orbit, but is separated from it by a thin membranous sac, the fascia bulbi. It is composed of segments of two spheres of different sizes. The anterior segment is one of a small sphere. It is transparent and forms about one-sixth of the bulb. It is more prominent than the posterior segment which is one of a larger sphere, and is opaque, and forms about five-sixths of the bulb. The term anterior pole is applied to the central point of the anterior curvature of the bulb, and that of posterior pole to the central point of its posterior curvature. A line joining the two poles forms the optic axis. The axes of the two bulbs are nearly parallel, and therefore do not correspond to the axes of the orbits, which are directed forward and lateralward. The optic nerves follow the direction of the axes of the orbits, and are therefore not parallel. Each enters its eyeball three millimeters to the nasal side, and a little below the level of the posterior pole. The bulb measures rather more in its transverse and antero-posterior diameters than in its vertical diameter, the former amounting to about 24 millimeters, the latter to about 23.5 millimeters. In the female, all three diameters are rather less than in the male. Its antero-posterior diameter at birth is about 17.5 millimeters, and at puberty, from 20 to 21 millimeters. Development. The eyes begin to develop as a pair of diverticula from the lateral aspects of the forebrain. These diverticula make their appearance before the closure of the anterior end of the neural tube. After the closure of the tube, they are known as the optic vesicles. They project toward the sides of the head, and the peripheral part of each expands to form a hollow bulb, while the proximal part remains narrow and constitutes the optic stalk. The ectoderm overlying the bulb becomes thickened, invaginated, and finally severed from the ectodermal covering of the head 
as a vesicle of cells, the lens vesicle, which constitutes the rudiment of the crystalline lens. The outer wall of the bulb becomes thickened and invaginated, and the bulb is thus converted into a cup, the optic cup, consisting of two strata of cells. These two strata are continuous with each other at the cup margin, which ultimately overlaps the front of the lens and reaches as far forward as the future aperture of the pupil. The invagination is not limited to the outer wall of the bulb, but involves also its postero inferior surface and extends in the form of a groove for some distance along the optic stalk, so that, for a time, a gap or fissure, the choroidal fissure, exists in the lower part of the cup. Through the groove and fissure the mesoderm extends into the optic stalk and cup, and in this mesoderm a blood vessel is developed. During the seventh week the groove and fissure are closed, and the vessel forms the central artery of the retina. Sometimes the choroidal fissure persists, and when this occurs the choroid and iris in the region of the fissure remain undeveloped, giving rise to the condition known as coloboma of the choroid or iris. The retina is developed from the optic cup. The outer stratum of the cup persists as a single layer of cells, which assume a columnar shape, acquire pigment, and form the pigmented layer of the retina. The pigment first appears in the cells near the edge of the cup. The cells of the inner stratum proliferate and form a layer of considerable thickness from which the nervous elements and the sustentacular fibers of the retina, together with a portion of the vitreous body, are developed. And that portion of the cup which overlaps the lens, the inner stratum is not differentiated into nervous elements, but forms a layer of columnar cells which is applied to the pigmented layer, and these two strata form the pars ciliaris and pars iridica retinae. The cells of the inner, or retinal layer, of the optic cup become differentiated into spongioblasts and germinal cells, and the latter, by their subdivisions, give rise to neuroblasts. From the spongioblasts, the sustentacular fibers of Mueller, the outer and inner limiting membranes, together with the groundwork of the molecular layers of the retina, are formed. The neuroblasts become arranged to form the ganglionic and nuclear layers. The layer of rods and cones is first developed in the central part of the optic cup, and from there gradually extends toward the cup margin. All the layers of the retina are completed by the eighth month of fetal life. The optic stalk is converted into the optic nerve by the obliteration of its cavity and the growth of nerve fibers into it. Most of these fibers are centripetal and grow backward into the optic stalk from the nerve cells of the retina, but a few extend in the opposite direction and are derived from nerve cells in the brain. The fibers of the optic nerve receive their medullary sheaths about the tenth week after birth. The optic chiasma is formed by the meeting and partial decussation of the fibers of the two optic nerves. Behind the chiasma the fibers grow backward as the optic tracts to the thalami and midbrain. The crystalline lens is developed from the lens vesicle, which recedes within the margin of the cup, and becomes separated from the overlying ectoderm by mesoderm. The cells forming the posterior wall of the vesicle lengthen and are converted into the lens fibers, which grow forward and fill up the cavity of the vesicle. The cells forming the anterior wall retain their cellular character and form the epithelium on the anterior surface of the adult lens. By the second month, the lens is invested by a vascular mesodermal capsule, the capsula vasculosa lentis. The blood vessels supplying the posterior part of this capsule are derived from the hyaloid artery, those for the anterior part from the anterior ciliary arteries. The portion of the capsule which covers the front of the lens is named the pupillary membrane. By the sixth month, all the vessels of the capsule are atrophied, except the hyaloid artery, which disappears during the ninth month. The position of this artery is indicated in the adult by the hyaloid canal, which reaches from the optic disc to the posterior surface of the lens. With the loss of its blood vessels, the capsula vasculosa lentis disappears, but sometimes the pupillary membrane persists at birth, giving rise to the condition termed congenital atresia of the pupil. The vitreous body is developed between the lens and the optic cup. The lens rudiment and the optic vesicles are at first in contact with each other, 
but after the closure of the lens vesicle and the formation of the optic cup, the former withdraws itself from the retinal layer of the cup. The two, however, remain connected by a network of delicate protoplasmic processes. This network, derived partly from the cells of the lens and partly from those of the retinal layer of the cup, constitutes the primitive vitreous body. At first these protoplasmic processes spring from the whole of the retinal layer of the cup, but later are limited to the ciliary region, where, by a process of condensation, they appear to form the zona ciliaris. The mesoderm, which enters the cup through the choroidal fissure and around the equator of the lens, becomes intimately united with this reticular tissue, and contributes to form the vitreous body, which is therefore derived partly from the ectoderm and partly from the mesoderm. The anterior chamber of the eye appears as a cleft in the mesoderm, separating the lens from the overlying ectoderm. The layer of mesoderm in front of the cleft forms the substantia propria of the cornea, that behind the cleft, the stroma of the iris and the pupillary membrane. The fibers of the ciliary muscle are derived from the mesoderm, but those of the sphincter and dilatator pupillae are of ectodermal origin, being developed from the cells of the pupillary part of the optic cup. The sclera and choroid are derived from the mesoderm surrounding the optic cup. The eyelids are formed as small cutaneous folds, which, about the middle of the third month, come together and unite in front of the cornea. They remain united until about the end of the sixth month. The lacrimal sac and nasolacrimal duct result from a thickening of the ectoderm in the groove, nasooptic furrow, between the lateral nasal and maxillary processes. This thickening forms a solid cord of cells which sinks into the mesoderm. During the third month, the central cells of the cord break down, and a lumen, the nasolacrimal duct, is established. The lacrimal ducts arise as buds from the upper part of the cord of cells, and secondarily establish openings, puncta lacrimalia, on the margins of the lids. The epithelium of the cornea and conjunctiva, and that which lines the ducts and alveoli of the lacrimal gland, are of ectodermal origin, as are also the eyelashes and the lining cells of the glands which open on the lid margins. Tunics of the Eye, Part 1 from without inward, the three tunics are, one, a fibrous tunic, consisting of the sclera behind and the cornea in front, two, a vascular pigmented tunic, comprising, from behind forward, the choroid, ciliary body, and iris, and three, a nervous tunic, the retina. The fibrous tunic, tunica fibrosa oculi. The sclera and cornea form the fibrous tunic of the bulb of the eye. The sclera is opaque, and constitutes the posterior five-sixths of the tunic. The cornea is transparent and forms the anterior sixth. The sclera The sclera has received its name from its extreme density and hardness. It is a firm, unyielding membrane, serving to maintain the form of the bulb. It is much thicker behind than in front. The thickness of its posterior part is one millimeter. Its external surface is of white color, and is in contact with the inner surface of the fascia of the bulb. It is quite smooth, except at the points where the recti and obliquy are inserted into it. Its anterior part is covered by the conjunctival membrane. Its inner surface is brown in color and marked by grooves, in which the ciliary nerves and vessels are lodged. It is separated from the outer surface of the choroid by an extensive lymph space, spatium perichorioideal which is transversed by an exceedingly fine cellular tissue, the lamina supracoroidea. Behind it is pierced by the optic nerve, and is continuous through the fibrous sheath of this nerve with the dura mater. Where the optic nerve passes through the sclera, the latter forms a thin cribriform lamina, the lamina cribrosa sclerae. The minute orifices in this lamina serve for the transmission of the nervous filaments, and the fibrous septa dividing them from one another are continuous with the membranous processes which separate the bundles of nerve fibers. One of these openings, larger than the rest, occupies the center of the lamina. It transmits the central artery and the vein of the retina. Around the entrance of the optic nerve are numerous small apertures for the transmission of the ciliary vessels and nerves, and about midway between this entrance and the scleroconeal junction 
are four or five large apertures for the transmission of veins. Venae vorticosae. In front, the sclera is directly continuous with the cornea, the line of union being termed the sclerocorneal junction. In the inner part of the sclera, close to this junction, is a circular canal, the sinus venosus sclerae, canal of Schlem. In a meridional section of this region, this sinus presents the appearance of a cleft, the outer wall of which consists of the firm tissue of the sclera, while its inner wall is formed by a triangular mass of trabecular tissue. The apex of the mass is directed forward and is continuous with the posterior elastic lamina of the cornea. The sinus is lined by endothelium and communicates externally with the anterior ciliary veins. The aqueous humor drains into the scleral sinuses by passage through the pectinate villi, which are analogous in structure and function to the arachnoid villi of the cerebral meninges. Structure The sclera is formed of white fibrous tissue intermixed with fine elastic fibers. Flattened connective tissue corpuscles, some of which are pigmented, are contained in cell spaces between the fibers. The fibers are aggregated into bundles, which are arranged chiefly in a longitudinal direction. Its vessels are not numerous, the capillaries being of small size, uniting at long and wide intervals. Its nerves are derived from the ciliary nerves, but their exact mode of ending is not known. The cornea. The cornea is the projecting transparent part of the external tunic, and forms the anterior sixth of the surface of the bulb. It is almost circular in outline, occasionally a little broader in the transverse than in the vertical direction. It is convex anteriorly and projects like a dome in front of the sclera. Its degree of curvature varies in different individuals, and in the same individual at different periods of life, being more pronounced in youth than in advanced life. The cornea is dense and of uniform thickness throughout. Its posterior surface is perfectly circular in outline and exceeds the anterior surface slightly in diameter. Immediately in front of the sclerocorneal junction, the cornea bulges inward as a thickened rim, and behind this there is a distinct furrow between the attachment of the iris and the sclerocorneal junction. This furrow has been named by Arthur Thompson. The sulcus circularis corneae. It is bounded externally by the trabecular tissue already described as forming the inner wall of the sinus venosus sclerae. Between this tissue and the anterior surface of the attached margin of the iris is an angular recess, named the iridial angle or filtration angle of the eye. Immediately outside the filtration angle is a projecting rim of scleral tissue which appears in a meridional section as a small triangular area, termed a scleral spur. Its base is continuous with the inner surface of the sclera immediately to the outer side of the filtration angle, and its apex is directed forward and inward. To the anterior sloping margin of this spur are attached the bundles of trabecular tissue just referred to. From its posterior margin, the meridional fibers of the ciliaris muscle arise. Structure The cornea consists from before backward of four layers, viz. 1. The corneal epithelium continuous with that of the conjunctiva, 2. The substantia propria, 3. The posterior elastic lamina, and 4. The endothelium of the anterior chamber. The corneal epithelium, epithelium cornei anterior layer, covers the front of the cornea and consists of several layers of cells. The cells of the deepest layer are columnar, then follow two or three layers of polyhedral cells, the majority of which are prickle cells similar to those found in the stratum mucosum of the cuticle. Lastly, there are three or four layers of squamous cells with flattened nuclei. The substantia propria is fibrous, tough, unyielding, and perfectly transparent. It is composed of about 60 flattened lamellae, superimposed one on another. These lamellae are made up of bundles of modified connective tissue, the fibers of which are directly continuous with those of the sclera. The fibers of each lamella are for the most part parallel with one another, but at right angles to those of adjacent lamellae. Fibers, however, frequently pass from one lamella to the next. The lamellae are connected with each other by an interstitial cement substance, in which are spaces, the corneal spaces. These are stellate in shape, and communicate with one another by numerous offsets. Each contains a cell, the corneal corpuscle, resembling in form the space in which it is lodged, but not entirely filling it.
The layer immediately beneath the corneal epithelium presents certain characteristics which have led some anatomists to regard it as a distinct membrane, and it has been named the anterior elastic lamina. Lamina elastica anterior, anterior limiting layer, Bowman's membrane. It differs, however, from the posterior elastic lamina in presenting evidence of fibrillar structure, and in not having the same tendency to curl inward or to undergo fracture, when detached from the other layers of the cornea. It consists of extremely closely interwoven fibrils, similar to those found in the substantia propria, but contains no corneal corpuscles. It may be regarded as a condensed part of the substantia propria. The posterior elastic lamina, lamina elastica posterior, membrane of descamet, membrane of demors, covers the posterior surface of the substantia propria, and is an elastic, transparent, homogeneous membrane of extreme thinness which is not rendered opaque by either water, alcohol, or acids. When stripped from the substantia propria, it curls up, or rolls upon itself with the attached surface innermost. At the margin of the cornea, the posterior elastic lamina breaks up into fibers which form the trabecular tissue already described. The spaces between the trabeculi are termed the spaces of the angles of the iris, spaces of Fontana. They communicate with the sinus venosus scleri and with the anterior chamber at the filtration angle. Some of the fibers of this trabecular tissue are continued into the substance of the iris, forming the pectinate ligament of the iris, while others are connected with the forepart of the sclera and choroid. The endothelium of the anterior chamber, endothelium cameri anterioris, posterior layer, corneal endothelium, covers the posterior surface of the elastic lamina, is reflected onto the front of the iris, and also lines the spaces of the angle of the iris. It consists of a single stratum of polygonal flattened nucleated cells. Vessels and nerves. The cornea is a non-vascular structure. The capillary vessels ending in loops at its circumference are derived from the anterior ciliary arteries. Lymphatic vessels have not yet been demonstrated in it, but are represented by the channels in which the bundles of nerves run. These channels are lined by an endothelium. The nerves are numerous and are derived from the ciliary nerves. Around the periphery of the cornea they form an annular plexus, from which fibers enter the substantia propria. They lose their medullary sheaths and ramify throughout its substance in a delicate network, and their terminal filaments form a firm and closer plexus on the surface of the cornea proper, beneath the epithelium. This is termed the subepithelial plexus, and from it fibrils are given off which ramify between the epithelial cells, forming an intraepithelial plexus. The vascular tunic, tunica vasculosa oculi. The vascular tunic of the eye is formed from behind forward by the choroid, the ciliary body, and the iris. The choroid invests the posterior five-sixths of the bulb and extends as far forward as the aura serrata of the retina. The ciliary body connects the choroid to the circumference of the iris. The iris is a circular diaphragm behind the cornea and presents near its center a rounded aperture, the pupil. The choroid, choroidea. The choroid is a thin, highly vascular membrane of a dark brown or chocolate color, investing the posterior five-sixths of the globe. It is pierced behind by the optic nerve, and in this situation is firmly adherent to the sclera. It is thicker behind than in front. Its outer surface is loosely connected by the lamina supracorioidea with the sclera. Its inner surface is attached to the pigmented layer of the retina. Structure The choroid consists mainly of a dense capillary plexus, and of small arteries and veins carrying blood to and returning it from this plexus. On its external surface is a thin membrane, the lamina supracorioidea, composed of delicate non-vascular lamellae, each lamella consisting of a network of fine elastic fibers along which are branched pigment cells. The spaces between the lamellae are lined by endothelium and open freely into the perichoroidal lymph space, which, in its turn, communicates with the periscleral space by the perforations in the sclera through which the vessels and nerves are transmitted. Internal to this lamina is the choroid proper, consisting of two layers, an outer, composed of small arteries and veins, with pigment cells interspersed between them, and an inner, consisting of a capillary plexus. The outer layer, lamina vasculosa, 
consists in part of the larger branches of the short ciliary arteries which run forward between the veins, before they bend inward to end in the capillaries, but is formed principally of veins, named from their arrangement the venae vorticosi. They converge to four or five equidistant trunks, which pierce the sclera about midway between the sclerocorneal junction and the entrance of the optic nerve. Interspersed between the vessels are dark, star-shaped pigment cells, the processes of which, communicating with those of neighboring cells, form a delicate network or stroma, which toward the inner surface of the choroid loses its pigmentary character. The inner layer, lamina choriocapillaris, consists of an exceedingly fine capillary plexus, formed by the short ciliary vessels. The network is closer and finer in the posterior than in the anterior part of the choroid. About 1.25 centimeters behind the cornea, its meshes become larger and are continuous with those of the ciliary processes. These two laminae are connected by a stratum intermedium consisting of fine elastic fibers. On the inner surface of the lamina choriocapillaris is a very thin, structureless, or faintly fibrous membrane called the lamina basalis. It is closely connected with the stroma of the choroid and separates it from the pigmentary layer of the retina. One of the functions of the choroid is to provide nutrition for the retina and to convey vessels and nerves to the ciliary body and iris. Tapetum. This name is applied to the outer and posterior part of the choroid, which in many animals presents an iridescent appearance. The ciliary body. Corpus ciliari. The ciliary body comprises the orbicular ciliaris, the ciliary processes, and the ciliaris muscle. The orbiculus ciliaris is a zone of about 4 mm in width, directly continuous with the anterior part of the choroid. It presents numerous ridges arranged in a radial manner. The ciliary processes, processus ciliaris, are formed by the inward folding of the various layers of the choroid, i.e. the choroid proper and the lamina basalis, and are received between corresponding foldings of the suspensory ligament of the lens. They are arranged in a circle and form a sort of frill behind the iris, around the margin of the lens. They vary from 60 to 80 in number, lie side by side, and may be divided into large and small. The former are about 2.5 mm in length, and the latter, consisting of about one-third of the entire number, are situated in spaces between them, but without regular arrangement. They are attached by their periphery to three or four of the ridges of the orbiculus ciliaris, and are continuous with the layers of the choroid. Their opposite extremities are free and rounded, and are directed toward the posterior chamber of the eyeball and circumference of the lens. In front, they are continuous with the periphery of the iris. Their posterior surfaces are connected with the suspensory ligament of the lens. Structure The ciliary processes are similar in structure to the choroid, but the vessels are larger and have chiefly a longitudinal direction. Their posterior surfaces are covered by a bilaminal layer of black pigment cells, which is continued forward from the retina, and is named the pars ciliaris retinae. In the stroma of the ciliary processes there are also stellate pigment cells, but these are not so numerous as in the choroid itself. According to Henderson, the aqueous humor is a secretion formed by the active intervention of the epithelial cells lining the apices of the ciliary processes. Tunics of the eye Part 2. The ciliaris muscle, musculus ciliaris, Bowman's muscle, consists of unstriped fibers. It forms a grayish, semi-transparent circular band about 3 mm broad on the outer surface of the forepart of the choroid. It is thickest in front and consists of two sets of fibers, meridional and circular. The meridional fibers, much the more numerous, arise from the posterior margin of the scleral spur. They run backward and are attached to the ciliary processes and orbiculus ciliaris. One bundle, according to Waldeyer, is inserted into the sclera. The circular fibers are internal to the meridional ones and in a meridional section appear as a triangular zone behind the filtration angle and close to the circumference of the iris. They are well developed in hypermetropic but are rudimentary or absent in myopic eyes. The ciliaris muscle is the chief agent in accommodation, i.e. in adjusting the eye to the vision of near objects. When it contracts, it draws forward the ciliary processes, relaxes the suspensory ligament of the lens, and thus allows the lens to become more convex. The iris 
The iris has received its name from its various colors in different individuals. It is a thin, circular, contractile disc, suspended in the aqueous humor between the cornea and the lens, and perforated a little to the nasal side of its center by a circular aperture, the pupil. By its periphery it is continuous with the ciliary body, and is also connected with the posterior elastic lamina of the cornea by means of the pectinate ligament. Its surfaces are flattened and look forward and backward, the anterior toward the cornea, the posterior toward the ciliary processes and lens. The iris divides the space between the lens and the cornea into an anterior and a posterior chamber. The anterior chamber of the eye is bounded in front by the posterior surface of the cornea, behind by the front of the iris and the central part of the lens. The posterior chamber is a narrow chink behind the peripheral part of the iris and in front of the suspensory ligament of the lens and the ciliary processes. In the adult, the two chambers communicate through the pupil, but in the fetus up to the seventh month, they are separated by the membrana pupillaris. Structure the iris is composed of the following structures. 1. In front is a layer of flattened endothelial cells placed on a delicate hyaline basement membrane. This layer is continuous with the endothelium covering the posterior elastic lamina of the cornea, and in individuals with dark colored irides, the cells contain pigment granules. 2. The stroma, stroma iridis, of the iris contains a fibers and cells. The former are made up of delicate bundles of fibrous tissue. A few fibers at the circumference of the iris have a circular direction, but the majority radiate toward the pupil, forming by their interlacement delicate meshes in which the vessels and nerves are contained. Interspersed between the bundles of connective tissue are numerous branched cells with fine processes. In dark eyes, many of them contain pigment granules, but in blue eyes and the eyes of albinos they are unpigmented. 3. The muscular fibers are involuntary and consist of circular and radiating fibers. The circular fibers form the sphincter pupillae. They are arranged in a narrow band about 1 mm in width which surrounds the margin of the pupil toward the posterior surface of the iris. Those near the free margin are closely aggregated. Those near the periphery of the band are somewhat separated and form incomplete circles. The radiating fibers form the dilator pupillae. They converge from the circumference toward the center and blend with the circular fibers near the margin of the pupil. 4. The posterior surface of the iris is of a deep purple tint, being covered by two layers of pigmented columnar epithelium, continuous at the periphery of the iris with the pars ciliaris retinae. This pigmented epithelium is named the pars iridica retinae, or, from the resemblance of its color to that of a ripe grape, the uvea. The color of the iris is produced by the reflection of light from dark pigment cells underlying a translucent tissue and is therefore determined by the amount of the pigment and its distribution throughout the texture of the iris. The number and situation of the pigment cells differ in different irides. The albino pigment is absent. In the various shades of the blue eyes, the pigment cells are confined to the posterior surface of the iris, whereas in gray, brown and black eyes, Pigment is found also in the cells of the stroma and in those of the endothelium on the front of the iris. The iris may be absent, either in part or altogether as a congenital condition, and in some instances the pupillary membrane may remain persistent, though it is rarely complete. Again, the iris may be the seat of a malformation, termed coloboma, which consists in a deficiency or cleft, clearly due in great number of cases to an arrest in development. In these cases, the cleft is found at the lower aspect, extending directly downward from the pupil, and the gap frequently extends through the choroid to the porous opticus. In some rarer cases, the gap is found in other parts of the iris, and is not then associated with any deficiency of the choroid. Vessels and Nerves The arteries of the iris are derived from the long and anterior ciliary arteries, and from the vessels of the ciliary processes. Each of the two long ciliary arteries, having reached the attached margin of the iris, divides into an upper and lower branch. These anastomoses with corresponding branches from the opposite side, and thus encircle the iris. Into this vascular circle, circulus arteriosus major, 
The anterior ciliary arteries pour their blood and from it vessels converge to the free margin of the iris and there communicate and form a second circle, circulus arteriosus minor. The nerves of the choroid and iris are the long and short ciliary, the former being branches of the nasociliary nerve, the latter of the ciliary ganglion. They pierce the sclera around the entrance of the optic nerve, run forward in the perichoroidal space, and supply the blood vessels of the choroid. After reaching the iris, they form a plexus around its attached margin. From this are derived non-medulated fibers which end in the sphincter and dilator pupillae. Their exact mode of termination has not been ascertained. Other fibers from the plexus end in a network on the anterior surface of the iris. The fibers derived through the motor root of the ciliary ganglion from the oculomotor nerve supply the sphincter, while those derived from the sympathetic supply the dilator. Membrana pupillaris In the fetus, the pupil is closed by a delicate vascular membrane, the membrana pupillaris, which divides the space in which the iris is suspended into two distinct chambers. The vessels of this membrane are partly derived from those of the margin of the iris and partly from those of the capsule of the lens. They have a looped arrangement and converge towards each other without anastomosing. About the sixth month the membrane begins to disappear by absorption from the center towards the circumference and at birth only a few fragments are present. In exceptional cases, it persists. The retina, tunica interna. The retina is a delicate nervous membrane upon which the images of external objects are received. Its outer surface is in contact with the choroid, its inner with the hyaloid membrane of the vitreous body. Behind, it is continuous with the optic nerve. It gradually diminishes in thickness from behind forward and extends nearly as far as the ciliary body, where it appears to end in a jagged margin, the aura serrata. Here the nervous tissues of the retina end, but a thin prolongation of the membrane extends forward over the back of the ciliary processes and iris, forming the pars ciliaris retinae, and pars iridica retinae already referred to. This forward prolongation consists of the pigmentary layer of the retina together with the stratum of columnar epithelium. The retina is soft, semi-transparent and of a purple tint in the fresh state, owing to the presence of a colouring material named rhodopsin or visual purple, but it soon becomes clouded, opaque and bleached when exposed to sunlight. Exactly in the centre of the posterior part of the retina, corresponding to the axis of the eye and at a point in which the sense of vision is most perfect, is an oval yellowish area, the macula lutea. In the macula is a central depression the fovea centralis. At the fovea centralis the retina is exceedingly thin and the dark color of the choroid is distinctly seen through it. About three millimeters to the nasal side of the macula lutei is the entrance of the optic nerve, optic disc, the circumference of which is slightly raised to form an eminence, colliculus nervi optici. The arteria centralis retinae pierces the center of the disc. This is the only part of the surface of the retina which is insensitive to light, and it is termed the blind spot. Structure The retina consists of an outer pigmented layer and an inner nervous stratum or retina proper. The pigmented layer consists of a single stratum of cells. When viewed from the outer surface, these cells are smooth and hexagonal in shape. When seen in section, each cell consists of an outer non-pigmented part containing a large oval nucleus and an inner pigmented portion which extends as a series of straight thread-like processes between the rods, this being especially the case when the eye is exposed to light. In the eyes of albinos, the cells of this layer are destitute of pigment. Retina proper The nervous structures of the retina proper are supported by a series of non-nervous or sustentacular fibers, and, when examined microscopically by means of sections made perpendicularly to the surface of the retina, are found to consist of seven layers, named from within outward as follows. 1. Stratum opticum. 2. Ganglionic layer. 3. Inner plexiform layer. 4. Inner nuclear layer or layer of inner granules. 5. Outer plexiform layer. 6. Outer nuclear layer or layer of outer granules. 7. Layer of rods and cones. 1. The stratum opticum or layer of nerve fibers is formed by the expansion of the fibers of the optic nerve. 
it is thickest near the porous opticus, gradually diminishing toward the aura serrata. As the nerve fibers pass through the lamina cribrosa scleri, they lose their medullary sheaths and are continued onward through the choroid and retina as simple axis cylinders. When they reach the internal surface of the retina, they radiate from their point of entrance over this surface grouped in bundles, and in many places arranged in plexuses. Most of the fibers are centripetal, and are the direct continuations of the axis cylinder processes of the cells of the ganglionic layer, but a few of them are centrifugal and ramify in the inner plexiform and inner nuclear layers, where they end in enlarged extremities. 2. The ganglionic layer consists of a single layer of large ganglion cells, except in the macula lutea, where there are several strata. The cells are somewhat flask-shaped, the rounded internal surface of each resting on the stratum opticum, and sending off an axon which is prolonged into it. From the opposite end, numerous dendrites extend into the inner plexiform layer, where they branch and form flattened arborizations at different levels. The ganglion cells vary much in size, and the dendrites of the smaller ones, as a rule, arborize in the inner plexiform layer as soon as they enter it, while those of the larger cells ramify close to the inner nuclear layer. 3. The inner plexiform layer is made up of a dense reticulum of minute fibrils formed by the interlacement of the dendrites of the ganglion cells with those of the cells of the inner nuclear layer. Within this reticulum, a few branched spongioblasts are sometimes embedded. 4. The inner nuclear layer, or layer of inner granules, is made up of a number of closely packed cells, of which there are three varieties, viz. bipolar cells, horizontal cells, and amacrine cells. The bipolar cells, by far the most numerous, are round or oval in shape, and each is prolonged into an inner and an outer process. They are divisible into rod bipolars and cone bipolars, the inner processes of the rod bipolars run through the inner plexiform layer and arborize around the bodies of the cells of the ganglionic layer. Their outer processes end in the outer plexiform layer in tufts of fibrils around the button-like ends of the inner processes of the rod granules. The inner processes of the cone bipolars ramify in the inner plexiform layer in contact with the dendrites of the ganglionic cells. The horizontal cells lie in the outer part of the inner nuclear layer and possess somewhat flattened cell bodies. Their dendrites divide into numerous branches in the outer plexiform layer, while their axons run horizontally for some distance and finally ramify in the same layer. The amacrine cells are placed in the inner part of the inner nuclear layer, and are so named because they have not yet been shown to possess axis cylinder processes. Their dendrites undergo extensive ramification in the inner plexiform layer. 5. The outer plexiform layer is much thinner than the inner, but like it, consists of a dense network of minute fibrils derived from the processes of the horizontal cells of the preceding layer, and the outer processes of the rod and cone bipolar granules, which ramify in it, forming arborizations around the enlarged ends of the rod fibers and with the branched foot plates of the cone fibers. 6. The outer nuclear layer, or layer of outer granules, like the inner nuclear layer, consists of several strata of oval nuclear bodies. They are of two kinds, viz. rod and cone granules, so named on account of their being respectively connected with the rods and cones of the next layer. The rod granules are much the more numerous, and are placed at different levels throughout the layer. Their nuclei present a peculiar cross-striped appearance, and prolonged from either extremity of each cell is a fine process. The outer process is continuous, with a single rod of the layer of rods and cones, the inner ends in the outer plexiform layer in an enlarged extremity, and is embedded in the tuft into which the outer processes of the rod bipolar cells break up. In its course it presents numerous varicosities. The cone granules, fewer in number than the rod granules, are placed close to the membrana limitans externa, through which they are continuous with the cones of the layer of rods and cones. They do not present any cross striation, but contain a piriform nucleus, which almost completely fills the cell. From the inner extremity of the granule, a thick process passes into the outer plexiform layer, and there expands into a pyramidal enlargement or foot plate, from which are given off numerous fine fibrils that come in contact with the outer processes of the cone bipolars. 7. The layer of rods and cones, Jacob's membrane. 
The elements composing this layer are of two kinds, rods and cones, the former being much more numerous than the latter except in the macula lutea. The rods are cylindrical, of nearly uniform thickness, and are arranged perpendicularly to the surface. Each rod consists of two segments, an outer and inner, of about equal lengths. The segments differ from each other as regards refraction and in their behavior towards coloring reagents, but is colored yellowish-brown by osmic acid. The outer segment is marked by transverse strii, and tends to break up into a number of thin discs superimposed on one another. It also exhibits faint longitudinal markings. The deeper part of the inner segment is indistinctly granular. Its more superficial part presents a longitudinal striation, being composed of fine, bright, highly refracting fibrils. The visual purple, or rhodopsin, is found only in the outer segments. The cones are conical or flask-shaped, their broad ends resting upon the membrana limitans externa, the narrow pointed extremity being turned to the choroid. Like the rods, each is made up of two segments, outer and inner. The outer segment is a short conical process, which, like the outer segment of the rod, exhibits transverse strii. The inner segment resembles the inner segment of the rods in structure, presenting a superficial striated and deep granular part, but differs from it in size and shape, being bulged out laterally and flask-shaped. The chemical and optical characters of the two portions are identical with those of the rods. Supporting Framework of the Retina The nervous layers of the retina are connected together by a supporting framework, formed by the sustentacular fibers of Muller. These fibers pass through all the nervous layers except that of the rods and cones. Each begins on the inner surface of the retina by an expanded, often forked base, which sometimes contains a spheroidal body staining deeply with hematoxylin, the edges of the bases of adjoining fibers being united to form the membrana limitans interna. As the fibers pass through the nerve fiber and ganglionic layers, they give off a few lateral branches. In the inner nuclear layer, they give off numerous lateral processes for the support of the bipolar cells, while in the outer nuclear layer they form a network around the rod and cone fibrils, and unite to form the membrana limitans externa at the bases of the rods and cones. At the level of the inner nuclear layer, each sustentacular fiber contains a clear oval nucleus. Macula lutea and fovea centralis In the macula lutea, the nerve fibers are wanting as a continuous layer. The ganglionic layer consists of several strata of cells. There are no rods but only cones, which are longer and narrower than in other parts, and in the outer nuclear layer there are only cone granules, the processes of which are very long and arranged in curved lines. In the fovea centralis, the only parts present are 1. the cones, 2. the outer nuclear layer, the cone fibers of which are almost horizontal in direction, 3. an exceedingly thin inner plexiform layer. The pigmented layer is thicker and its pigment more pronounced than elsewhere. The color of the macula seems to imbue all the layers except that of the rods and cones. It is of a richer yellow, deepest toward the center of the macula, and does not appear to be due to pigment cells, but simply to a staining of the constituent parts. At the aura serrata, the nervous layers of the retina end abruptly, and the retina is continued onward as a single layer of columnar cells covered by the pigmented layer. This double layer is known as the pars ciliaris retinae, and can be traced forward from the ciliary processes onto the back of the iris, where it is termed the pars iridica retinae, or uvea. The arteria centralis retinae and its accompanying vein pierce the optic nerve and enter the bulb of the eye through the porous opticus. The artery immediately bifurcates into an upper and a lower branch, and each of these again divides into a medial or nasal and a lateral or temporal branch, which at first run between the hyaloid membrane and the nervous layer, but they soon enter the latter and pass forward, dividing dichotomously. From these branches a minute capillary plexus is given off, which does not extend beyond the inner nuclear layer. The macula receives two small branches, superior and inferior macular arteries, from the temporal branches and small twigs directly from the central artery. These do not, however, reach as far as the fovea centralis, which has no blood vessels. The branches of the arteria centralis retinae do not anastomose with each other. In other words, they are terminal arteries. In the fetus, a small vessel, the arteria hyaloidea, 
passes forward as a continuation of the arteria centralis retinae through the vitreous humour to the posterior surface of the capsule of the lens. The refracting media. The refracting media are three, viz. aqueous humour, vitreous body, crystalline lens. The aqueous humour, humour aqueous. The aqueous humour fills the anterior and posterior chambers of the eyeball. It is small in quantity, has an alkaline reaction, and consists mainly of water, less than one-fiftieth of its weight being solid matter, chiefly chloride of sodium. The vitreous body, corpus vitreum. The vitreous body forms about four-fifths of the bulb of the eye. It fills the concavity of the retina and is hollowed in front, forming a deep concavity, the hyaloid fossa, for the reception of the lens. It is transparent, of the consistence of thin jelly, and is composed of an albumous fluid enclosed in a delicate transparent membrane, the hyaloid membrane. It has been supposed by Hanover that from its surface numerous thin lamellae are prolonged inward in a radiating matter, forming spaces in which the fluid is contained. In the adult, these lamellae cannot be detected even after careful microscopic examinations in the fresh state. But in preparations hardened in weak chromic acid, it is possible to make out a distinct lamellation at the periphery of the body. In the centre of the vitreous body, running from the entrance of the optic nerve to the posterior surface of the lens, is a canal, the hyaloid canal, filled with lymph and lined by a prolongation of the hyaloid membrane. This canal, in the embryonic vitreous body, convey the arterial hyaloide from the central artery of the retina to the back of the lens. The fluid from the vitreous body is nearly pure water. It contains, however, some salts and a little albumin. The hyaloid membrane envelops the vitreous body. The portion in front of the oris serrata is thickened by the accession of radial fibres and is termed the zonula ciliaris. Sonul of Zin. Here it presents a series of radially arranged furrows in which the ciliary processes are accommodated and to which they adhere, as is shown by the fact that when they are removed some of their pigment remains attached to the zonula. The zonula ciliaris splits into two layers, one of which is thin and lines the hyaloid fossa the other is named the suspensory ligament of the lens. It is thicker and passes over the ciliary body to be attached to the capsule of the lens a short distance in front of its equator. Scattered and delicate fibres are also attached to the region of the equator itself. This ligament retains the lens in position and is relaxed by the contraction of the meridional fibres of the ciliaris muscle so that the lens is allowed to become more convex. Behind the suspensory ligament, there is a saculated canal, the spatiozonolaris canal of Petit, which encircles the equator of the lens. It can be easily inflated through a fine blowpipe inserted under the suspensory ligament. No blood vessels penetrate the vitreous body, so that its nutrition must be carried on by vessels of the retina and the ciliary processes situated upon its exterior. The crystalline lens, lens crystallina, the crystalline lens enclosed in its capsule is situated immediately behind the iris, in front of the vitreous body and encircled by the ciliary processes which slightly overlap its margin. The capsule of the lens, capsula lentis, is a transparent structureless membrane which closely surrounds the lens and is thicker in front than behind. It is brittle but highly elastic, and when ruptured the edges roll up with the outer surface innermost. It rests behind in the hyaloid fossa in the forepart of the vitreous body. In front it is in contact with the free border of the iris, but recedes from it at the circumference, thus forming the posterior chamber of the eye. It is retained in its position chiefly by the suspensory ligament of the lens already described. The lens is a transparent, biconvex body, 
the convexity of its anterior being less than that of its posterior surface. The central points of these surfaces are termed respectively the anterior and posterior poles. A line connecting the poles constitutes the axis of the lens, while the marginal circumference is termed the equator. Structure The lens is made up of soft cortical substance and a firm central part, the nucleus. Faint lines, radii lentis, radiate from the poles to the equator. In the adult there may be six or more of these lines, but in the fetus they are only three in number, and diverge from each other at angles of 120 degrees. On the anterior surface one line ascends vertically, and the other two diverge downward. On the posterior surface one ray descends vertically, and the other two diverge upwards. They correspond with the free edges of an equal number of septa composed of an amorphous substance, which dip into the substance of the lens. When the lens has been hardened, it is seen to consist of a series of concentrically arranged laminae, each of which is interrupted at the septa referred to. Each lamina is built up of a number of hexagonal, ribbon-like lens fibres, the edges of which are more or less serrated, the serrations fitting between those of neighbouring fibres, while the ends of the fibres come into apposition at the septa. The fibres run in a curved manner from the septa on the anterior surface to those on the posterior surface. No fibres pass from pole to pole. They are arranged in such a way that those which begin near the pole on one surface of the lens end near the peripheral extremity of the plane on the other, and vice versa. The fibres of the outer layers of the lens are nucleated, and together form a nuclear layer most distinct towards the equator. The anterior surface of the lens is covered by a layer of transparent columnar nucleated epithelium. At the equator the cells become elongated, and their gradual transition into lens fibres can be traced. In the foetus the lens is nearly spherical, and has a slightly reddish tint. It is soft and breaks down readily on the slightest pressure. A small branch from the arterior centralis retina runs forward, as already mentioned, through the vitreous body to the posterior part of the capsule of the lens, where its branches radiate and form a plexiform network which covers the posterior surface of the capsule, and they are continuous around the margin of the capsule with the vessels of the papillary membrane and with those of the iris. In the adult, the lens is colourless, transparent, firm in texture and devoid of vessels. In old age it becomes flattened on both surfaces, slightly opaque, of an amber tint, and increased in density. Vessels and Nerves The arteries of the bulb of the eye are the long, short and anterior ciliary artery and the arterior centralis retina. They have already been described. The ciliary veins are seen on the outer surface of the choroid and are named, from their arrangement, the vena vorticosi. They converge to four or five equidistant trunks, which pierce the sclera midway between the sclerocorneal junction and the porous opticus. Another set of veins accompanies the anterior ciliary arteries. All of these veins open into the ophthalmic veins. The ciliary nerves are derived from the nasociliary nerve, and from the ciliary ganglion. Accessory Organs of the Eye, Part 1 1C3, The Accessory Organs of the Eye Organa Oculi Accessoria The accessory organs of the eye include the ocular muscles, the fasci, the eyebrows, the eyelids, the conjunctiva, and the lacrimal apparatus. The ocular muscles, musculi oculi, the ocular muscles are the levator palpebri superioris, rectus medialis, rectus superior, rectus lateralis, rectus inferior, obliquus superior, obliquus inferior. The levator palpebri superioris is thin, flat, and triangular in shape. It arises from the under surface of the small wing of the sphenoid 
above and in front of the optic foramen from which it is separated by the origin of the rectus superior. At its origin it is narrow and tendinous, but soon becomes broad and fleshy, and ends anteriorly in a wide aponeurosis which splits into three lamellae. The superficial lamella blends with the upper part of the orbital septum, and is prolonged forward above the superior tarsus to the palpable part of the orbicularis oculi, and to the deep surface of the skin of the upper eyelid. The middle lamella, largely made up of non-striped muscular fibers, is inserted into the upper margin of the superior tarsus, while the deepest lamella blends with an expansion from the sheath of the rectus superior, and with it is attached to the superior fornix of the conjunctiva. Whitnell has pointed out that the upper part of the sheath of the levator palpebrae becomes thickened in front and forms, above the anterior part of the muscle, a transverse ligamentous band which is attached to the sides of the orbital cavity. On the medial side it is mainly fixed to the pulley of the obliquus superior, but some fibers are attached to the bone behind the pulley, and a slip passes forward and bridges over the supraorbital notch. On the lateral side it is fixed to the capsule of a lacrimal gland and to the frontal bone. In front of the transverse ligamentous band, the sheath is continued over the aponeurosis of the levator palpebrae as a thin connective tissue layer, which is fixed to the upper orbital margin immediately behind the attachment of the orbital septum. When the levator palpebrae contracts, the lateral and medial parts of the ligamentous band are stretched and check the action of the muscle. The retraction of the upper eyelid is checked also by the orbital septum coming into contact with the transverse part of the ligamentous band. The four recti arise from a fibrous ring, annulus tendinus communis, which surrounds the upper, medial, and lower margins of the optic foramen and encircles the optic nerve. The ring is completed by a tendinous bridge prolonged over the lower and medial part of the superior orbital fissure and attached to a tubercle on the margin of the great wing of the sphenoid bounding the fissure. Two specialized parts of this fibrous ring may be made out. A lower, the ligament or tendon of zen, which gives origin to the rectus inferior, part of the rectus internus, and the lower head of origin of the rectus lateralis, and an upper, which gives origin to the rectus superior, the rest of the rectus medialis, and the upper head of the rectus lateralis. This upper band is sometimes termed the superior tendon of Lockwood. Each muscle passes forward in the position implied by its name to be inserted by a tendinous expansion into the sclera about six millimeters from the margin of the cornea. Between the two heads of the rectus lateralis is a narrow interval, through which pass the two divisions of the oculomotor nerve, the nasociliary nerve, the abducent nerve, and the ophthalmic vein. Although these muscles present a common origin and are inserted in a similar manner into the sclera, there are certain differences to be observed in them as regards their length and breadth. The rectus medialis is the broadest, the rectus lateralis the longest, and the rectus superior the thinnest and narrowest. The obliquus oculi superior, superior oblique, is a fusiform muscle placed at the upper and medial side of the orbit. It arises immediately above the margin of the optic foramen, above and medial to the origin of the rectus superior, and passing forward ends in a rounded tendon which plays in a fibrocartilaginous ring, or pulley, attached to the trochlear fovea of the frontal bone. The contiguous surfaces of the tendon and ring are lined by a delicate mucous sheath and enclosed in a thin fibrous investment. The tendon is reflected backward, lateralward, and downward beneath the rectus superior to the lateral part of the bulb of the eye and is inserted into the sclera behind the equator of the eyeball the insertion of the muscle lying between the rectus superior and rectus lateralis. The obliquus oculi inferior, inferior oblique, 
is a thin, narrow muscle placed near the anterior margin of the floor of the orbit. It arises from the orbital surface of the maxilla, lateral to the lacrimal groove. Passing lateralward, backward and upward, at first between the rectus inferior and the floor of the orbit, and then between the bulb of the eye and the rectus lateralis, it is inserted into the lateral part of the sclera, between the rectus superior and rectus lateralis, near to, but somewhat behind, the insertion of the obliquus superior. Nerves The levator palpebri superioris, obliquus inferior, and the recti superior, inferior, and medialis are supplied by the oculomotor nerve, the obliquus superior by the trochlear nerve, the rectus lateralis by the abducent nerve. Actions The levator palpebri raises the upper eyelid and is the direct antagonist of the orbicularis oculi. The four recti are attached to the bulb of the eye in such a manner that, acting singly, they will turn its corneal surface either upward, downward, medialward, or lateralward, as expressed by their names. The movement produced by the rectus superior or rectus inferior is not quite a simple one, for inasmuch as each passes obliquely lateralward and forward to the bulb of the eye, the elevation or depression of the cornea is accompanied by a certain deviation medialward, with a slight amount of rotation. These latter movements are corrected by the obliquae, the obliquus inferior correcting the medial deviation caused by the rectus superior, and the obliquus superior that caused by the rectus inferior. The contraction of the rectus lateralis or rectus medialis, on the other hand, produces a purely horizontal movement. If any two neighboring recti of one eye act together, they carry the globe of the eye in the diagonal of these directions, viz. upward and medialward, upward and lateralward, downward and medialward, or downward and lateralward. Sometimes the corresponding recti of the two eyes act in unison, and at other times the opposite recti act together. Thus, in turning the eyes to the right, the rectus lateralis of the right eye will act in unison with the rectus medialis of the left eye. But if both eyes are directed to an object in the middle line at a short distance, the two recti mediales will act in unison. The movement of circumduction, as in looking around a room, is performed by the successive actions of the four recti. The obliquae rotate the eyeball on its antero-posterior axis, the superior directing the cornea downward and lateralward, and the inferior directing it upward and lateralward. These movements are required for the correct viewing of an object when the head is moved laterally, as from shoulder to shoulder, in order that the picture may fall in all respects on the same part of the retina of either eye. A layer of non-striped muscle, the orbitalis muscle of H. Mueller, may be seen bridging across the inferior orbital fissure. The fascia bulb, capsule of tenon, is a thin membrane which envelops the bulb of the eye from the optic nerve to the ciliary region, separating it from the orbital fat and forming a socket in which it plays. Its inner surface is smooth and is separated from the outer surface of the sclera by the periscleral lymph space. This lymph space is continuous with the subdural and subarachnoid cavities and is traversed by delicate bands of connective tissue which extend between the fascia and the sclera. The fascia is perforated behind the ciliary vessels and nerves and fuses with the sheath of the optic nerve and with the sclera around the entrance of the optic nerve. In front, it blends with the ocular conjunctiva and with it is attached to the ciliary region of the eyeball. It is perforated by the tendons of the ocular muscles and is reflected backward on each as a tubular sheath. The sheath of the obliquus superior is carried as far as the fibrous pulley of that muscle. That on the obliquus inferior reaches as far as the floor of the orbit to which it gives off a slip. The sheaths on the recti are gradually lost in the paramecium, but they give off important expansions. The expansion from the rectus superior blends with the tendon of the levator palpebrae, 
that of the rectus inferior is attached to the inferior tarsus. The expansions from the sheaths of the recti lateralis and medialis are strong, especially that from the latter muscle, and are attached to the lacrimal and zygomatic bones respectively. As they probably check the actions of these two recti, they have been named the medial and lateral check ligaments. Lockwood has described a thickening of the lower part of the fascia bulbi, which he has named the suspensory ligament of the eye. It is slung like a hammock below the eyeball, being expanded in the center, and narrow at its extremities, which are attached to the zygomatic and lacrimal bones respectively. The orbital fascia forms the periosteum of the orbit. It is loosely connected to the bones and can be readily separated from them. Behind, it is united with the dura mater by processes which pass through the optic foramen and superior orbital fissure, and with the sheath of the optic nerve. In front, it is connected with the periosteum at the margin of the orbit, and sends off a process which assists in forming the orbital septum. From it, two processes are given off. One to enclose the lacrimal gland, the other to hold the pulley of the obliquus superior in position. The eyebrows, supercilia, are two arched eminences of integument, which surmount the upper circumference of the orbits and support numerous short, thick hairs directed obliquely on the surface. The eyebrows consist of thickened integument connected beneath with the orbicularis oculi, corrugator, and frontalis muscles. The eyelids, palpebrae, are two thin movable folds placed in front of the eye, protecting it from injury by their closure. The upper eyelid is the larger and the more movable of the two, and is furnished with an elevator muscle, the levator palpebrae superioris. When the eyelids are open, an elliptical space, the palpebral fissure, rima palpebrarum, the angles of which correspond to the junctions of the upper and lower eyelids, and are called the palpable commissures or canthi. The lateral palpable commissure, commissura palpebrarum lateralis, external canthus, is more acute than the medial, and the eyelids here lie in close contact with the bulb of the eye. But the medial palpable commissure, commissura palpebrarum medialis, internal canthus, is prolonged for a short distance toward the nose, and the two eyelids are separated by a triangular space, the lacus lacrimalis. At the basal angles of the lacus lacrimalis, on the margin of each eyelid, is a small conical elevation, the lacrimal papilla, the apex of which is pierced by a small orifice, the punctum lacrimal, the commencement of the lacrimal duct. The eyelashes, cilia, are attached to the free edges of the eyelid. They are short, thick, curved hairs, arranged in a double or triple row. Those of the upper eyelid, more numerous and longer than those of the lower, curve upward. Those of the lower eyelid curve downward, so that they do not interlace in closing the lids. Near the attachment of the eyelashes are the openings of a number of glands. The ciliary glands, arranged in several rows close to the free margin of the lid, they are regarded as enlarged and modified sudoriferous glands. Accessory Organs of the Eye, Part 2 Structure of the Eyelids The eyelids are composed of the following structures taken in their order from without inward. Integument, areolar tissue, fibers of the orbicularis oculi, tarsus, orbital septum, tarsal glands, and conjunctiva. The upper eyelid has, in addition, the aponeurosis of the levator palpebrae superioris. The integument is extremely thin and continuous at the margins of the eyelids with the conjunctiva. The subcutaneous areolar tissue is very lax and delicate and seldom contains any fat. The palpable fibers of the orbicularis oculi are thin, pale in color, and possess an involuntary action. The tarsi, tarsal plates, are two thin elongated plates of dense connective tissue about 2.5 centimeters in length, 
One is placed in each eyelid and contributes to its form and support. The superior tarsus, tarsus superior, superior tarsal plate, the larger, is of a semi-lunar form about 10 millimeters in breadth at the center and gradually narrowing toward its extremities. To the anterior surface of this plate, the aponeurosis of the levator palpebri superioris is attached. The inferior tarsus, tarsus inferior, inferior tarsal plate, the smaller, is thin, elliptical in form, and has a vertical diameter of about 5 millimeters. The free or ciliary margins of these plates are thick and straight. The attached or orbital margins are connected to the circumference of the orbit by the orbital septum. The lateral angles are attached to the zygomatic bone by the lateral palpable raphe. The medial angles of the two plates end at the lacus lacrimalis and are attached to the frontal process of the maxilla by the medial palpable ligament. The orbital septum, septum orbital palpable ligament, is a membranous sheet attached to the edge of the orbit where it is continuous with the periosteum. In the upper eyelid, it blends by its peripheral circumference with the tendon of the levator palpebri superioris and the superior tarsus, and the lower eyelid with the inferior tarsus. Medially, it is thin, and becoming separated from the medial palpable ligament, is fixed to the lacrimal bone immediately behind the lacrimal sac. The septum is perforated by the vessels and nerves which pass from the orbital cavity to the face and scalp. The eyelids are richly supplied with blood. The tarsal glands, glandulae tarsalis, mybomi, mybomian glands. The tarsal glands are situated upon the inner surfaces of the eyelids between the tarsi and conjunctiva and may be distinctly seen through the latter on everting the eyelids, presenting an appearance like parallel strings of pearls. There are about 30 in the upper eyelid and somewhat fewer in the lower. They are embedded in grooves in the inner surfaces of the tarsi and correspond in length with the breadth of these plates. They are consequently longer in the upper than in the lower eyelid. Their ducts open on the free margins of the lids by minute foramina. Structure the tarsal glands are modified sebaceous glands, each consisting of a single straight tube or follicle with numerous small lateral diverticula. The tubes are supported by a basement membrane and are lined at their mouths by stratified epithelium. The deeper parts of the tubes and the lateral offshoots are lined by a layer of polyhedral cells. The conjunctiva is the mucous membrane of the eye. It lines the inner surfaces of the eyelids or palpebrae and is reflected over the forepart of the sclera and cornea. The palpable portion, tunica conjunctiva palpebrarum, is thick, opaque, highly vascular, and covered with numerous papillae, its deeper part presenting a considerable amount of lymphoid tissue. At the margins of the lids it becomes continuous with the lining membrane of the ducts of the tarsal glands, and through the lacrimal ducts with the lining membrane of the lacrimal sac and nasolacrimal duct. At the lateral angle of the upper eyelid, the ducts of the lacrimal gland open on its free surface, and at the medial angle it forms a semilunar fold, the plica semilunaris. The line of reflection of the conjunctiva from the upper eyelid onto the bulb of the eye is named the superior fornix, and that from the lower lid the inferior fornix. The bulbar portion, tunica conjunctiva bulbi. Upon the sclera the conjunctiva is loosely connected to the bulb of the eye. It is thin, transparent, destitute of papillae, and only slightly vascular. Upon the cornea, the conjunctiva consists only of epithelium, constituting the epithelium of the cornea already described. Lymphatics arise in the conjunctiva in a delicate zone around the cornea and run to the ocular conjunctiva. In and near the fornices, but more plentiful in the upper than in the lower eyelid, a number of convoluted tubular glands open on the surface of the conjunctiva. 
Other glands, analogous to lymphoid follicles, and called by Henley trachoma glands, are found in the conjunctiva, and according to Strohmeyer, are chiefly situated near the medial palpable commissure. They were first described by Brush, in his description of Pyer's patches of the small intestine, as identical structures existing in the under eyelid of the ox. The carunculo lacrimalis is a small, reddish, conical-shaped body situated at the medial palpable commissure and filling up the lacus lacrimalis. It consists of a small island of skin containing sebaceous and sudoriferous glands and is a source of the whitish secretion which constantly collects in this region. A few slender hairs are attached to its surface. Lateral to the caruncula is a slight semilunar fold of conjunctiva, the concavity of which is directed toward the cornea. It is called the plica semilunaris. Mueller found smooth muscular fibers in this fold. In some of the domesticated animals it contains a thin plate of cartilage. The nerves in the conjunctiva are numerous and form rich plexuses. According to Krauss, they terminate in a peculiar form of tactile corpuscle, which he terms terminal bulb. The lacrimal apparatus, apparatus lacrimalis, consists of a, the lacrimal gland, which secretes the tears, and its excretory ducts, which convey the fluid to the surface of the eye, b, the lacrimal ducts, the lacrimal sac, and the nasolacrimal duct, by which the fluid is conveyed into the cavity of the nose. The lacrimal gland, glandula lacrimalis. The lacrimal gland is lodged in the lacrimal fossa, on the medial side of the zygomatic process of the frontal bone. It is of an oval form, about the size and shape of an almond, and consists of two portions, described as the superior and inferior lacrimal glands. The superior lacrimal gland is connected to the periosteum of the orbit by a few fibrous bands and rests upon the tendons of the recti superioris and lateralis, which separate it from the bulb of the eye. The inferior lacrimal gland is separated from the superior by a fibrous septum and projects into the back part of the upper eyelid where its deep surface is related to the conjunctiva. The ducts of the glands, from 6 to 12 in number, run obliquely beneath the conjunctiva for a short distance and open along the upper and lateral half of the superior conjunctival fornix. Structures of the lacrimal gland In structure and general appearance, the lacrimal resembles the serous salivary glands. In the recent state, the cells are so crowded with granules that their limits can hardly be defined. They contain oval nuclei, and the cell protoplasm is finely fibrillated. The lacrimal ducts, ductus lacrimalis, lacrimal canals. The lacrimal ducts, one in each eyelid, commence at minute orifices, termed puncta lacrimalia, on the summits of the papillae lacrimales, seen on the margins of the lids at the lateral extremity of the lacus lacrimalis. The superior duct, the smaller and shorter of the two, at first ascends and then bends at an acute angle and passes medial ward and downward to the lacrimal sac. The inferior duct at first descends and then runs almost horizontally to the lacrimal sac. At the angles they are dilated into ampullae, their walls are dense in structure and their mucous lining is covered by stratified squamous epithelium placed on a basement membrane. Outside the latter is a layer of striped muscle, continuous with the lacrimal part of the orbicularis oculi. At the base of each lacrimal papilla, the muscular fibers are circularly arranged and form a kind of sphincter. The lacrimal sac, saccus lacrimalis. The lacrimal sac is the upper dilated end of the nasolacrimal duct and is lodged in a deep groove formed by the lacrimal bone and frontal process of the maxilla. It is oval in form and measures from 12 to 15 millimeters in length. Its upper end is closed and rounded. Its lower is continued into the nasolacrimal duct. Its superficial surface is covered by a fibrous expansion derived from the medial palpable ligament 
and its deep surface is crossed by the lacrimal part of the obicularis oculi, which is attached to the crest on the lacrimal bone. Structure The lacrimal sac consists of a fibrous elastic coat, lined internally by mucous membrane. The latter is continuous through the lacrimal ducts with the conjunctiva, and through the nasolacrimal duct with the mucous membrane of the nasal cavity. The nasolacrimal duct, ductus nasolacrimalis, nasal duct. The nasolacrimal duct is a membranous canal about 18 millimeters in length, which extends from the lower part of the lacrimal sac to the inferior meatus of the nose, where it ends by a somewhat expanded orifice provided with an imperfect valve, the plica lacrimalis has nary, formed by a fold of the mucous membrane. It is contained in an osseous canal formed by the maxilla, the lacrimal bone, and the inferior nasal concha. It is narrower in the middle than at either end and is directed downward, backward, and a little lateral word. The mucous lining of the lacrimal sac and nasolacrimal duct is covered with columnar epithelium, which in places is ciliated. 1D. The organ of hearing. Organon, auditus, the ear. The ear, or organ of hearing, is divisible into three parts. The external ear, the middle ear, or tympanic cavity, and the internal ear, or labyrinth. The development of the ear. The first rudiment of the internal ear appears shortly after that of the eye, in the form of a patch of thickened ectoderm, the auditory plate, over the region of the hindbrain. The auditory plate becomes depressed and converted into the auditory pit. The mouth of the pit is then closed, and thus a shut sac, the auditory vesicle, is formed. From it, the epithelial lining of the membranous labyrinth is derived. The vesicle becomes pear-shaped, and the neck of the flask is obliterated. From the vesicle, certain diverticula are given off which form the various parts of the membranous labyrinth. One from the middle part forms the ductus and sactus endolymphaticus. Another from the anterior end gradually elongates and, forming a tube coiled on itself, becomes a cochlear duct the vestibular extremity of which is subsequently constricted to form the canalis reunions. Three others appear as disc-like evaginations on the surface of the vesicle. The central parts of the walls of the discs coalesce and disappear, while the peripheral portions persist to form the semicircular ducts. Of these, the superior is the first and the lateral the last to be completed. The central part of the vesicle represents the membranous vestibule, and is subdivided by a constriction into a smaller ventral part, the saccule, and a large dorsal and posterior part, the utricle. This subdivision is effected by a fold which extends deeply into the proximal part of the ductus endolymphaticus, with the result that the utricle and saccule ultimately communicate with each other by means of a Y-shaped canal. The saccule opens into the cochlear duct through the canalis reunions, and the semicircular ducts communicate with the utricle. The mesodermal tissue surrounding the various parts of the epithelial labyrinth is converted into a cartilaginous ear capsule, and this is finally ossified to form the bony labyrinth. Between the cartilaginous capsule and the epithelial structures, it's a stratum of mesodermal tissue which is differentiated into three layers, viz. an outer, forming the periosteal lining of the bony labyrinth, an inner, in direct contact with the epithelial structures, and an intermediate, consisting of gelatinous tissue. By the absorption of this latter tissue, the periolymphatic spaces are developed. The modulus and osseous spiral lamina of the cochlea are not preformed in cartilage, but are ossified directly from connective tissue. The middle ear and auditory tube are developed from the first pharyngeal pouch. The endodermal lining of the dorsal end of this pouch is in contact with the ectoderm of the corresponding pharyngeal groove. By the extension of the mesoderm between these two layers, 
the tympanic membrane is formed. During the sixth or seventh month, the tympanic antrum appears as an upward and backward expansion of the tympanic cavity. With regard to the exact mode of development of the ossicles of the middle ear, there is some difference of opinion. The view generally held is that the malleus is developed from the proximal end of the mandibular Menkel's, cartilage, the incus in the proximal end of the mandibular arch, and that the stapes is formed from the proximal end of the hyoid arch. The malleus, with the exception of its anterior process, is ossified from a single center which appears near the neck of the bone. The anterior process is ossified separately in membrane and joins the main part of the bone about the sixth month of fetal life. The incus is ossified from one center which appears in the upper part of its long crus and ultimately extends into its lenticular process. The stapes first appears as a ring, annulus stapedius, encircling a small vessel, the stapedial artery, which subsequently undergoes atrophy. It is ossified from a single center which appears in its base. The external acoustic meatus is developed from the first bronchial groove. The lower part of this groove extends inward as a funnel-shaped tube, primary meatus, from which the cartilaginous portion and a small part of the roof of the osseous portion of the meatus are developed. From the lower part of the funnel-shaped tube, an epithelial lamina extends downward and inward along the inferior wall of the primitive tympanic cavity. By the splitting of this lamina, the inner part of the meatus, secondary meatus, is produced, while the inner portion of the lamina forms the cutaneous stratum of the tympanic membrane. The auricula, or pinna, is developed by the gradual differentiation of tubercles, which appear around the margin of the first bronchial groove. The rudiment of the acoustic nerve appears about the end of the third week as a group of ganglion cells closely applied to the cephalic edge of the auditory vesicle. Whether these cells are derived from the ectoderm adjoining the auditory vesicle or have migrated from the wall of the neural tube is as yet uncertain. The ganglion gradually split into two parts, the vestibular ganglion and the spiral ganglion. The peripheral branches of the vestibular ganglion pass in two divisions, the pars superior giving rami to the superior ampulla of the superior semicircular duct, to the lateral ampulla and to the utricle, and the pars inferior giving rami to the saccule and to the posterior ampulla. The proximal fibers of the vestibular ganglion form the vestibular nerve. The proximal fibers of the spiral ganglion form the cochlear nerve. The external ear. The external ear consists of the expanded portion named the auricula or pinna and the external acoustic meatus. The former projects from the side of the head and serves to collect the vibrations of the air by which sound is produced. The latter leads inward from the bottom of the auricula and conducts the vibrations to the tympanic cavity. The auricula, or pinna, is of an ovoid form, with its larger end directed upward. Its lateral surface is irregularly concave, directed slightly forward, and presents numerous eminences and depressions to which names have been assigned. The prominent rim of the auricula is called the helix. Where the helix turned downward behind a small tubercle, the auricular tubercle of Darwin is frequently seen. This tubercle is very evident about the sixth month of fetal life when the whole auricula has a close resemblance to that of some of the adult monkeys. Another curved prominence parallel with and in front of the helix is called the antihelix. This divides above into two crura, between which is a triangular depression, the fossa triangularis. The narrow curved depression between the helix and the antihelix is called the scapha. The antihelix describes a curve around a deep capacious cavity, the concha, which is partially divided into two parts by the cruise, or commencement of the helix. 
The upper part is termed the Simpaconchi, the lower part the Kavamconchi. In front of the concha and projecting backward over the meatus is a small pointed eminence, the tragus, so called from its being generally covered on its undersurface with a tuft of hair resembling a goat's beard. Opposite the tragus and separated from it by the intertragic notch is a small tubercle, the antitragus. Below this is the lobule, composed of tough, aurelier, and adipose tissues and wanting the firmness and elasticity of the rest of the auricula. The cranial surface of the auricula presents elevations which correspond to the depressions on its lateral surface and after which they are named. Example, eminentia conchi, eminentia triangularis, etc. Structure. The auricula is composed of a thin plate of yellow fibrocartilage covered with integument and connected to the surrounding parts by ligaments and muscles and to the commencement of the external acoustic meatus by fibrous tissue. The skin is thin, closely adherent to the cartilage and covered with fine hairs furnished with sebaceous glands which are most numerous in the concha and scaphoid fossa. On the tragus and antitragus, the hairs are strong and numerous. The skin of the auricula is continuous with that lining the external acoustic meatus. The cartilage of the auricula, cartilago auriculae, cartilage of the pinna, consists of a single piece. It gives form to this part of the ear and upon its surface are found the eminences and depressions above described. It is absent from the lobule. It is deficient also between the tragus and beginning of the helix, the gap being filled up by dense fibrous tissue. At the front part of the auricula, where the helix bends upward, is a small projection of cartilage called the spina helicus, while in the lower part of the helix, the cartilage is prolonged downward as a tail-like process, the cauda helicus. This is separated from the antihelix by a fissure, the fissura antitrago helicana. The cranial aspect of the cartilage exhibits a transverse furrow, the sulcus antihelicus transversus, which corresponds with the inferior crews of the antihelix and separates the eminentia conchi from the eminentia triangularis. The eminentia conchi is crossed by a vertical ridge, punticulus, which gives attachment to the auricularis posterior muscle. In the cartilage of the auricula are two fissures, one behind the cruz helicus and another in the tragus. The ligaments of the auricula, ligamenti auricularia, valsalva, ligaments of the pinna, consist of two sets. One, extrinsic, connecting it to the side of the head. Two, intrinsic, connecting various parts of its cartilage together. The extrinsic ligaments are two in number anterior and posterior. The anterior ligament extends from the tragus and spina helicus to the root of the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. The posterior ligament passes from the posterior surface of the concha to the outer surface of the mastoid process. The chief intrinsic ligaments are a. a strong fibrous band stretching from the tragus to the commencement of the helix completing the meatus in front and partly encircling the boundary of the concha, and b, a band between the antihelix and the cauda helicus. Other less important bands are found on the cranial surface of the pinna. The muscles of the auricula consist of two sets. One, the extrinsic, which connect it with the skull and scalp and move the auricula as a whole, and two, the intrinsic, which extend from one part of the auricle to another. The extrinsic muscles are the auricularis anterior, superior, and posterior. The auricularis anterior, atrahens aurum, the smallest of the three, is thin, fan-shaped, and its fibers are pale and indistinct. It arises from the lateral edge of the gallia aponeurotica, and its fibers converge to be inserted into a projection on the front of the helix. The auricularis superior, adelens aurum, 
the largest of the three, is thin and fan-shaped. Its fibers arise from the Gallia aperneurotica and converge to be inserted by a thin, flattened tendon into the upper part of the cranial surface of the auricula. The auricularis posterior, ratrahens aurum, consists of two or three fleshy fasciculi which arise from the mastoid portion of the temporal bone by short aponeuretic fibers. They are inserted into the lower part of the cranial surface of the concha. Actions In man, these muscles possess very little action. The auricularis anterior draws the auricula forward and upward. The auricularis superior slightly raises it, and the auricularis posterior draws it backward. The intrinsic muscles are the helicus major, helicus minor, tragicus, antitragicus, transversus auriculi, oblicus auriculi. The helicus major is a narrow vertical band situated upon the anterior margin of the helix. It arises below from the spina helicus and is inserted into the anterior border of the helix just where it is about to curve backward. The helicus minor is an oblique fasciculus covering the cruz helicus. The tragicus is a short, flattened vertical band on the lateral surface of the tragus. The antitragicus arises from the outer part of the antitragus and is inserted into the cauda helicus and antihelix. The transversus auriculi is placed on the cranial surface of the pinna. It consists of scattered fibers, partly tendinous and partly muscular, extending from the eminentia conchi to the prominence corresponding with the scapha. The oblicus auriculi, also on the cranial surface, consists of a few fibers extending from the upper and back part of the concha to the convexity immediately above it. Nerves. The auriculares anterior and superior and the intrinsic muscles on the lateral surface are supplied by the temporal branch of the facial nerve. The auricularis posterior and the intrinsic muscles on the cranial surface by the posterior auricular branch of the same nerve. The arteries of the auricula are the posterior auricular from the external carotid, the anterior auricular from the superficial temporal, and a branch from the occipital artery. The veins accompany the corresponding arteries. The sensory nerves are the great auricular from the cervical plexus, the auricular branch of the vagus, the auriculotemporal branch of the mandibular nerve, and the lesser occipital from the cervical plexus. The external acoustic meatus, meatus acousticus externus, external auditory canal or meatus, extends from the bottom of the concha to the tympanic membrane. It is about 4 centimeters in length if measured from the tragus. From the bottom of the concha, its length is about 2.5 centimeters. It forms an S-shaped curve and is directed at first inward, forward, and slightly upward, pars externa. It then passes inward and backward, pars media, and lastly is carried inward, forward, and slightly downward, pars interna. It is an oval cylindrical canal the greatest diameter being directed downward and backward at the external orifice, but nearly horizontally at the inner end. It presents two constrictions, one near the inner end of the cartilaginous portion and another, the isthmus, in the osseous portion, about two centimeters from the bottom of the concha. The tympanic membrane, which closes the inner end of the meatus, is obliquely directed. In consequence of this, the floor and anterior wall of the meatus are longer than the roof and posterior wall. The external acoustic meatus is formed partly by cartilage and membrane and partly by bone and is lined by skin. The cartilaginous portion, meatus acousticus externus cartilaginous, is about 8 millimeters in length. It is continuous with the cartilage of the auricula and firmly attached to the circumference of the auditory process of the temporal bone. 
The cartilage is deficient at the upper and back part of the meatus, its place being supplied by fibrous membrane. Two or three deep fissures are present in the anterior part of the cartilage. The osseous portion, meatus acousticus externus osseus, is about 16 millimeters in length and is narrower than the cartilaginous portion. It is directed inward and a little forward, forming in its course a slight curve, the convexity of which is upward and backward. Its inner end is smaller than the outer and sloped, the anterior wall projecting beyond the posterior for about four millimeters. It is marked except at its upper part by a narrow groove, the tympanic sulcus, in which the circumference of the tympanic membrane is attached. Its outer end is dilated and rough in the greater part of its circumference for the attachment of the cartilage of the auricula. The front and lower parts of the osseous portion are formed by a curved plate of bone, the tympanic part of the temporal, which in the fetus exists as a separate ring, annulus tympanicus, incomplete at its upper part. The skin lining the meatus is very thin adheres closely to the cartilaginous and osseous portions of the tube and covers the outer surface of the tympanic membrane. After maceration, the thin pouch of epidermis, when withdrawn, preserves the form of the meatus. In the thick subcutaneous tissue of the cartilaginous part of the meatus are numerous ceruminous glands, which secrete the earwax. Their structure resembles that of the sudoriferous glands. Relations of the meatus. In front of the osseous part is the condyle of the mandible, which, however, is frequently separated from the cartilaginous part by a portion of the parotid gland. The movements of the jaw influence to some extent the lumen of this latter portion. Behind the osseous part are the mastoid air cells, separated from the meatus by a thin layer of bone. The arteries supplying the meatus are branches from the posterior auricular, internal maxillary, and temporal. The nerves are chiefly derived from the auriculotemporal branch of the mandibular nerve and the auricular branch of the vagus. 1D.2 The middle ear, or tympanic cavity, cavum tympani, drum, tympanum. The middle ear, or tympanic cavity, is an irregular, laterally compressed space within the temporal bone. It is filled with air, which is conveyed to it from the nasal part of the pharynx through the auditory tube. It contains a chain of movable bones, which connect its lateral to its medial wall, and serve to convey the vibrations communicated to the tympanic membrane across the cavity to the internal ear. The tympanic cavity consists of two parts, the tympanic cavity proper, opposite the tympanic membrane, and the attic, or epitympanic recess, above the level of the membrane. The latter contains the upper half of the malleus and the greater part of the incus. Including the attic, the vertical and anteroposterior diameters of the cavity are each about 15 millimeters. The transverse diameter measures about 6 millimeters above and 4 millimeters below, Opposite the center of the tympanic membrane, it is only about 2 millimeters. The tympanic cavity is bounded laterally by the tympanic membrane, medially by the lateral wall of the internal ear. It communicates behind with the tympanic antrum and through it with the mastoid air cells and in front with the auditory tube. The tegmental wall or roof, parius tegmentalis, is formed by a thin plate of bone, the tegment tympani, which separates the cranial and tympanic cavities. It is situated on the interior surface of the petrous portion of the temporal bone, close to its angle of junction with the squama temporalis. It is prolonged backward so as to roof in the tympanic antrum, and forward to cover in the semi-canal for the tensor tympani muscle. Its lateral edge corresponds with the remains of the petrous squamous suture. The jugular wall or floor, paris jugularis, is narrow and consists of a thin plate of bone, 
fundus tympani, which separates the tympanic cavity from the jugular fossa. It presents, near the labyrinthic wall, a small aperture for the passage of the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve. The membranous or lateral wall, perius membranacea, outer wall, is formed mainly by the tympanic membrane, partly by the ring of bone into which this membrane is inserted. This ring of bone is incomplete at its upper part, forming a notch, notch of riverness, close to which are three small apertures, the ita cordi posterius, the petrotympanic fissure, and the ita cordi anterius. The ita cordi posterius, apertura tympanica canaliculi cordi, is situated in the angle of junction between the mastoid and membranous wall of the tympanic cavity, immediately behind the tympanic membrane, and on a level with the upper end of the manubrium of the malleus. It leads into a minute canal, which descends in front of the canal for the facial nerve, and ends in that canal near the stylomastoid foramen. Through it, the corda tympani nerve enters the tympanic cavity. The petrotympanic fissure, fissura petrotympanica, glacierian fissure, opens just above and in front of the ring of bone into which the tympanic membrane is inserted. In this situation, it is a mere slit about two millimeters in length. It lodges the anterior process and anterior ligament of the malleus and gives passage to the anterior tympanic branch of the internal maxillary artery. The ita cordi anterius, canal of Huggye, is placed at the medial end of the petrotympanic fissure. Through it, the corda tympani nerve leaves the tympanic cavity. The tympanic membrane, membrana tympani, separates the tympanic cavity from the bottom of the external acoustic meatus. It is a thin, semi-transparent membrane, nearly oval in form, somewhat broader above than below, and directed very obliquely downward and inward, so as to form an angle of about 55 degrees with the floor of the meatus. Its longest diameter is downward and forward, and measures from 9 to 10 millimeters. Its shortest diameter measures from 8 to 9 millimeters. The greater part of its circumference is thickened and forms a fibrocartilaginous ring which is fixed in the tympanic sulcus at the inner end of the meatus. This sulcus is deficient superiorly at the notch of rivenous, and from the ends of this notch two bands, the anterior and posterior malleolar folds, are prolonged to the lateral process of the malleus. The small, somewhat triangular part of the membrane situated above these folds is lax and thin, and is named the pars flaccida. In it a small orifice is sometimes seen. The manubrium of the malleus is firmly attached to the medial surface of the membrane as far as its center, which it draws toward the tympanic cavity. The lateral surface of the membrane is thus concave, and the most depressed part of this concavity is named the umbo. Structure The tympanic membrane is composed of three strata, a lateral, cutaneous, an intermediate, fibrous, and a medial, mucus. The cutaneous stratum is derived from the integument lining the meatus. The fibrous stratum consists of two layers, a radiate stratum, the fibers of which diverge from the manubrium of the malleus, and a circular stratum, the fibers of which are plentiful around the circumference, but sparse and scattered near the center of the membrane. Branched or dendritic fibers, as pointed out by Gruber, are also present, especially in the posterior half of the membrane. Vessels and nerves. The arteries of the tympanic membrane are derived from the deep auricular branch of the internal maxillary which ramifies beneath the cutaneous stratum, and from the stylomastoid branch of the posterior auricula and tympanic branch of the internal maxillary, which are distributed on the mucous surface. The superficial veins open into the external jugular. Those on the deep surface drain partly into the transverse sinus and veins of the dura mater, and partly into a plexus on the auditory tube. The membrane receives its chief nerve supply from the auriculotemporal branch of the mandibular, 
the auricular branch of the vagus and the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal also supply it. The labyrinthic or medial wall, peris labyrinthica, inner wall, is vertical in direction and presents for examination the fenestri vestibuli and cochlei, the promontory and the prominence of the facial canal. The fenestra vestibuli, fenestra ovalis, is a reniform opening leading from the tympanic cavity into the vestibule of the internal ear. Its long diameter is horizontal and its convex border is upward. In the recent state it is occupied by the base of the stapes, the circumference of which is fixed by the annual ligament to the margin of the foramen. The fenestra cochlei, fenestra rotunda, is situated below and a little behind the fenestra vestibuli, from which it is separated by a rounded elevation, the promontory. It is placed at the bottom of a funnel-shaped depression, and, in the macerated bone, leads into the cochlea of the internal ear. In the fresh state it is closed by a membrane, the secondary tympanic membrane, which is concave towards the tympanic cavity, convex towards the cochlea. This membrane consists of three layers, an external, or mucus, derived from the mucus lining of the tympanic cavity, an internal, from the lining membrane of the cochlea, and an intermediate, or fibrous layer. The promontory, promontorium, is a rounded hollow prominence formed by the projection outward of the first turn of the cochlea. It is placed between the fenestri, and it is furrowed on its surface by small grooves for the lodgment of branches of the tympanic plexus. A minute spicule of bone frequently connects the promontory to the pyramidal eminence. The prominence of the facial canal, prominentia canalis facialis, prominence of aqueduct of fallopius, indicates the position of the bony canal in which the facial nerve is contained. This canal traverses the labyrinthic wall of the tympanic cavity above the fenestra vestibuli, and behind that opening curves nearly vertically downward along the mastoid wall. The mastoid or posterior wall, parius mastoidea, is wider above than below and presents for examination the entrance to the tympanic antrum, the pyramidal eminence and the fossa incutis. The entrance to the antrum is a large irregular aperture which leads backward from the epitympanic recess into a considerable airspace named the tympanic or mastoid antrum. The antrum communicates behind and below with the mastoid air cells, which vary considerably in number, size, and form. The antrum and mastoid air cells are lined by mucous membrane, continuous with that lining the tympanic cavity. On the medial wall of the entrance to the antrum is a rounded eminence, situated above and behind the prominence of the facial canal. It corresponds with the position of the ampulated ends of the superior and lateral semicircular canals. The pyramidal eminence, eminentia pyramidalis, pyramid, is situated immediately behind the fenestra vestibuli and in front of the vertical portion of the facial canal. It is hollow and contains the stapedius muscle. Its summit projects forward toward the fenestra vestibuli and is pierced by a small aperture which transmits the tendon of the muscle. The cavity in the pyramidal eminence is prolonged downward and backward in front of the facial canal and communicates with it by a minute aperture which transmits a twig from the facial nerve to the stapedius muscle. The fossa incutis is a small depression in the lower and back part of the epitympanic recess. It lodges the short crust of the incus. The carotid, or anterior wall, parius carotica, is wider above than below. It corresponds with a carotid canal, from which it is separated by a thin plate of bone perforated by the tympanic branch of the internal carotid artery, and by the deep petrosal nerve which connects the sympathetic plexus on the internal carotid artery with the tympanic plexus on the promontory. At the upper part of the anterior wall are the orifice of the semicanal for the tensor tympani muscle and the tympanic orifice of the auditory tube, separated from each other by a thin horizontal plate of bone, 
the septum canalis muscular tuberi. These canals run from the tympanic cavity forward and downward to the retiring angle between the squama and the petrous portion of the temporal bone. The semi-canal for the tensor tympani, semi-canalis and tensoris tympani, is the superior and the smaller of the two. It is cylindrical and lies beneath the tegment tympani. It extends on to the labyrinthic wall of the tympanic cavity and ends immediately above the fenestra vestibuli. The septum canalis musculotuberi, processus cochleariformis, passes backward below this semi-canal, forming its lateral wall and floor. It expands above the anterior end of the fenestra vestibuli and terminates there by curving laterally so as to form a pulley over which the tendon of the muscle passes. The auditory tube, tuba auditiva, eustachian tube, is a channel through which the tympanic cavity communicates with the nasal part of the pharynx. Its length is about 36 millimeters, and its direction is downward, forward, and medial wood, forming an angle of about 45 degrees with the sagittal plane and one from 30 to 40 degrees with the horizontal plane. It is formed partly of bone, partly of cartilage and fibrous tissue. The osseous portion, pars osseo tubi auditivi, is about 12 millimeters in length. It begins in the carotid wall of the tympanic cavity below the septum canalis musculo tuberi, and gradually narrowing ends at the angle of junction of the squama and the petrous portion of the temporal bone, its extremity presenting a jagged margin which serves for the attachment of the cartilaginous portion. The cartilaginous portion, pars cartilaginea tubi auditivi, about 24 mm in length, is formed of a triangular plate of elastic fiber cartilage, the apex of which is attached to the margin of the medial end of the osseous portion of the tube, while its base lies directly under the mucous membrane of the nasal part of the pharynx, where it forms an elevation, the torus tuberius, or cushion, behind the pharyngeal orifice of the tube. The upper edge of the cartilage is curled upon itself, being bent laterally so as to present on transverse section the appearance of a hook. A groove or furrow is thus produced, which is open below and laterally, and this part of the canal is completed by a fibrous membrane. The cartilage lies in a groove between the petrous part of the temporal and the great wing of the swenoid. This groove ends opposite the middle of the medial pterygoid plate. The cartilaginous and bony portions of the tube are not in the same plane, the former inclining downward a little more than the latter. The diameter of the tube is not uniform throughout, being greatest at the pharyngeal orifice, least at the junction of the bony and cartilaginous portions, and again increased towards the tympanic cavity. The narrowest part of the tube is termed the isthmus. The position and relations of the pharyngeal orifice are described with the nasal part of the pharynge. The mucous membrane of the tube is continuous in front with that of the nasal part of the pharynx and behind with that of the tympanic cavity. It is covered with ciliated epithelium and is thin in the osseous portion, while in the cartilaginous portion it contains many mucous glands and near the pharyngeal orifice a considerable amount of adenoid tissue, which has been named by Gerlach the tube tonsil. The tube is opened during declutition by the salpingopharynges and dilatator tubi. The latter arises from the hook of the cartilage and from the membranous part of the tube, and blends below with the tensor villi palatini. The auditory ossicles, ossicula auditus. The tympanic cavity contains a chain of three movable ossicles, the malleus, incus, and stapes. The first is attached to the tympanic membrane, the last to the circumference of the fenestra vestibuli the incus being placed between and connected to both by delicate articulations. The malleus, so named from its fancied resemblance to a hammer, consists of a head, neck, and three processes. These are the manubrium, the anterior, and lateral processes. The head, capitulum mallei, is the large upper extremity of the bone. It is oval in shape and articulates posteriorly with the incus, 
being free in the rest of its extent. The facet for articulation with the incus is constricted near the middle, and consists of an upper, larger, and lower, smaller part, which form nearly a right angle with each other. Opposite the constriction, the lower margin of the facet projects in the form of a process, the cog tooth or spur of the malleus. The neck, column mallei, is the narrow contracted part just beneath the head. Below it is a prominence to which the various processes are attached. The manubrium mallei, handle, is connected by its lateral margin with the tympanic membrane. It is directed downward, medialward, and backward. It decreases in size toward its free end, which is curved slightly forward and flattened transversely. On its medial side, near its upper end, is a slight projection, into which the tendon of the tensor tympani is inserted. The anterior process, processus anterior, folii, processus gracilis, is a delicate spicule which springs from the eminence below the neck and is directed forward to the petrotympanic fissure, to which it is connected by ligamentous fibers. In the fetus, this is the longest process of the malleus and is in direct continuity with the cartilage of Meckel. The lateral process, processus lateralis, processus brevis, is a slight conical projection which springs from the root of the manubrium. It is directed laterally and is attached to the upper part of the tympanic membrane and, by means of the anterior and posterior malleolar folds, to the extremities of the notch of rivenous. The incus has received its name from its supposed resemblance to an anvil, but it is more like a premolar tooth with two roots, which differ in length, and are widely separated from each other. It consists of a body and two crura. The body, corpus incutus, is somewhat cubical, but compressed transversely. On its anterior surface is a deeply concavo-convex facet, which articulates with the head of the malleus. The two crura diverge from one another nearly at right angles. The short crus, crus breve, short process, somewhat conical in shape, projects almost horizontally backward and is attached to the fossa incutus in the lower and back part of the epitympanic recess. The long crus, crus longum, long process, descends nearly vertically behind and parallel to the manubrium of the malleus, and bending medialward ends in a rounded projection the lenticular process, which is tipped with cartilage and articulates with the head of the stapes. The stapes, so called from its resemblance to a stirrup, consists of a head, neck, two crura, and a base. The head, capitulum stapetus, presents a depression, which is covered by cartilage and articulates with the lenticular process of the incus. The neck, the constricted part of the bone succeeding the head, gives insertion to the tendon of the stapedius muscle. The two crura, crus anterius and crus posterius, diverge from the neck and are connected at their ends by a flattened oval plate, the base, basis stapetus, which forms the foot plate of the stirrup and is fixed to the margin of the fenestra vestibuli by a ring of ligamentous fibers. Of the two crura, the anterior is shorter and less curved than the posterior. Articulations of the auditory ossicles, articulationes ossiculorum auditus. The incudomalleolar joint is a saddle-shaped diarthrosis. It is surrounded by an articular capsule, and the joint cavity is incompletely divided into two by a wedge-shaped articular disc or meniscus. The incudostapedial joint is an inarthrosis, surrounded by an articular capsule. Some observers have described an articular disc or meniscus in this joint. Others regard the joint as a syndesmosis. Ligaments of the ossicles Ligamenta Ossiculorum Auditus. The ossicles are connected with the walls of the tympanic cavity by ligaments, three for the malleus, and one each for the incus and stapes. The anterior ligament of the malleus, ligamentum mallei anterius, is attached by one end to the neck of the malleus, just above the anterior process, and by the other to the anterior wall of the tympanic cavity, close to the petrotympanic fissure, some of its fibers being prolonged through the fissure to reach the spina angularis of the sphenoid. The superior ligament of the malleus, ligamentum mallei superius, 
is a delicate, round bundle which descends from the roof of the epitympanic recess to the head of the malleus. The lateral ligament of the malleus, ligamentum mallei laterali, external ligament of the malleus, is a triangular band passing from the posterior part of the notch of rivenous to the head of the malleus. Helmholtz described the anterior ligament and the posterior part of the lateral ligament as forming together the axis ligament around which the malleus rotates. The posterior ligament of the incus, ligamentum incutus posterius, is a short, thick band connecting the end of the short crust of the incus to the fossa incutus. A superior ligament of the incus, ligamentum incutus superius, has been described, but it is little more than a fold of mucous membrane. The vestibular surface and the circumference of the base of the stapes are covered with hyaline cartilage. That encircling the base is attached to the margin of the fenestra vestibuli by a fibrous ring, the annular ligament of the base of the stapes, ligamentum annulari basios stapetus. The muscles of the tympanic cavity, musculi osiculorum auditus, are the tensor tympani and stapedius. The tensor tympani, the larger, is contained in the bony canal above the osseous portion of the auditory tube, from which it is separated by the septum canalis musculotubarii. It arises from the cartilaginous portion of the auditory tube and the adjoining part of the great wing of the sphenoid, as well as from the osseous canal in which it is contained. Passing backward through the canal, it ends in a slender tendon which enters the tympanic cavity, makes a sharp bend around the extremity of the septum, and is inserted into the manubrium of the malleus, near its root. It is supplied by a branch of the mandibular nerve through the otic ganglion. The stapedius arises from the wall of a conical cavity, hollowed out of the interior of the pyramidal eminence. Its tendon emerges from the orifice at the apex of the eminence, and, passing forward, is inserted into the posterior surface of the neck of the stapes. It is supplied by a branch of the facial nerve. Actions. The tensor tympani draws the tympanic membrane medialward, and thus increases its tension. The stapedius pulls the head of the stapes backward, and thus causes the base of the bone to rotate on a vertical axis drawn through its own center. The back part of the base is pressed inward toward the vestibule, while the forepart is withdrawn from it. By the action of the muscle, the tension of the fluid within the internal ear is probably increased. The mucous membrane of the tympanic cavity is continuous with that of the pharynx through the auditory tube. It invests the auditory ossicles and the muscles and nerves contained in the tympanic cavity, forms the medial layer of the tympanic membrane, and the lateral layer of the secondary tympanic membrane, and is reflected into the tympanic antrum and mastoid cells, which it lines throughout. It forms several vascular folds, which extend from the walls of the tympanic cavity of the ossicles. Of these, one descends from the root of the cavity to the head of the malleus and upper margin of the body of the incus. A second invests the stapedius muscle, other folds invest the corda tympani nerve and the tensor tympani muscle. These folds separate off pouch-like cavities and give the interior of the tympanum a somewhat honeycombed appearance. One of these pouches, the pouch of prosac, is well marked and lies between the neck of the malleus and the membrana flaccida. Two other recesses may be mentioned. They are formed by the mucous membrane which envelops the corda tympani nerve and are situated one in front of, and the other behind, the manubrium of the malleus. They are named the anterior and posterior recesses of Trolch. In the tympanic cavity, this membrane is pale, thin, slightly vascular, and covered, for the most part, with columnar ciliated epithelium. But over the pyramidal eminence, ossicles, and tympanic membrane, it possesses a flattened, non-ciliated epithelium. In the tympanic antrum and mastoid cells, its epithelium is also non-ciliated. In the osseous portion of the auditory tube, the membrane is thin, but in the cartilaginous portion, it is very thick, highly vascular, and provided with numerous mucous glands. The epithelium which lines the tube is columnar and ciliated. Vessels and Nerves The arteries are six in number. Two of them are larger than the others. 
These are the tympanic branch of the internal maxillary, which supplies the tympanic membrane, and the stylomastoid branch of the posterior auricular, which supplies the back part of the tympanic cavity and mastoid cells. The smaller arteries are the petrosal branch of the middle meningeal, which enters through the hiatus of the facial canal, a branch from the ascending pharyngeal, and another from the artery of the pterygoid canal, which accompany the auditory tube, and the tympanic branch from the internal carotid, given off in the carotid canal and perforating the thin anterior wall of the tympanic cavity. The veins terminate in the pterygoid plexus and the superior petrosal sinus. The nerves constitute the tympanic plexus, which ramifies upon the surface of the promontory. The plexus is formed by 1. The tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal 2. The carotico-tympanic nerves 3. The smaller superficial petrosal nerve and 4. A branch which joins the greater superficial petrosal. The tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal, Jacobson's nerve, enters the tympanic cavity by an aperture in its floor close to the labyrinthic wall, and divides into branches which ramify on the promontory and enter into the formation of the tympanic plexus. The superior and inferior carotico-tympanic nerves from the carotid plexus of the sympathetic pass through the wall of the carotid canal, and join the branches of the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal. The branch to the greater superficial petrosal passes through an opening on the labyrinthic wall, in front of the fenestra vestibuli. The smaller, superficial petrosal nerve, from the otic ganglion, passes backward through a foramen in the middle fossil of the base of the skull, sometimes through the foramen ovale and enters the anterior surface of the petrous part of the temporal bone through a small aperture, situated lateral to the hiatus of the facial canal. It courses downward through the bone, past the genicular ganglion of the facial nerve, receiving a connecting filament from it, and enters the tympanic cavity, where it communicates with the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal, and assists in forming the tympanic plexus. The branches of distribution of the tympanic plexus are supplied to the mucous membrane of the tympanic cavity. A branch passes to the fenestra vestibuli, another to the fenestra cochleae, and a third to the auditory tube. The smaller superficial petrosal may be looked upon as the continuation of the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal through the plexus to the otic ganglion. In addition to the tympanic plexus, there are the nerves supplying the muscles. The tensor tympani is supplied by a branch from the mandibular through the otic ganglion, and the stapedius by a branch from the facial. The corda tympani nerve crosses the tympanic cavity. It is given off from the sensory part of the facial, about six millimeters before the nerve emerges from the stylomastoid foramen. It runs from below upward and forward in a canal, and enters the tympanic cavity through the iter cordi posterius and becomes invested with mucous membrane. It traverses the tympanic cavity, crossing medial to the tympanic membrane and over the upper part of the manubrium of the malleus to the carotid wall, where it emerges through the iter cordi anterius, canal of UGA. The Internal Ear or Labyrinth, Part 1 1D4, The Internal Ear or Labyrinth, Oris Interna The internal ear is the essential part of the organ of hearing, receiving the ultimate distribution of the auditory nerve. It is called the labyrinth from the complexity of its shape, and consists of two parts. The osseous labyrinth, a series of cavities within the petrous part of the temporal bone, and the membranous labyrinth, a series of communicating membranous sacs and ducts contained within the bony cavities. The osseous labyrinth, labyrinthus osseus. The osseous labyrinth consists of three parts, the vestibule, semicircular canals, and cochlea. These are cavities hollowed out of the substance of the bone and lined by periosteum. They contain a clear fluid, the perilymph, in which the membranous labyrinth is situated. The vestibule, vestibulum. The vestibule is the central part of the osseous labyrinth and is situated medial to the tympanic cavity, behind the cochlea and in front of the semicircular canals. It is somewhat ovoid in shape, but flattened transversely. 
It measures about five millimeters from before backward, and the same from above downward, and about three millimeters across. In its lateral or tympanic wall is the fenestra vestibuli, closed in the fresh state by the base of the stapes and annular ligament. On the medial wall, at the forepart, is a small circular depression, the recessus sphericus, which is perforated, at its anterior and inferior part, by several minute holes, macula cribrosa media, for the passage of filaments of the acoustic nerve to the saccule, and behind this depression is an oblique ridge, the crista vestibuli, the anterior end of which is named the pyramid of the vestibule. This ridge bifurcates below to enclose a small depression, the fossa cochlearis, which is perforated by a number of holes for the passage of filaments of the acoustic nerve which supply the vestibular end of the ductus cochlearis. At the hinder part of the medial wall is the orifice of the aqueductus vestibuli, which extends to the posterior surface of the petrous portion of the temporal bone. It transmits a small vein and contains a tubular prolongation of the membranous labyrinth, the ductus endolymphaticus, which ends in a cul-de-sac between the layers of the dura mater within the cranial cavity. On the upper wall or roof is a transversely oval depression, the recessus ellipticus, separated from the recessus sphericus by the crista vestibuli already mentioned. The pyramid and adjoining part of the recessus ellipticus are perforated by a number of holes, macula cribrosa superior. The apertures in the pyramid transmit the nerves to the utricle, those in the recessus ellipticus the nerves to the ampullae of the superior and lateral semicircular ducts. Behind are the five orifices of the semicircular canals. In front is an elliptical opening, which communicates with the skull of vestibuli of the cochlea. The bony semicircular canals, canales semicircularis ossei. The bony semicircular canals are three in number, superior, posterior, and lateral, and are situated above and behind the vestibule. They are unequal in length, compressed from side to side, and each describes the greater part of a circle. Each measures about 0.8 mm in diameter, and presents a dilation at one end, called the ampulla, which measures more than twice the diameter of the tube. They open into the vestibule by five orifices, one of the apertures being common to two of the canals. The superior semicircular canal, canalis semicircularis superior, 15 to 20 mm in length, is vertical in direction, and is placed transversely to the long axis of the petrous portion of the temporal bone, on the anterior surface of which its arch forms a round projection. It describes about two-thirds of a circle. Its lateral extremity is ampullated and opens into the upper part of the vestibule. The opposite end joins with the upper part of the posterior canal to form the crus commune, which opens into the upper and medial part of the vestibule. The posterior semicircular canal Canalis semicircularis posterior, also vertical, is directed backward, nearly parallel to the posterior surface of the petrous bone. It is the longest of the three, measuring from 18 to 22 millimeters. Its lower or ampullated end opens into the lower and back part of the vestibule, its upper into the cross commune already mentioned. The lateral or horizontal canal, Canalis semicircularis lateralis, external semicircular canal, is the shortest of the three. It measures from 12 to 15 millimetres, and its arch is directed horizontally backward and lateralward. Thus each semicircular canal stands at right angles to the other two. Its ampullated end corresponds to the upper and lateral angle of the vestibule, just above the fenestra vestibuli, where it opens close to the ampullated end of the superior canal. Its opposite end opens at the upper and back part of the vestibule. The lateral canal of one ear is very nearly in the same plane as that of the other, while the superior canal of one ear is nearly parallel to the posterior canal of the other. The cochlea The cochlea bears some resemblance to a common snail shell. It forms the anterior part of the labyrinth, is conical in form, and placed almost horizontally in front of the vestibule. Its apex, cupula, is directed forward and lateralward, with a slight inclination downward, toward the upper and front part of the labyrinthic wall of the tympanic cavity. Its base corresponds with the bottom of the internal acoustic meatus, and is perforated by numerous apertures for the passage of the cochlear division of the acoustic nerve. It measures about 5 mm from base to apex, and its breadth across the base is about 9 mm. 
It consists of a conical-shaped central axis, the modiolus, of a canal, the inner wall of which is formed by the central axis, wound spirally around it for two turns and three quarters. From the base to the apex, and of a delicate lamina, the osseous spiral lamina, which projects from the modiolus, and, following the windings of the canal, partially subdivides it into two. In the recent state, a membrane, the basilar membrane, stretches from the free border of this lamina to the outer wall of the bony cochlea and completely separates the canal into two passages, which, however, communicate with each other at the apex of the modiolus by a small opening named the helicotrema. The modiolus is the conical central axis, or pillar, of the cochlea. Its base is broad and appears at the bottom of the internal acoustic meatus, where it corresponds with the area cochleae. It is perforated by numerous orifices, which transmit filaments of the cochlear division of the acoustic nerve. The nerves of the first tone and a half pass through the foramina of the tractus spiralis foraminosus, those for the apical tone through the foramen centrale. The canals of the tractus spiralis foraminosus pass up through the modiolus and successively bend outward to reach the attached margin of the lamina spiralis ossea. Here they become enlarged, and by their apposition form the spiral canal of the modiolus, which follows the course of the attached margin of the osseous spiral lamina and lodges the spiral ganglion, ganglion of corti. The foramen centrale is continued into a canal which runs up the middle of the modiolus to its apex. The modiolus diminishes rapidly in size in the second and succeeding coil. The bony canal of the cochlea takes two turns and three quarters around the modiolus. It is about 30 millimeters in length and diminishes gradually in diameter from the base to the summit, where it terminates in the cupula which forms the apex of the cochlea. The beginning of this canal is about 3 millimeters in diameter. It diverges from the modiolus toward the tympanic cavity and vestibule and presents three openings. 1. The fenestra cochlei communicates with the tympanic cavity. In the fresh state, this aperture is closed by the secondary tympanic membrane. Another of an elliptical form, opens into the vestibule. The third is the aperture of the aqueductus cochlei, leading to a minute funnel-shaped canal which opens on the inferior surface of the petrous part of the temporal bone and transmits a small vein, and also forms a communication between the subarachnoid cavity and the scala tympani. The osseous spiral lamina, lamina spiralis ossea, is a bony shelf or ledge which projects from the modiolus into the interior of the canal and, like the canal, takes two and three quarter turns around the modiolus. It reaches about halfway toward the outer wall of the tube and partially divides its cavity into two passages or scalae, of which the upper is named the scala vestibuli, while the lower is termed the scala tympani. Near the summit of the cochlea, the lamina ends in a hook-shaped process, the hamulus laminae spiralis. This assists in forming the boundary of the small opening, the helicotrema, through which the two scalae communicate with each other. From the spiral canal of the modiolus, numerous canals pass outward through the osseous spiral lamina as far as its free edge. In the lower part of the first tone, a second bony lamina, the secondary spiral lamina, projects inward from the outer wall of the bony tube. It does not, however, reach the primary osseous spiral lamina, so that if viewed from the vestibule, a narrow fissure, the vestibule fissure, is seen between them. The osseous labyrinth is lined by an exceedingly thin, fibrous serous membrane. Its attached surface is rough and fibrous, and closely adherent to the bone. Its free surface is smooth and pale, covered with a layer of epithelium, and secretes a thin, limpid fluid, the perilymph. A delicate tubular process of this membrane is prolonged along the aqueduct of the cochlea to the inner surface of the dura mater. The membranous labyrinth Labyrinthus membranaceus. The membranous labyrinth is lodged within the bony cavities just described, and has the same general form as these. It is, however, considerably smaller, and is partly separated from the bony walls by a quantity of fluid, the perilymph. In certain places it is fixed to the walls of the cavity. The membranous labyrinth contains fluid, the endolymph, and on its walls the ramifications of the acoustic nerve are distributed. Within the osseous vestibule, the membranous labyrinth does not quite preserve the form of the bony cavity, but consists of two membranous sacs, the utricle and the saccule. The utricle, utriculus. 
The utricle, the larger of the two, is of an oblong form, compressed transversely, and occupies the upper and back part of the vestibule, lying in contact with the recessus ellipticus and the part below it. That portion which is lodged in the recess forms a sort of pouch or cul-de-sac, the floor and anterior wall of which are thickened, and form the macula acoustica utriculi, which receives the utricular filaments of the acoustic nerve. The cavity of the utricle communicates behind with the semicircular ducts by five orifices. From its anterior wall is given off the ductus utriculosacularis, which opens into the ductus endolymphaticus. The saccule, sacculus. The saccule is the smaller of the two vestibular sacs. It is globular in form and lies in the recessus sphericus near the opening of the scala vestibuli of the cochlea. Its anterior part exhibits an oval thickening, the macula acoustica sacculi, to which are distributed the saccular filaments of the acoustic nerve. Its cavity does not directly communicate with that of the utricle. From the posterior wall a canal, the ductus endolymphaticus, is given off. This duct is joined by the ductus utriculus sacularis, and then passes along the aqueductus vestibuli and ends in a blind pouch, saccus endolymphaticus, on the posterior surface of the petrous portion of the temporal bone, where it is in contact with the dura mater. From the lower part of the saccule a short tube, the canalis reuniens of Henson, passes downward and opens into the ductus cochlearis nearest vestibular extremity. The semicircular ducts, ductus semicircularis, membranous semicircular canals. The semicircular ducts are about one-fourth of the diameter of the osseous canals, but in number, shape, and general form they are precisely similar, and each presents at one end an ampulla. They open by five orifices into the utricle, one opening being common to the medial end of the superior and the upper end of the posterior duct. In the ampullae the wall is thickened and projects into the cavity as a fiddle-shaped, transversely placed elevation, the septum transversum, in which the nerves end. The utricle, saccule, and semicircular ducts are held in position by numerous fibrous bands which stretch across the space between them and the bony walls. Structure The walls of the utricle, saccule, and semicircular ducts consist of three layers. The outer layer is a loose and flocculent structure, apparently composed of ordinary fibrous tissue containing blood vessels and some pigment cells. The middle layer, thicker and more transparent, forms a homogeneous membrana propria and presents on its internal surface, especially in the semicircular ducts, numerous papilliform projections which, on the addition of acetic acid, exhibit an appearance of longitudinal fibrillation. The inner layer is formed of polygonal nucleated epithelial cells. In the maculae of the utricle and saccule, and in the transverse septum of the ampullae of the semicircular ducts, the middle coat is thickened, and the epithelium is columnar, and consists of supporting cells and hair cells. The former are fusiform, and their deep ends are attached to the membrana propria, while their free extremities are united to form a thin cuticle. The hair cells are flask-shaped, and their deep, rounded ends do not reach the membrana propria, but lie between the supporting cells. The deep part of each contains a large nucleus, while its more superficial part is granular and pigmented. The free end is surmounted by a long, tapering, hair-like filament which projects into the cavity. The filaments of the acoustic nerve enter these parts, and having pierced the outer and middle layers, they lose their medullary sheaths, and their axis cylinders ramify between the hair cells. Two rounded bodies, termed otoconia, each consisting of a mass of minute crystalline grains of carbonate of lime held together in a mesh of gelatinous tissue are suspended in the endolymph in contact with the free ends of the hairs projecting from the maculae. According to Bowman, a calcareous material is also sparingly scattered in the cells lining the ampullae of the semicircular ducts. The Internal Ear or Labyrinth, Part 2 The ductus cochlearis, membranous cochlea, scala media the ductus cochlearis consists of a spirally arranged tube enclosed in the bony canal of the cochlea and lying along its outer wall. As already stated, the osseous spiral lamina extends only part of the distance between the modiolus and the outer wall of the cochlea, while the basilar membrane stretches from its free edge to the outer wall of the cochlea and completes the roof of the scala tympani. 
A second and more delicate membrane, the vestibular membrane, vice neri, extends from the thickened periosteum covering the osseous spiral lamina to the outer wall of the cochlea, where it is attached at some little distance above the outer edge of the basilar membrane. A canal is thus shut off between the scala tympani below and the scala vestibuli above. This is the ductus cochlearis, or scala media. It is triangular on transverse section, its roof being formed by the vestibular membrane, its outer wall by the periosteum lining the bony canal, and its floor by the membrana basilaris and the outer part of the lamina spiralis ossea. Its extremities are closed. The upper is termed the lagina and is attached to the cupula at the upper part of the helicotrema. The lower is lodged in the recessus cochlearis of the vestibule. Near the lower end, the ductus cochlearis is brought into continuity with the saccule by a narrow short canal, the canalis reunions of Henson. On the membrana basilaris is situated the spiral organ of corti. The vestibular membrane is thin and homogeneous, and is covered on its upper and under surfaces by a layer of epithelium. The periosteum, forming the outer wall of the ductus cochlearis, is greatly thickened and altered in character, and is called the spiral ligament. It projects inward below as a triangular prominence, the basilar crest, which gives attachment to the outer edge of the basilar membrane. Immediately above the crest is a concavity, the sulcus spiralis externus. The upper portion of the spiral ligament contains numerous capillary loops and small blood vessels, and is termed the stria vascularis. The osseous spiral lamina consists of two plates of bone, and between these are the canals for the transmission of the filaments of the acoustic nerve. On the upper plate of that part of the lamina which is outside the vestibular membrane, the periosteum is thickened to form the limbus laminae spiralis. This ends externally in a concavity, the sulcus spiralis internus, which represents, on section, the form of the letter C. The upper part, formed by the overhanging extremity of the limbus, is named the vestibular lip. The lower part, prolonged and tapering, is called the tympanic lip, and is perforated by numerous foramina for the passage of the cochlear nerves. The upper surface of the vestibular lip is intersected at right angles by a number of furrows, between which are numerous elevations. These present the appearance of teeth along the free surface and margin of the lip, and have been named by Husker the auditory teeth. The limbus is covered by a layer of what appears to be squamous epithelium, but the deeper parts of the cells with their contained nuclei occupy the intervals between the elevations and between the auditory teeth. This layer of epithelium is continuous on the one hand with that lining the sulcus spiralis internus, and on the other with that covering the undersurface of the vestibular membrane. Basilar Membrane The basilar membrane stretches from the tympanic lip of the osseous spiral lamina to the basilar crest and consists of two parts, an inner and an outer. The inner is thin and is named the zona arcuata. It supports the spiral organ of corti. The outer is thicker and striated, and is termed the zona pectinata. The undersurface of the membrane is covered by a layer of vascular connective tissue. One of the vessels in this tissue is somewhat larger than the rest, and is named the vas spirale. It lies below Corti's tunnel. The spiral organ of Corti, organon spirale, Corti, organ of Corti, is composed of a series of epithelial structures placed upon the inner part of the basilar membrane. The more central of these structures are two rows of rod-like bodies, the inner and outer rods or pillars of corti. The bases of the rods are supported on the basilar membrane, those of the inner row at some distance from those of the outer. The two rows incline toward each other and, coming into contact above, enclose between them and the basilar membrane a triangular tunnel, the tunnel of corti. On the inner side of the inner rods is a single row of hair cells, and on the outer side of the outer rods three or four rows of similar cells, together with certain supporting cells termed the cells of Dietus and Henson. The free ends of the outer hair cells occupy a series of apertures in a net-like membrane, the reticular membrane, and the entire organ is covered by the tectorial membrane. Rods of Corti Each of these consists of a base or footplate, an elongated part or body, and an upper end or head. The body of each rod is finely striated, 
but in the head there is an oval, non-striated portion which stains deeply with carmine. Occupying the angles between the rods and the basal membrane are nucleated cells which partly envelop the rods and extend onto the floor of Corti's tunnel. These may be looked upon as the undifferentiated parts of the cells from which the rods have been formed. The inner rods number nearly 6,000, and their bases rest on the basal membrane, close to the tympanic lip of the sulcus spiralis internus. The shaft or body of each is sinuously curved and forms an angle of about 60 degrees with the basal membrane. The head resembles the proximal end of the ulna, and presents a deep concavity which accommodates a convexity on the head of the outer rod. The head plate or portion overhanging the concavity overlaps the head plate of the outer rod. The outer rods, nearly 4,000 in number, are longer and more obliquely set than the inner, forming with the basal membrane an angle of about 40 degrees. Their heads are convex internally. They fit into the concavities on the heads of the inner rods and are continued outward as thin flattened plates, termed phalangeal processes, which unite with the phalangeal processes of Dieter's cells to form the reticular membrane. Hair Cells The hair cells are short columnar cells. Their free ends are on a level with the heads of Corti's rods, and each is surmounted by about twenty hair-like processes, arranged in the form of a crescent with its concavity directed inward. The deep ends of the cells reach about halfway along Corti's rods, and each contains a large nucleus. In contact with the deep ends of the hair cells are the terminal filaments of the cochlear division of the acoustic nerve. The inner hair cells are arranged in a single row on the medial side of the inner rods, and their diameters being greater than those of the rods, it follows that each hair cell is supported by more than one rod. The free ends of the inner hair cells are encircled by a cuticular membrane which is fixed to the heads of the inner rods. Adjoining the inner hair cells are one or two rows of columnar supporting cells, which, in turn, are continuous with the cubical cells lining the sulcus spiralis internus. The outer hair cells number about 12,000 and are nearly twice as long as the inner. In the basal coil of the cochlea, they are arranged in three regular rows, in the apical coil, in four somewhat irregular rows. Between the rows of the outer hair cells are rows of supporting cells, called the cells of Dieters. Their expanded bases are planted on the basilar membrane, while the opposite end of each presents a clubbed extremity or phalangeal process. Immediately to the outer side of Dieters' cells, are five or six rows of columnar cells, the supporting cells of Henson. Their bases are narrow, while their upper parts are expanded and form a rounded elevation on the floor of the ductus cochlearis. The columnar cells, lying outside Henson's cells, are termed the cells of Claudius. A space exists between the outer rods of Corti and the adjacent hair cells. This is called the space of Newell. The rectangular lamina is a delicate framework perforated by rounded holes which are occupied by the free ends of the outer hair cells. It extends from the heads of the outer rods of Corti to the external row of the outer hair cells and is formed by several rows of minute fiddle-shaped cuticular structures called phalanges, between which are circular apertures containing the free ends of the hair cells. The innermost row of phalanges consists of the phalangeal processes of the outer rods of Corti. The outer rows are formed by the modified free ends of Dieter's cells. Covering the sulcus spiralis internus and the spiral organ of Corti is the tectorial membrane, which is attached to the limbus laminae spiralis close to the inner edge of the vestibular membrane. Its inner part is thin and overlies the auditory teeth of Huschka. Its outer part is thick, and along its lower surface, opposite the inner hair cells, is a clear band, named Henson's stripe due to the intercrossing of its fibers. The lateral margin of the membrane is much thinner. Hardesty considers the tectorial membrane as the vibrating mechanism in the cochlea. It is inconceivably delicate and flexible, far more sensitively flexible in the transverse than in the longitudinal direction, and the readiness with which it bends when touched is beyond description. It is ectodermal in origin. It consists of fine colorless fibers embedded in a transparent matrix. The matrix may be a variety of soft keratin, of a soft collagenous, semi-solid character with marked adhesiveness. 
The general transverse direction of the fibers inclines from the radius of the cochlea toward the apex. The acoustic nerve, nervus acousticus, auditory nerve or nerve of hearing, divides near the bottom of the internal acoustic meatus into an anterior or cochlea and a posterior or vestibular branch. The vestibular nerve, nervus vestibularis, supplies the utricle, the saccule, and the ampullae of the semicircular ducts. On the trunk of the nerve, within the internal acoustic meatus, is a ganglion, the vestibular ganglion, ganglion of scarpa. The fibers of the nerve arise from the cells of this ganglion. On the distal side of the ganglion, the nerve splits into a superior, an inferior, and a posterior branch. The filaments of the superior branch are transmitted through the foramina in the area vestibularis superior, and end in the macula of the utricle, and in the ampullae of the superior and lateral semicircular ducts. Those of the inferior branch traverse the foramina in the area vestibularis inferior, and end in the macula of the saccule. The posterior branch runs through the foramen singulare at the posto-inferior part of the bottom of the meatus, and divides into filaments for the supply of the ampulla of the posterior semicircular duct. The cochlear nerve, nervus cochlearis, divides into numerous filaments at the base of the modiolus. Those for the basal and middle coils pass through the foramina in the tractus spiralis foraminosis. Those for the apical coil through the canalis centralis, and the nerves bend outward to pass between the lamellae of the osseous spiral lamina. Occupying the spiral canal of the modiolus is the spiral ganglion of the cochlea, ganglion of corti, consisting of bipolar nerve cells, which constitute the cells of origin of this nerve. Reaching the outer edge of the osseous spiral lamina, the fibers of the nerve pass through the foramina in the tympanic lip. Some end by arborizing around the bases of the inner hair cells, while others pass between cortis rods and across the tunnel, to end in a similar manner in relation to the outer hair cells. The cochlear nerve gives off a vestibular branch to supply the vestibular end of the ductus cochlearis. The filaments of this branch pass through the foramina in the fossa cochlearis. Vessels The arteries of the labyrinth are, are the internal auditory, from the basilar, and the stylomastoid, from the posterior auricula. The internal auditory artery divides at the bottom of the internal acoustic meatus into two branches, cochlea and vestibula. The cochlear branch subdivides into twelve or fourteen twigs, which traverse the canals in the modiolus, and are distributed, in the form of a capillary network, in the lamina spiralis and basilar membrane. The vestibular branches are distributed to the utricle, saccule, and semicircular ducts. The veins of the vestibule and semicircular canals accompany the arteries and, receiving those of the cochlea at the base of the modiolus, unite to form the internal auditory veins which end in the posterior part of the superior petrosal sinus or in the transverse sinus. 1e. Peripheral Terminations of Nerves of General Sensations The peripheral terminations of the nerves associated with general sensations, i.e., the muscular sense, and the senses of heat, cold, pain, and pressure, are widely distributed throughout the body. These nerves may end free among the tissue elements, or in special end organs, where the terminal nerve filaments are enclosed in capsules. Free nerve endings occur chiefly in the epidermis and in the epithelium covering certain mucous membranes. They are well seen also in the stratified squamous epithelium of the corona, and are also found in the root sheaths and papillae of the hairs and around the bodies of the sudoriferous glands. When the nerve fiber approaches its termination, the medullary sheath suddenly disappears, leaving only the axis cylinder surrounded by the neurolemma. After a time, the fiber loses its neurolemma and consists only of an axis cylinder which can be seen in preparation stained with chloride of gold, to be made up of fine varicose fibrilli. Finally, the axis cylinder breaks up into its constituent fibrilli, which often present regular variscosities and anastomos with one another, and end in small knobs or discs between the epithelial cells. Under this heading may be classed 
the tactile discs described by Merkel as occurring in the epidermis of the pig's snout, where the fibrilli of the axis cylinder end in cup-shaped discs in apposition with large epithelial cells. The special end organs exhibit great variety in size and shape, but have one feature in common, viz. the terminal nerve fibrilli are enveloped by a capsule. Included in this group are the end bulbs of Krauss, the corpuscles of Grandry, of Piccini, of Golgi and Mazzoni, of Wagner and Meisner, and the neurotendinous and neuromuscular spindles. The end bulbs of Krauss are minute cylindrical or oval bodies, consisting of a capsule formed by the expansion of the connective tissue sheath of a medullated fiber and containing a soft semifluid core in which the axis cylinder terminates either in a bulbous extremity or in a coiled up plexiform mass. End bulbs are found in the conjunctiva of the eye, where they are spheroidal in shape in man, but cylindrical in most other animals, in the mucous membrane of the lips and tongue, and in the epineurium of nerve trunks. They are also found in the penis and the clitoris, and have received the name of genital corpuscles. In these situations, they have a mulberry-like appearance, being constricted by connective tissue septa into from two to six knob-like masses. In the synovial membranes of certain joints, e.g., those of the fingers, rounded or oval end bulbs occur and are designated articular end bulbs. The tactile corpuscles of Grandi occur in the papillae of the beak and tongue of birds. Each consists of a capsule composed of a very delicate nucleated membrane and contains two or more granular, somewhat flattened cells. Between these cells, the axis cylinder ends in flattened discs. The Pacinian corpuscles are found in the subcutaneous tissue on the nerves of the palm of the hand and sole of the foot, and in the genital organs of both sexes. They also occur in connection with the nerves of the joints, and in some other situations, as in the mesentery and pancreas of the cat, and along the tibia of the rabbit. Each of these corpuscles is attached to and encloses the termination of a single nerve fiber. The corpuscle, which is perfectly visible to the naked eye, and which can be most easily demonstrated in the mesentery of a cat, consists of a number of lamella or capsules arranged more or less concentrically around a central clear space in which the nerve fiber is contained. Each lamella is composed of bundles of fine connective tissue fibers and is lined on its inner surface by a single layer of flattened epithelioid cells. The center clear space, which is elongated or cylindrical in shape, is filled with a transparent core, in the middle of which the axis cylinder transverses the space to near its distal extremity, where it ends in one or more small knobs. Todd and Bowman have described minute arteries as entering by the sides of the nerves and forming capillary loops in the intercapsular spaces and even penetrating into the central space. Herbst has described a nerve ending somewhat similar to the Pacinian corpuscle in the mucous membrane of the tongue of the duck and in some other situations. It differs, however, from the Pacinian corpuscle in being smaller, in its capsules being more closely approximated, and especially in the act that the axis cylinder in the central clear space is coated with a continuous row of nuclei. These bodies are known as the corpuscles of Herbst. The corpuscles of Golgi and Mazzoni are found in the subcutaneous tissue of the pulp of the fingers. They differ from Pacinian corpuscles in that their capsules are thinner, their contained cores thicker, and in the latter the axis cylinders ramify more extensively and end in flat expansions. The tactile corpuscles of Wagner and Meisner are oval-shaped bodies. Each is enveloped by a connective tissue capsule and imperfect membranous septa derived from this penetrate the interior. The axis cylinder passes through the capsule, and after making several spiral turns around the body of the corpuscle, ends in small globular or pyrofoam enlargements. These tactile corpuscles occur in the papillae of the corium 
of the hand and foot, the front of the forearm, the skin of the lips, the mucous membrane of the tip of the tongue, the palpable conjunctiva, and the skin of the mammary papilla. Corpuscles of Ruffini Ruffini described a special variety of nerve endings in the subcutaneous tissue of the human finger. They are principally situated at the junction of the corium with the subcutaneous tissue. They are oval in shape and consist of strong connective tissue sheaths, inside which the nerve fibers divide into numerous branches, which show varicosities and end in small free knobs. The neurotendinous spindles, organs of Golgi, are chiefly found near the junctions of tendons and muscles. Each is enclosed in a capsule which contains a number of enlarged tendon fasciculi, intrafusal fasciculi. One or more nerve fibers perforate the side of the capsule and lose their medullary sheaths. The axis cylinders subdivide and end between the tendon fibers in irregular discs or varicosities. The neuromuscular spindles are present in the majority of voluntary muscles and consist of small bundles of particular muscular fibers, intrafusal fibers, embryonic in type, invested by capsules, within which nerve fibers, experimentally shown to be sensory in origin, terminate. These neuromuscular spindles vary in length from 0.8 millimeters to 5 millimeters and have a distinctly fusiform appearance. The large metallated nerve fibers passing to the end organ are from 1 to 3 or 4 in number. Entering the fibrous capsule, they divide several times and, losing their medullary sheaths, ultimately end in naked axis cylinders encircling the intrafusal fibers by flattened expansions or irregular ovoid or rounded discs. Neuromuscular spindles have not yet been demonstrated in the tongue muscles and only a few exist in the ocular muscles. The Common Integument, Part 1. Integumentum Commune, Skin. The integument covers the body and protects the deeper tissues from injury, from drying, and from invasion by foreign organisms. It contains the peripheral endings of many of the sensory nerves. It plays an important part in the regulation of the body temperature and has also limited excretory and absorbing powers. It consists principally of a layer of vascular connective tissue named the corium or cutis vera, and an external covering of epithelium termed the epidermis or cuticle. On the surface of the former layer are sensitive and vascular papillae. Within or beneath it are certain organs with special functions, namely the sudoriferous and sebaceous glands and the hair follicles. The epidermis, cuticle, or scarf skin is non-vascular and consists of stratified epithelium and is accurately molded on the papillary layer of the corium. It varies in thickness in different parts. In some situations, as in the palms of the hands and soles of the feet, it is thick, hard, and horny in texture. This may be in a measure due to the fact that these parts are exposed to intermittent pressure but that this is not the only cause is proved by the fact that the condition exists to a very considerable extent at birth. The more superficial layers of cells, called the horny layer, stratum corneum, may be separated by maceration from a deeper stratum, which is called the stratum mucosum, and which consists of several layers of differently shaped cells. The free surface of the epidermis is marked by a network of linear furrows of variable size dividing the surface into a number of polygonal or lozenge-shaped areas. Some of these furrows are large, as opposite the flexures of the joints, and correspond to the folds in the corium produced by movements. In other situations, as upon the back of the hand, they are exceedingly fine, and intersect one another at various angles. Upon the palmar surfaces of the hands and fingers, and upon the soles of the feet, the epidermal ridges are very distinct, and are disposed in curves. They depend upon the large size and peculiar arrangements of the papillae upon which the epidermis is placed. The function of these ridges is primarily to increase resistance between contact surfaces for the purpose of preventing slipping, whether in walking or prehension. The direction of the ridges is at right angles with the force that tends to produce slipping or to the resultant of such forces when these forces vary in direction. Footnote. Professor Arthur Thompson of Oxford suggests that the contraction of these muscles on follicles which contain weak, 
flat hairs, will tend to produce a permanent curve in the follicle, and this curve will be impressed on the hair which is molded within it, so that the hair, on emerging through the skin, will be curled. Curved hair follicles are characteristic of the scalp of the bushman. End footnote. In each individual, the lines on the tips of the fingers and thumbs form distinct patterns unlike those of any other person. A method of determining the identity of a criminal is based on this fact, impressions, fingerprints, of these lines being made on paper covered with soot, or on white paper after first covering the fingers with ink. The deep surface of the epidermis is accurately molded upon the papillary layer of the corium, the papillae being covered by a basement membrane so that when the epidermis is removed by maceration, it presents on its undersurface a number of pits or depressions corresponding to the papillae, and ridges corresponding to the intervals between them. Fine tubular prolongations are continued from this layer into the ducts of the sudoriferous and sebaceous glands. The epidermis consists of stratified epithelium, which is arranged in four layers, from within outward, as follows. A. Stratum mucosum b. stratum granulosum, c. stratum lucidum, and d. stratum corneum. The stratum mucosum, mucus layer, is composed of several layers of cells. Those of the deepest layer are columnar in shape, and placed perpendicularly on the surface of the basement membrane, to which they are attached by toothed extremities. This deepest layer is sometimes termed the stratum germinativum, the succeeding strata consist of cells of a more rounded or polyhedral form, the contents of which are soft, opaque, granular, and soluble in acetic acid. These are known as prickle cells because of the bridges by which they are connected to one another. They contain fine fibrils which are continuous across the connecting processes with corresponding fibrils in adjacent cells. Between the bridges are fine intercellular clefts serving for the passage of lymph and in these, lymph corpuscles or pigment granules may be found. The stratum granulosum comprises two or three layers of flattened cells which contain granules of alidin, a substance readily stained by hematoxylin or carmine, and probably an intermediate substance in the formation of keratin. They are supposed to be cells in a transitional stage between the protoplasmic cells of the stratum mucosum and the horny cells of the superficial layers. The stratum lucidum appears in section as a homogeneous or dimly striated membrane, composed of closely packed cells, in which traces of flattened nuclei may be found, and in which minute granules of a substance named keratohyalin are present. The stratum corneum, horny layer, consists of several layers of horny epithelial scales in which no nuclei are discernible, and which are unaffected by acetic acid the protoplasm having become changed into horny material, or keratin. According to Ranvier, they contain granules of a material which has the characteristics of beeswax. The black color of the skin in the negro, and the tawny color among some of the white races, is due to the presence of pigment in the cells of the epidermis. This pigment is more especially distinct in the cells of the stratum mucosum, and is similar to that found in the cells of the pigmentary layer of the retina. As the cells approach the surface and desiccate, the color becomes partially lost. The disappearance of the pigment from the superficial layers of the epidermis is, however, difficult to explain. The pigment, melanin, consists of dark brown or black granules of very small size, closely packed together within the cells, but not involving the nucleus. The main purpose served by the epidermis is that of protection. As the surface is worn away, new cells are supplied, and thus the true skin, the vessels and nerves which it contains, are defended from damage. The corium, cutis vera, dermis, or true skin, is tough, flexible, and highly elastic. It varies in thickness in different parts of the body. Thus it is very thick in the palms of the hand and soles of the feet thicker on the posterior aspect of the body than on the front, and on the lateral than on the medial sides of the limbs. In eyelids, scrotum, and penis it is exceedingly thin and delicate. It consists of felted connective tissue with a varying amount of elastic fibers and numerous blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves. The connective tissue is arranged in two layers, a deeper or reticular, and a superficial or papillary. Unstriped muscular fibers are found in the superficial layers of the corium, wherever hairs are present, 
and in the subcutaneous areolar tissue of the scrotum, penis, labia majora, and nipples. In the nipples, the fibers are disposed in bands, closely reticulated and arranged in superimposed laminae. The reticular layer, stratum reticulari, deep layer, consists of strong interlacing bands, composed chiefly of white fibrous tissue, but containing some fibers of yellow elastic tissue, which vary in number in different parts, and connective tissue corpuscles, which are often to be found flattened against the white fibrous tissue bundles. Toward the attached surface, the fasciculi are large and coarse, and the areoli left by their interlacement are large and occupied by adipose tissue and sweat glands. Below the reticular layer is the subcutaneous areolar tissue, which, except in a few situations, contains fat. The papillary layer, stratum papillari, superficial layer, corpus papillari of the corium, consists of numerous small, highly sensitive, and vascular eminences, the papillae, which rise perpendicularly from its surface. The papillae are minute conical eminences, having rounded or blunted extremities, occasionally divided into two or more parts, and are received into corresponding pits on the undersurface of the cuticle. On the general surface of the body, more especially in parts endowed with slight sensibility, they are few in number and exceedingly minute. But in some situations, as upon the palmar surfaces of the hands and fingers, and upon the plantar surfaces of the feet and toes, they are long, of large size, closely aggregated together, and arranged in parallel curved lines, forming the elevated ridges seen on the free surface of the epidermis. Each ridge contains two rows of papillae, between which the ducts of the sudoriferous glands pass outward to open on the summit of the ridge. Each papilla consists of very small and closely interlacing bundles of finely fibrillated tissue, with a few elastic fibers. Within this tissue is a capillary loop, and in some papillae, especially in the palms of the hands and the fingers, there are tactile corpuscles. Development The epidermis and its appendages, consisting of the hairs, nails, sebaceous and sweat glands, are developed from the ectoderm, while the corium, or true skin, is of mesodermal origin. About the fifth week, the epidermis consists of two layers of cells, the deeper one corresponding to the reet mucosum. The subcutaneous fat appears about the fourth month, and the papillae of the true skin about the sixth. A considerable desquamation of epidermis takes place during fetal life, and this desquamated epidermis, mixed with sebaceous secretion, constitutes the vernix caseosa with which the skin is smeared during the last three months of fetal life. The nails are formed at the third month, and begin to project from the epidermis about the sixth. The hairs appear between the third and fourth months, in the form of solid downgrowths of the deeper layer of the epidermis, the growing extremities of which become inverted by papillary projections from the corium. The central cells of the solid downgrowths undergo alteration to form the hair, while the peripheral cells are retained to form the lining cells of the hair follicle. About the fifth month, the fetal hairs, lanugo, appear, first on the head and then on the other parts. They drop off after birth and give place to the permanent hairs. The cellular structures of the sudoriferous and sebaceous glands are formed from the ectoderm, while the connective tissue and blood vessels are derived from the mesoderm. All the sweat glands are fully formed at birth. They begin to develop as early as the fourth month. The arteries supplying the skin form a network in the subcutaneous tissue, and from this network branches are given off to supply the sudoriferous glands, the hair follicles, and the fat. Other branches unite in a plexus immediately beneath the corium. From this plexus, fine capillary vessels pass into the papillae, forming, in the smaller ones, a single capillary loop, but in the larger, a more or less convoluted vessel. The lymphatic vessels of the skin form two networks, superficial and deep, which communicate with each other and with those of the subcutaneous tissue by oblique branches. The nerves of the skin terminate partly in the epidermis and partly in the corium. Their different modes of ending are described on pages 1059 to 1061. The Common Integument, Part 2. The Appendages of the Skin. The appendages of the skin are the nails, the hairs, and the sudoriferous and sebaceous glands with their ducts. The nails, unguies, are flattened, elastic structures of a horny texture, 
placed upon the dorsal surfaces of the terminal phalanges of the fingers and toes. Each nail is convex on its outer surface, concave within, and is implanted by a portion, called the root, into a groove in the skin. The exposed portion is called the body, and the distal extremity, the free edge. The nail is firmly adherent to the corium, being accurately molded upon its surface. The part beneath the body and root of the nail is called the nail matrix, because from it the nail is produced. Under the greater part of the body of the nail, the matrix is thick and raised into a series of longitudinal ridges, which are very vascular, and the color is seen through the transparent tissue. Near the root of the nail, the papillae are smaller, less vascular, and have no regular arrangement, and here the tissue of the nail is not firmly adherent to the connective tissue stratum, but only in contact with it. Hence this portion is of a whiter color, and is called the lunula on account of its shape. The cuticle, as it passes forward on the dorsal surface of the finger or toe, is attached to the surface of the nail a little in advance of its root. At the extremity of the finger, it is connected with the under surface of the nail, a little behind its free edge. The cuticle and the horny substance of the nail, both epidermic structures, are thus directly continuous with each other. The superficial horny part of the nail consists of a greatly thickened stratum lucidum, the stratum corneum forming merely the thin cuticular fold, epinicium, which overlaps the lunula. The deeper part consists of the stratum mucosum. The cells in contact with the papillae of the matrix are columnar in form and arranged perpendicularly to the surface. Those which succeed them are of a rounded or polygonal form, the more superficial ones becoming broad, thin, and flattened, and so closely packed as to make the limits of the cells very indistinct. The nails grow in length by the proliferation of the cells of the stratum mucosum at the root of the nail, and in thickness from that part of the stratum mucosum which underlies the lunula. Hairs, pili, are found on nearly every part of the surface of the body, but are absent from the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet, the dorsal surfaces of the terminal phalanges, the glans penis, the inner surface of the prepuce, and the inner surfaces of the labia. They vary much in length, thickness, and color in different parts of the body, and in different races of mankind. In some parts, as in the skin of the eyelids, they are so short as not to project beyond the follicles containing them. In others, as upon the scalp, they are of considerable length. Again, in other parts, as the eyelashes, the hairs of the pubic region, and the whiskers and beard, they are remarkable for their thickness. Straight hairs are stronger than curly hairs, and present on transverse section a cylindrical or oval outline. Curly hairs, on the other hand, are flattened. A hair consists of a root, the part implanted in the skin, and a shaft or scapus, the portion projecting from the surface. The root of the hair, radix pili, ends in an enlargement, the hair bulb, which is whiter in color and softer in texture than the shaft and is lodged in a follicular involution of the epidermis called the hair follicle. When the hair is of considerable length, the follicle extends into the subcutaneous cellular tissue. The hair follicle commences on the surface of the skin with a funnel-shaped opening, and passes inward in an oblique or curved direction, the latter in curly hairs, to become dilated at its deep extremity, where it corresponds with the hair bulb. Opening into the follicle, near its free extremity, are the ducts of one or more sebaceous glands. At the bottom of each hair follicle is a small, conical, vascular eminence, or papilla, similar in every respect to those found upon the surface of the skin. It is continuous with the dermic layer of the follicle, and is supplied with nerve fibrils. The hair follicle consists of two coats, an outer, or dermic, and an inner, or epidermic. The outer, or dermic coat, is formed mainly of fibrous tissue. It is continuous with the corium, is highly vascular, and supplied by numerous minute nervous filaments. It consists of three layers. The most internal is a hyaline basement membrane, which is well marked in the larger hair follicles, but is not very distinct in the follicles of minute hairs. It is limited to the deeper part of the follicle. Outside this is a compact layer of fibers and spindle-shaped cells arranged circularly around the follicle. This layer extends from the bottom of the follicle as high as the entrance of the ducts of the sebaceous glands. 
Externally is a thick layer of connective tissue arranged in longitudinal bundles, forming a more open texture and corresponding to the reticular part of the corium. In this are contained the blood vessels and nerves. The inner or epidermic coat is closely adherent to the root of the hair and consists of two strata named respectively the outer and inner root sheaths. The former of these corresponds with the stratum mucosum of the epidermis and resembles it in the rounded form and soft character of its cells. At the bottom of the hair follicle, these cells become continuous with those of the root of the hair. The inner root sheath consists of 1. A delicate cuticle next the hair, composed of a single layer of imbricated scales with atrophied nuclei. 2. One or two layers of horny, flattened, nucleated cells, known as Huxley's layer. And 3. A single layer of cubical cells with clear, flattened nuclei, called Henley's layer. The hair bulb is molded over the papilla and composed of polyhedral epithelial cells, which, as they pass upward into the root of the hair, become elongated and spindle-shaped, except some in the center which remain polyhedral. Some of these latter cells contain pigment granules, which give rise to the color of the hair. It occasionally happens that these pigment granules completely fill the cells in the center of the bulb. This gives rise to the dark tract of pigment often found, of greater or less length and the axis of the hair. The shaft of the hair, scapus pili, consists, from within outward, of three parts, the medulla, the cortex, and the cuticle. The medulla is usually wanting in the fine hairs covering the surface of the body, and commonly in those of the head. It is more opaque and deeper colored than the cortex when viewed by transmitted light, but when viewed by reflected light, it is white. It is composed of rows of polyhedral cells containing granules of elidin and frequently air spaces. The cortex constitutes the chief part of the shaft. Its cells are elongated and united to form flattened fusiform fibers, which contain pigment granules in dark hair and air in white hair. The cuticle consists of a single layer of flat scales which overlap one another from below upward. Connected with the hair follicles are minute bundles of involuntary muscular fibers, termed the arectores pylorum. They arise from the superficial layer of the corium and are inserted into the hair follicle below the entrance of the duct of the sebaceous gland. They are placed on the side toward which the hair slopes, and by their action diminish the obliquity of the follicle and elevate the hair. The sebaceous gland is situated in the angle which the erector muscle forms with the superficial portion of the hair follicle, and contraction of the muscle thus tends to squeeze the sebaceous secretion out from the duct of the gland. The sebaceous glands, glandulae sebaceae, are small, sacculated, glandular organs, lodged in the substance of the corium. They are found in most parts of the skin, but are especially abundant in the scalp and face. They are also very numerous around the apertures of the anus, nose, mouth, and external ear, but are wanting in the palms of the hands and soles of the feet. Each gland consists of a single duct, more or less capacious, which emerges from a cluster of oval or flask-shaped alveoli, which vary from two to five in number. But in some instances there may be as many as twenty. Each alveolus is composed of a transparent basement membrane enclosing a number of epithelial cells. The outer or marginal cells are small and polyhedral and are continuous with the cells lining the duct. The remainder of the alveolus is filled with larger cells containing fat, except in the center where the cells have become broken up, leaving a cavity filled with their debris and a mass of fatty matter, which constitutes the sebum cutaneum. The ducts open most frequently into the hair follicles, but occasionally upon the general surface, as in the labia minora and the free margin of the lips. On the nose and face, the glands are of large size, distinctly lobulated, and often become much enlarged from the accumulation of pent-up secretion. The tarsal glands of the eyelids are elongated sebaceous glands with numerous lateral diverticula. The sudoriferous or sweat glands glandulae sudoriferi, are found in almost every part of the skin and are situated in small pits on the undersurface of the corium, or, more frequently, in the subcutaneous areolar tissue, surrounded by a quantity of adipose tissue. Each consists of a single tube, 
the deep part of which is rolled into an oval or spherical ball, named the body of the gland, while the superficial part, or duct, traverses the corium and cuticle and opens on the surface of the skin by a funnel-shaped aperture. In the superficial layers of the corium, the duct is straight, but in the deeper layers, it is convoluted or even twisted. Where the epidermis is thick, as in the palms of the hands and soles of the feet, the part of the duct which passes through it is spirally coiled. The size of the glands varies. They are especially large in those regions where the amount of perspiration is great, as in the axillae, where they form a thin, mammillated layer of a reddish color, which corresponds exactly to the situation of the hair in this region. They are large also in the groin. Their number varies. They are very plentiful on the palms of the hands and on the soles of the feet, where the orifices of the ducts are exceedingly regular and open on the curved ridges. They are least numerous in the neck and back. On the palm there are about 370 per square centimeter, on the back of the hand about 200, forehead 175, breast, abdomen, and forearm 155, and on the leg and back from 60 to 80 per square centimeter. Krause estimates the total number at about 2 million. The average number of sweat glands per square centimeter of skin area in various races as shown by the fingers is as follows. American, white, 558.2. American, negro, 597.2. Filipino, 653.6. Moro, 684.4. Negrito, adult, 709.2. Hindu, 738.2. Negrito, youth, 950. They are absent in the deeper portion of the external auditory meatus, the prepuce, and the gland's penis. The tube, both in the body of the gland and in the duct, consists of two layers, an outer of fine areolar tissue and an inner of epithelium. The outer layer is thin and is continuous with the superficial stratum of the corium. In the body of the gland, the epithelium consists of a single layer of cubical cells, between the deep ends of which and the basement membrane is a layer of longitudinally or obliquely arranged, non-striped muscular fibers. The ducts are destitute of muscular fibers and are composed of a basement membrane lined by two or three layers of polyhedral cells. The lumen of the duct is coated by a thin cuticle. When the cuticle is carefully removed from the surface of the corium, the ducts may be drawn out in the form of short, thread-like processes on its under surface. The ceruminous glands of the external acoustic meatus and the ciliary glands at the margin of the eyelids are modified sudoriferous glands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.